Part One, Chapter One of the Idiot. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen. The Idiot by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Eva M. Martin. Part One. Chapter One. Towards the end of November, during a thaw, at nine o'clock one morning, a train on the Warsaw and Petersburg Railway was approaching the latter city at full speed. The morning was so damp and misty that it was only with great difficulty that the day succeeded in breaking and it was impossible to distinguish anything more than a few yards away from the carriage windows. Some of the passengers by this particular train were returning from abroad, but the third-class carriages were the best filled, chiefly with insignificant persons of various occupations and degrees, picked up at the different stations near a town. All of them seemed weary and most of them had sleepy eyes and a shivering expression, while their complexions generally appeared to have taken on the colour of the fog outside. When day dawned, two passengers in one of the third-class carriages found themselves opposite each other. Both were young fellows, both were rather poorly dressed, both had remarkable faces, and both were evidently anxious to start a conversation. If they had but known why, at this particular moment, they were both remarkable persons, they would undoubtedly have wondered at the strange chance which had set them down opposite to one another, in a third-class carriage of the Warsaw Railway Company. One of them was a young fellow of about twenty-seven, not tall, with black curling hair and small grey, fiery eyes. His nose was broad and flat, and he had high cheekbones. His thin lips were constantly compressed into an impudent, ironical, it might almost be called a malicious smile. But his forehead was high and well formed, and atoned for a good deal of the ugliness of the lower part of his face. A special feature of this physiognomy was its death-like pallor which gave to the whole man an indescribably emaciated appearance, in spite of his hard look, and at the same time a sort of passionate and suffering expression, which did not harmonise with his impudent, sarcastic smile and keen, self-satisfied bearing. He wore a large fur, or rather astrachan, overcoat, which had kept him warm all night, while his neighbour had been obliged to bear the full severity of a Russian November night entirely unprepared. His wide sleeveless mantle with a large cape to it, the sort of cloak one sees upon travellers during the winter months in Switzerland or North Italy, was by no means adapted to the long cold journey through Russia, from Eidkunen to St. Petersburg. The wearer of this cloak was a young fellow also of about twenty-six or twenty-seven years of age, slightly above the middle height, very fair, with a thin, pointed, and very light-coloured beard. His eyes were large and blue, and had an intent look about them, yet that heavy expression, which some people affirm to be a peculiarity, as well as evidence, of an epileptic subject. His face was decidedly a pleasant one for all that, refined but quite colourless, except for the circumstance that at this moment it was blue with cold. He held a bundle made up of an old faded silk handkerchief that apparently contained all his travelling wardrobe, and wore thick shoes and gaiters, his whole appearance being very un-Russian. His black-haired neighbour inspected these peculiarities, having nothing better to do, and at length remarked, with that rude enjoyment of the discomforts of others which the common classes so often show, Cold? Very, said his neighbour readily, and this is a thaw, too. Fancy if it had been a hard frost. 
I never thought it would be so cold in the old country. I've grown quite out of the way of it. What, been abroad, I suppose? Yes, straight from Switzerland. Phew, my goodness! The black-haired young fellow whistled and then laughed. The conversation proceeded. The readiness of the fair-haired young man in the cloak to answer all his opposite neighbour's questions was surprising. He seemed to have no suspicion of any impertinence or inappropriateness in the fact of such questions being put to him. Replying to them, he made known to the inquirer that he certainly had been long absent from Russia, more than four years, that he had been sent abroad for his health that he had suffered from some strange nervous malady, a kind of epilepsy with convulsive spasms. His interlocutor burst out laughing several times at his answers, and more than ever, when to the question whether he had been cured, the patient replied, No, they did not cure me. Ha! <laughs> that's it. You stumped up your money for nothing and we believe in those fellows here remarked the black-haired individual sarcastically gospel truth sir gospel truth exclaimed another passenger a shabbily dressed man of about forty who looked like a clerk and possessed a red nose and a very blotchy face gospel truth all they do is get hold of our good russian money free gratis and for nothing "'Oh, but you're quite wrong in my particular instance,' said the Swiss patient quietly. "'Of course I can't argue the matter, because I know only my own case. But my doctor gave me money, and he had very little, to pay my journey back, besides having kept me at his own expense while there for nearly two years.' "'Why, was there no one else to pay for you?' asked the black-haired one. "'No, Mr. Pavlicheff, who had been supporting me there, died a couple of years ago. I wrote to Mrs. General Yepanchin at the time. She is a distant relative of mine, but she did not answer my letter, and so eventually I came back.' "'And where have you come to?' "'That is, where am I going to stay? I, I really don't quite know yet. I—' Both the listeners laughed again. "'I suppose your whole set-up is in that bundle, then?' asked the first. "'I bet anything it is!' exclaimed the red-nosed passenger with extreme satisfaction, "'and that he has precious little in the luggage-van. Though, of course, poverty is no crime. We must remember that.' It appeared that it was indeed as they had surmised. The young fellow hastened to admit the fact with wonderful readiness. "'Your bundle has some importance, however,' continued the clerk, when they had laughed their fill. It was observable that the subject of their mirth joined in the laughter when he saw them laughing. For though I dare say it is not stuffed full of Friedrich's door and Louis door, judge from your costume and gaiters, still, if you can add to your possession such a valuable property as a relation like Mrs. General Yepanchin, then your bundle becomes a significant object at once. That is, of course, if you really are a relative of Mrs. Yepanchin's, and have not made a little error through, well, absence of mind, which is very common to human beings, or, say, through a too luxuriant fancy. Oh, you are right again, said the fair-haired traveller, for I really am almost wrong when I say she and I are related. She is hardly a relation at all, so little, in fact, that I was not in the least surprised to have no answer to my letter. I expected as much. Hmm. You spent your postage for nothing, then? Hmm. You are candid, however, and that is commendable. Hmm. Mrs. Yepanchin. Oh, yes, a most eminent person. I know her. As for Mr. Pavlicheff, who supported you in Switzerland, I know him, too at least if it was the Nikolai Andreevich of that name. A fine fellow he was, and had a property of four thousand souls in his day. Yes, Nikolai Andreevich, that was his name, and the young fellow looked earnestly and with curiosity at the all-knowing gentleman with the red nose. This sort of character is met with pretty frequently in a certain class. 
They are people who know everyone. That is, they know where a man is employed, what his salary is, whom he knows, whom he married, what money his wife had, who are his cousins and second cousins, etc., etc. These men generally have about a hundred pounds a year to live on, and they spend their whole time and talents in the amassing of this style of knowledge, which they reduce, or raise, to the standard of a science. During the latter part of the conversation, the black-haired young man had become very impatient. He stared out of the window and fidgeted, and evidently longed for the end of the journey. He was very absent, he would appear to listen, and heard nothing, and he would laugh of a sudden, evidently with no idea of what he was laughing about. "'Excuse me,' said the red-nosed man to the young fellow with the bundle, rather suddenly. "'Whom have I the honour to be talking to?' "'Prince Lyof Nikolaevich Mushkin,' replied the latter, with perfect readiness. "'Prince Mushkin? Lyof Nikolaevich? Hmm. I don't know, I'm sure. I may say I have never heard of such a person,' said the clerk thoughtfully. "'At least the name, I admit, is historical.' Karamsin must mention the family name, of course, in his history, but as an individual one never hears of any Prince Mushkin nowadays. "'Of course not,' replied the Prince. "'There are none except myself. I believe I am the last and only one. As to my forefathers, they have always been a poor lot. My own father was a sub-lieutenant in the army. I don't know how Mrs. Yepanchin comes into the Mushkin family but she is descended from the Princess Mushkin, and she too is the last of her line. "'And did you learn science and all that with your professor over there?' asked the black-haired passenger. "'Oh, yes, I did learn a little, but—' "'I've never learned anything, whatever,' said the other. "'Oh, but I learnt very little, you know,' added the Prince, as though excusing himself. "'They could not teach me very much on account of my illness.' "'Do you know the Rogozhins?' asked his questioner abruptly. "'No, I don't, not at all. I hardly know anyone in Russia. Why, is that your name?' "'Yes, I am Rogozhin, Parfion Rogozhin.' "'Parfion Rogozhin, dear me! Then don't you belong to those very Rogozhins, perhaps?' began the clerk, with a very perceptible increase of civility in his tone. "'Yes, those very ones,' interrupted Rogozhin impatiently and with scant courtesy. I may remark that he had not once taken any notice of the blotchy-faced passenger, and had hitherto addressed all his remarks direct to the prince. "'Dear me, is it possible?' observed the clerk, while his face assumed an expression of great deference and servility, if not of absolute alarm. "'What? a son of that very Semyon Rogozhin, hereditary honourable citizen, who died a month or so ago and left two million and a half of roubles. And how do you know that he left two million and a half of roubles? asked Rogozhin disdainfully, and not deigning so much as to look at the other. However, it's true enough that my father died a month ago, and that here am I returning from Pskov a month after, with hardly a boot to my foot. They've treated me like a dog. I've been ill of fever at Pskov the whole time, and not a line nor farthing of money have I received from my mother or my confounded brother. And now you'll have a million roubles at least, goodness gracious me! exclaimed the clerk, rubbing his hands. Five weeks since I was just like yourself, continued Rogozhin, addressing the prince, with nothing but a bundle and the clothes I wore. I ran away from my father and came to Pskov to my aunt's house, where I caved in at once with fever, and he went and died while I was away. All honour to my respected father's memory, but he uncommonly nearly killed me all the same. Give you my word, Prince, if I hadn't cut and run then, when I did, he'd have murdered me like a dog. I suppose you angered him somehow, asked the Prince, looking at the millionaire with considerable curiosity. 
but though there may have been something remarkable in the fact that this man was heir to millions of roubles there was something about him which surprised and interested the prince more than that rogozhin too seemed to have taken up the conversation with unusual alacrity it appeared that he was still in a considerable state of excitement if not absolutely feverish and was in real need of someone to talk to for the mere sake of talking a safety valve to his agitation as for his red-nosed neighbour the latter since the information as to the identity of rogozhin hung over him seemed to be living on the honey of his words and in the breath of his nostrils catching at every syllable as though it were a pearl of great price oh yes i angered him i certainly did anger him replied rogozhin but what puts me out so is my brother of course my mother couldn't do anything she's too old and whatever brother shonka says is law for her but why couldn't he let me know he sent a telegram they say what's the good of a telegram it frightened my aunt so that she sent it back to the office unopened and there it's been ever since it's only thanks to konyev that i heard at all he wrote me all about it he says my brother cut off the gold tassels from my father's coffin at night because they're worth a lot of money says he why i can get him sent off to siberia for that alone if i like it's sacrilege here you scarecrow he added addressing the clerk at his side is it sacrilege or not by law sacrilege certainly certainly sacrilege said the latter and it's siberia for sacrilege isn't it undoubtedly so siberia of course they will think that i'm still ill continued rogozhin to the prince but i sloped off quietly seedy as i was took the train and came away ah brother shonka you'll have to open your gates and let me in my boy i know he told tales about me to my father i know that well enough but i certainly did rile my father about nastasia filipovna that's very sure that that was my own doing nastasia filipovna said the clerk as though trying to think out something come you know nothing about her said rogozhin impatiently and supposing i do know something observed the other triumphantly bosh there are plenty of nastasia filipovnas and what an impertinent beast you are he added angrily i thought some creature like you would hang on to me as soon as i got hold of my money oh but i do know as it happens said the clerk in an aggravating manner lebedeff knows all about her you are pleased to reproach me your excellency but what if i prove that i am right after all nastasia filipovna's family name is barashkov i know you see and she is a very well-known lady indeed and comes of a good family too she is connected with one totsky afanasy ivanovitch a man of considerable property a director of companies and so on and a great friend of general Yepanchin, who is interested in the same matters as he is my eyes said rogozhin really surprised at last the devil take the fellow how does he know that why he knows everything lebedeff knows everything i was a month or two with lichachov after his father died your excellency and while he was knocking about he's in the debtor's prison now i was with him and he couldn't do a thing without lebedeff and i got to know nastasia filipovna and several people at that time nastasia filipovna why you don't mean to say that she and lichachov cried rogozhin turning quite pale no 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 nothing of the sort i assure you said lebedeff hastily oh dear no not for the world totsky's the only man with any chance there oh no he takes her to his box at the opera at the french theatre of an evening and the officers and people all look at her and say by jove there's the famous nastasia filipovna but no one ever gets any further than that for there is nothing more to say yes it's quite true said rogozhin frowning gloomily 
so Zaleshov told me. I was walking about the Nevsky one fine day, prince, in my father's old coat, when she suddenly came out of a shop and stepped into her carriage. I swear I was all of a blaze at once. Then I met Zaleshov, looking like a hairdresser's assistant, got up as fine as I don't know who, while I looked like a tinker. "'Don't flatter yourself, my boy,' said he. "'She's not for such as you. She's a princess, she is, and her name is Nastasia Filipovna Barashkov, and she lives with Totsky, who wishes to get rid of her because he's growing rather old, fifty-five or so, and wants to marry a certain beauty, the loveliest woman in all Petersburg.' And then he told me that I could see Nastasia Filipovna at the opera house that evening, if I liked, and described which was her box. Well, I'd like to see my father allowing any of us to go to the theatre. He'd sooner have killed us any day. However, I went for an hour or so and saw Nastasia Filipovna, and I never slept a wink all night after. Next morning my father happened to give me two government loan bonds to sell, worth nearly five thousand roubles each. "'Sell them,' said he, "'and then take seven thousand five hundred roubles to the office. Give them to the cashier, and bring me back the rest of the ten thousand, without looking in anywhere on the way. Look sharp, I shall be waiting for you.' Well, I sold the bonds, but I didn't take the seven thousand roubles to the office. I went straight to the English shop and chose a pair of earrings, with a diamond the size of a nut in each. They cost four hundred roubles more than I had, so I gave my name, and they trusted me. With the earrings I went at once to Zaleshev's. Come on, I said, come on to Nastasia Filipovna's. And off we went, without more ado. I tell you I hadn't a notion of what was about me, or before me, or below my feet, all the way. I saw nothing whatever. We went straight into her drawing-room, and then she came out to us. I didn't dare say right out who I was, but Saleshev said, "'From Parfion Rogozhin, in memory of his first meeting with you yesterday, be so kind as to accept these.' She opened the parcel, looked at the earrings, and laughed. "'Thank your friend Mr. Rogozhin for his kind attention,' says she and bowed and went off. Why didn't I die there on the spot? The worst of it all, though, was that the beast Saleshov got all the credit of it. I was short and abominably dressed, and stood and stared in her face and never said a word, because I was shy, like an ass. And there was he all in the fashion, pomaded and dressed out, with a smart tie on, bowing and scraping and I bet anything she took him for me all the while. "'Look here now,' I said when we came out. "'None of your interference here after this, do you understand?' He laughed. "'And how are you going to settle up with your father?' says he. I thought I might as well jump into the Nieva at once without going home first. But it struck me that I wouldn't after all, and I went home feeling like one of the damned. "'My goodness!' shivered the clerk. "'And his father,' he added, for the prince's instruction, "'and his father would have given a man a ticket to the other world for ten roubles any day, not to speak of ten thousand. The prince observed Rogozhin with great curiosity. He seemed paler than ever at this moment. "'What do you know about it?' cried the latter. "'Well, my father learned the whole story at once, and Zaleshov blabbed it all over the town besides. So he took me upstairs and locked me up, and swore at me for an hour. "'This is only a foretaste,' says he. "'Wait a bit till night comes, and I'll come back and talk to you again.' "'Well, what do you think? The old fellow went straight off to Nastasia Filipovna, touched the floor with his forehead, and began blubbering and beseeching her on his knees to give him back the diamonds. So after a while she brought the box and flew out at him. There, she says, take your earrings, you wretched old miser. 
although they are ten times dearer than their value to me, now that I know what it must have cost Parfion to get them. Give Parfion my compliments, she says, and thank him very much. Well, I meanwhile had borrowed twenty-five roubles from a friend, and off I went to Pskov to my aunt's. The old woman there lectured me so that I left the house and went on a drinking tour round the public houses of the place. I was in a high fever when I got to Pskov, and by nightfall I was lying delirious in the streets somewhere or other. Oh, ho! we'll make Nastasia Filipovna sing another song now, giggled Lebedev, rubbing his hands with glee. Hey, my boy, we'll get her some proper earrings now. We'll get her such earrings that— Look here, cried Rogozhin, seizing him fiercely by the arm. Look here, if you so much as name Nastasia Filipovna again, I'll tan your hide as sure as you sit there. Ah, do, by all means. If you tan my hide, you won't turn me away from your society. You'll bind me to you with your lash for ever. Ha, ha, ha. Here we are at the station, though. Sure enough, the train was just steaming in as he spoke. Though Rogozhin had declared that he left Pskov secretly, a large collection of friends had assembled to greet him, and did so with profuse waving of hats and shouting. "'Why, there's Zalezhov here, too,' he muttered, gazing at the scene with a sort of triumphant but unpleasant smile. Then he suddenly turned to the prince. "'Prince, I don't know why I've taken a fancy to you. Perhaps because I met you just when I did. But no, it can't be that, for I met this fellow,' nodding at Lebedev, too, and I have not taken a fancy to him by any means. Come to see me, prince. We'll take off those gaiters of yours and dress you up in a smart fur coat, the best we can buy. You shall have a dress coat, best quality, white waistcoat, anything you like, and your pocket shall be full of money. Come, and you shall go with me to Nastasia Filipovna's. Now then, will you come or no? Accept, accept, Prince Lyof Nikolaevich, said Lebedev solemnly. Don't let it slip. Accept, quick. Prince Muishkin rose and stretched out his hand courteously, while he replied with some cordiality. I will come with the greatest pleasure, and thank you very much for taking a fancy to me. I dare say I may even come to-day if I have time, for I tell you frankly that I like you very much, too. I liked you especially when you told us about the diamond earrings, but I liked you before that as well, though you have such a dark, clouded sort of face. Thanks very much for the offer of clothes and a fur coat. I shall certainly require both clothes and coat very soon. As for money, I have hardly a kopeck about me at this moment. You shall have lots of money. By the evening I shall have plenty, so come along. That's true enough. He'll have lots before evening, put in Lebedev. But look here, are you a great hand with the ladies? Let's know that first, asked Rogozhin. Oh, no, oh, no, said the prince. I couldn't, you know, my illness. I hardly ever saw a soul. Hmm. Well, here, you fellow, you can come along with me now if you like, cried Rogozhin to Lebedev and so they all left the carriage. Lebedev had his desire. He went off with the noisy group of Rogozhin's friends towards the Voznesensky, while the prince's route lay towards the Litainaya. It was damp and wet. The prince asked his way of passers-by, and finding that he was a couple of miles or so from his destination, he determined to take a droshki. End of Part 1, Chapter 1 Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey Part 1, Chapter 2 of The Idiot This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen The Idiot by Fyodor Dostoevsky Translated by Eva M. Martin
Part One, Chapter Two. General Yepanchin lived in his own house near the Litaynaya. Besides this large residence, five sixths of which was let in flats and lodgings, the general was owner of another enormous house in the Sadovaya, bringing in even more rent than the first. Besides these houses he had a delightful little estate just out of town, and some sort of factory in another part of the city. General Yepanchin, as everyone knew, had a good deal to do with certain government monopolies. He was also a voice, and an important one, in many rich public companies of various descriptions. In fact, he enjoyed the reputation of being a well-to-do man of busy habits, many ties, and affluent means. He had made himself indispensable in several quarters, amongst others in his department of the government, and yet it was a known fact that Fyodor Ivanovich Yepanchin was a man of no education whatever, and had absolutely risen from the ranks. This last fact could, of course, reflect nothing but credit upon the general, and yet, though unquestionably a sagacious man, he had his own little weaknesses, very excusable ones, one of which was a dislike to any allusion to the above circumstance. He was undoubtedly clever. For instance, he made a point of never asserting himself when he would gain more by keeping in the background, and in consequence many exalted personages valued him principally for his humility and simplicity, and because he knew his place. And yet if these good people could only have had a peep into the mind of this excellent fellow, who knew his place so well, the fact is that in spite of his knowledge of the world, and his really remarkable abilities, he always liked to appear to be carrying out other people's ideas rather than his own. And also his luck seldom failed him, even at cards, for which he had a passion that he did not attempt to conceal. He played for high stakes, and moved altogether in very varied society. As to age, General Yepanchin was in the very prime of life, that is, about fifty-five years of age, the flowering time of existence, when real enjoyment of life begins, his healthy appearance, good colour, sound though discoloured teeth sturdy figure, preoccupied air during business hours, and jolly good humour during his game at cards in the evening, all bore witness to his success in life, and combined to make existence a bed of roses to his excellency. The general was lord of a flourishing family, consisting of his wife and three grown-up daughters. He had married young, while still a lieutenant, his wife being a girl of about his own age, who possessed neither beauty nor education, and who brought him no more than fifty souls of landed property, which little estate served, however, as a nest-egg for far more important accumulations. The general never regretted his early marriage, or regarded it as a foolish youthful escapade and he so respected and feared his wife that he was very near loving her. Mrs. Yepanchin came of the princely stock of Mwishkin, which, if not a brilliant, was at all events a decidedly ancient family, and she was extremely proud of her descent. With a few exceptions, the worthy couple had lived through their long union very happily. While still young, the wife had been able to make important friends among the aristocracy, partly by virtue of her family descent, and partly by her own exertions, while in after-life, thanks to their wealth and to the position of her husband in the service, she took her place among the higher circles as by right. During these last few years, all three of the general's daughters, Alexandra, Adelaida and Aglaya, had grown up and matured. Of course they were only Yepanchins, but their mother's family was noble. They might expect considerable fortunes. Their father had hopes of attaining to very high rank indeed in his country's service, all of which was satisfactory. 
all three of the girls were decidedly pretty even the eldest alexandra who was just twenty-five years old the middle daughter was now twenty-three while the youngest aglaya was twenty this youngest girl was absolutely a beauty and had begun of late to attract considerable attention in society but this was not all for every one of the three was clever well educated and accomplished it was a matter of general knowledge that the three girls were very fond of one another and supported each other in every way it was even said that the two elder ones had made certain sacrifices for the sake of the idol of the household aglaya in society they not only disliked asserting themselves but were actually retiring certainly no one could blame them for being too arrogant or haughty and yet everybody was well aware that they were proud and quite understood their own value the eldest was musical while the second was a clever artist which fact she had concealed until lately in a word the world spoke well of the girls but they were not without their enemies and occasionally people talked with horror of the number of books they had read they were in no hurry to marry they liked good society but were not too keen about it all this was the more remarkable because everyone was well aware of the hopes and aims of their parents it was about eleven o'clock in the forenoon when the prince rang the bell at general yepanchin's door the general lived on the first floor or flat of the house as modest a lodging as his position permitted a liveried servant opened the door and the prince was obliged to enter into long explanations with this gentleman who from the first glance looked at him and his bundle with grave suspicion at last however on the repeated positive assurance that he really was prince muishkin and must absolutely see the general on business the bewildered domestic showed him into a little antechamber leading to a waiting-room that adjoined the general's study there handing him over to another servant whose duty it was to be in this antechamber all the morning and announce visitors to the general this second individual wore a dress coat and was some forty years of age he was the general's special study servant and well aware of his own importance wait in the next room please and leave your bundle here said the doorkeeper as he sat down comfortably in his own easy chair in the antechamber he looked at the prince in severe surprise as the latter settled himself in another chair alongside with his bundle on his knees if you don't mind i would rather sit here with you said the prince i should prefer it to sitting in there oh but you can't stay here you are a visitor a guest so to speak is it the general himself you wish to see the man evidently could not take in the idea of such a shabby-looking visitor and had decided to ask once more yes i have business began the prince i do not ask you what your business may be all i have to do is to announce you and unless the secretary comes in here i cannot do that the man's suspicions seemed to increase more and more the prince was too unlike the usual run of daily visitors and although the general certainly did receive on business all sorts and conditions of men yet in spite of this fact the servant felt great doubts on the subject of this particular visitor the presence of the secretary as an intermediary was he judged essential in this case surely you are from abroad he inquired at last in a confused sort of way he had begun his sentence intending to say surely you are not prince muishkin are you yes straight from the train did not you intend to say surely you are not prince muishkin just now but refrained out of politeness <coughs> grunted the astonished servant i assure you i am not deceiving you you shall not have to answer for me as to my being dressed like this and carrying a bundle there's nothing surprising in that 
the fact is my circumstances are not particularly rosy at this moment <clears throat> no no i'm not afraid of that you see i have to announce you that's all the secretary will be out directly that is unless you uh, yes that's the rub unless you come you must allow me to ask you you've not come to beg have you oh dear no you can be perfectly easy on that score i have quite another matter on hand you must excuse my asking you know your appearance led me to think but just wait for the secretary the general is busy now but the secretary is sure to come out oh well look here if i have some time to wait would you mind telling me is there any place about where i could have a smoke i have my pipe and tobacco with me smoke said the man in shocked but disdainful surprise blinking his eyes at the prince as though he could not believe his senses no sir you cannot smoke here and i wonder you are not ashamed of the very suggestion ah oh, a cool idea that i declare oh i didn't mean in this room i know i can't smoke here of course i'd adjourn to some other room wherever you'd like to show me to you see i'm used to smoking a good deal and now i haven't had a puff for three hours however just as you like now how on earth am i to announce a man like that muttered the servant in the first place you've no right in here at all you ought to be in the waiting-room because you're a sort of visitor a guest in fact and i shall catch it for this look here do you intend to take up your abode with us he added glancing once more at the prince's bundle which evidently gave him no peace no i don't think so i don't think i should stay even if they were to invite me i've simply come to make their acquaintance and nothing more make their acquaintance asked the man in amazement and with redoubled suspicion then why did you say you had business with the general oh well very little business there is one little matter some advice i am going to ask him for but my principal object is simply to introduce myself because i am prince muishkin and madame yepanchin is the last of her branch of the house and besides herself and me there are no other muishkins left what you're a relation then are you asked the servant so bewildered that he began to feel quite alarmed well hardly so if you stretch a point we are relations of course but so distant that one cannot really take cognizance of it i once wrote to your mistress from abroad but she did not reply however i have thought it right to make acquaintance with her on my arrival i am telling you all this in order to ease your mind for i see you are still far from comfortable on my account all you have to do is to announce me as prince muishkin and the object of my visit will be plain enough if i am received very good if not well very good again but they are sure to receive me i should think madame yepanchin will naturally be curious to see the only remaining representative of her family she values her muishkin descent very highly if i am rightly informed the prince's conversation was artless and confiding to a degree and the servant could not help feeling that as from visitor to common serving man this state of things was highly improper his conclusion was that one of two things must be the explanation either that this was a begging impostor or that the prince if prince he were was simply a fool without the slightest ambition for a sensible prince with any ambition would certainly not wait about in anterooms with servants and talk of his own private affairs like this in either case how was he to announce this singular visitor i really think i must request you to step into the next room he said with all the insistence he could muster why if i had been sitting there now i should not have had the opportunity of making these personal explanations I see you are still uneasy about me, and keep eyeing my cloak and bundle. Don't you think you might go in yourself now, without waiting for the secretary to come out? 
no no i can't announce a visitor like yourself without the secretary besides the general said he was not to be disturbed he is with the colonel c gavrila ardalionovitch goes in without announcing who may that be a clerk what gavrila ardalionovitch oh no he belongs to one of the companies look here at all events put your bundle down here yes i will if i may and can i take off my cloak of course you can't go in there with it on anyhow the prince rose and took off his mantle revealing a neat enough morning costume little worn but well made he wore a steel watch chain and from this chain there hung a silver geneva watch fool the prince might be still the general's servant felt that it was not correct for him to continue to converse thus with a visitor in spite of the fact that the prince pleased him somehow and what time of day does the lady receive the latter asked reseating himself in his old place oh that's not in my province i believe she receives at any time it depends on the visitors the dressmaker goes in at eleven gavrila ardalionovitch is allowed much earlier than other people too he is even admitted to early lunch now and then it is much warmer in the rooms here than it is abroad at this season observed the prince but it is much warmer there out of doors as for the houses a russian can't live in them in the winter until he gets accustomed to them don't they heat them at all well they do heat them a little but the houses and stoves are so different to ours hmm were you long away four years and i was in the same place nearly all the time in one village you must have forgotten russia hadn't you yes indeed i had a good deal and would you believe it i often wonder at myself for not having forgotten how to speak russian even now as i talk to you i keep saying to myself how well i am speaking it perhaps that is partly why i am so talkative this morning i assure you ever since yesterday evening i've had the strongest desire to go on and on talking russian hm yes did you live in petersburg in former years this good flunky in spite of his conscientious scruples really could not resist continuing such a very genteel and agreeable conversation in petersburg oh no hardly at all and now they say so much is changed in the place that even those who did know it well are obliged to relearn what they knew they talk a good deal about the new law courts and changes there don't they oh, yes that's true enough well now how is the law over there do they administer it more justly than here oh i don't know about that i've heard much that is good about our legal administration too there is no capital punishment here for one thing is there over there yes i saw an execution in france at lyon schneider took me over with him to see it what did they hang the fellow no they cut off people's heads in france what did the fellow do yell oh no it's the work of an instant they put a man inside a frame and a sort of broad knife falls by machinery they call the thing a guillotine it falls with fearful force and weight the head springs off so quickly that you can't wink your eye in between but all the preparations are so dreadful when they announce the sentence you know and prepare the criminal and tie his hands and cart him off to the scaffold that's the fearful part of the business the people all crowd round even women though they don't at all approve of women looking on no it's not a thing for women of course not of course not but the criminal was a fine intelligent fearless man le gros was his name and i may tell you believe it or not as you like that when that man stepped upon the scaffold he cried he did indeed he was as white as a bit of paper isn't it a dreadful idea that he should have cried cried who ever heard of a grown man crying from fear 
not a child, but a man who never had cried before, a grown man of forty-five years. Imagine what must have been going on in that man's mind at such a moment, what dreadful convulsions his whole spirit must have endured. It is an outrage on the soul, that's what it is. Because it is said, Thou shalt not kill, is he to be killed, because he murdered someone else? No, it is not right, it's an impossible theory. I assure you, I saw the sight a month ago, and it's dancing before my eyes to this moment. I dream of it, often." The prince had grown animated as he spoke, and a tinge of colour suffused his pale face, though his way of talking was as quiet as ever. The servant followed his words with sympathetic interest. Clearly he was not at all anxious to bring the conversation to an end. Who knows? Perhaps he too was a man of imagination, and with some capacity for thought. Well, at all events, it is a good thing that there's no pain, when the poor fellow's head flies off," he remarked. "'Do you know, though,' cried the prince warmly, "'you made that remark now, and every one says the same thing, and the machine is designed with the purpose of avoiding pain, this guillotine, I mean. But a thought came into my head then. What if it be a bad plan, after all? You may laugh at my idea, perhaps, but I could not help its occurring to me all the same. Now with the rack and tortures and so on, you suffer terrible pain, of course, but then your torture is bodily pain only, although no doubt you have plenty of that until you die. But here I should imagine the most terrible part of the whole punishment is not the bodily pain at all, but the certain knowledge that in an hour, then in ten minutes, then in half a minute, then now, this very instant, your soul must quit your body, and that you will no longer be a man, and that this is certain, certain. That's the point, the certainty of it. Just that instant when you place your head on the block, and hear the iron grate over your head, then, that quarter of a second is the most awful of all. This is not my own fantastical opinion. Many people have thought the same, but I feel it so deeply that I'll tell you what I think. I believe that to execute a man for murder is to punish him immeasurably more dreadfully than is equivalent to his crime. A murder by sentence is far more dreadful than a murder committed by a criminal. The man who is attacked by robbers at night, in a dark wood or anywhere, undoubtedly hopes and hopes that he may yet escape until the very moment of his death. There are plenty of instances of a man running away or imploring for mercy, at all events hoping on in some degree, even after his throat was cut. But in the case of an execution, that last hope having which it is so immeasurably less dreadful to die, is taken away from the wretch, and certainty substituted in its place. There is his sentence, and with it that terrible certainty that he cannot possibly escape death, which I consider must be the most dreadful anguish in the world. You may place a soldier before a cannon's mouth in battle, and fire upon him, and he will still hope, but read to that same soldier his death sentence, and he will either go mad or burst into tears. Who dares to say that any man can suffer this without going mad? No, no, it is an abuse, a shame, it is unnecessary. Why should such a thing exist? Doubtless there may be men who have been sentenced, who have suffered this mental anguish for a while and then have been reprieved. Perhaps such men may have been able to relate their feelings afterwards. Our Lord Christ spoke of this anguish and dread. No, 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 no man should be treated so. No man, no man. The servant, though of course he could not have expressed all this as the prince did, still clearly entered into it and was greatly conciliated as was evident from the increased amiability of his expression. "'If you are really very anxious for a smoke,' he remarked, 
I think it might possibly be managed, if you are very quick about it. You see, they might come out and inquire for you, and you wouldn't be on the spot. You see that door there? Go in there, and you'll find a little room on the right. You can smoke there, only open the window, because I ought not to allow it, really. And... But there was no time after all. A young fellow entered the ante-room at this moment, with a bundle of papers in his hand. The footman hastened to help him take off his overcoat. The new arrival glanced at the prince out of the corners of his eyes. "'This gentleman declares, Gavrila Ardalionovitch, began the man confidentially and almost familiarly, that he is Prince Mwishkin and a relative of Madame Yepanchin's. He has just arrived from abroad, with nothing but a bundle by way of luggage. The prince did not hear the rest, because at this point the servant continued his communication in a whisper. Gavrila Ardalionovitch listened attentively, and gazed at the prince with great curiosity. At last he motioned the man aside, and stepped hurriedly towards the prince. "'Are you Prince Mwishkin?' he asked, with the greatest courtesy and amiability. He was a remarkably handsome young fellow of some twenty-eight summers, fair and of middle height. He wore a small beard, and his face was most intelligent. Yet his smile, in spite of its sweetness, was a little thin, if I may so call it, and showed his teeth too evenly. His gaze, though decidedly good-humoured and ingenuous, was a trifle too inquisitive and intent to be altogether agreeable. Probably when he is alone he looks quite different, and hardly smiles at all, thought the prince. He explained about himself in a few words, very much the same as he had told the footman and Rogozhin beforehand. Gavrila Ardalionovitch, meanwhile, seemed to be trying to recall something. "'Was it not you, then, who sent a letter a year or less ago, from Switzerland, I think it was, to Elizaveta Prokofievna, Mrs. Yepanchin? "'It was. "'Oh, then, of course they will remember who you are. "'You wish to see the general. I'll tell him at once. "'He will be free in a minute. "'But you, you had better wait in the antechamber, hadn't you? "'Why is he here?' he added severely to the man. "'I tell you, sir, he wished it himself.' At this moment the study door opened, and a military man, with a portfolio under his arm, came out talking loudly, and after bidding good-bye to someone inside, took his departure. "'You there, Gania? cried a voice from the study. "'Come in here, will you?' Gavrila Ardalionovitch nodded to the prince and entered the room hastily. A couple of minutes later the door opened again and the affable voice of Gania cried, "'Come in, please, Prince!' End of Part 1, Chapter 2 Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey Part 1, Chapter 3 of The Idiot This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen the Idiot by Fyodor Dostoevsky Translated by Eva M. Martin Part 1, Chapter 3 General Ivan Fyodorovich Yepanchin was standing in the middle of the room, and gazed with great curiosity at the prince as he entered. He even advanced a couple of steps to meet him. The prince came forward and introduced himself. "'Quite so,' replied the general. "'And what can I do for you?' "'Oh, I have no special business. My principal object was to make your acquaintance. I should not like to disturb you. I do not know your times and arrangements here, you see, but I have only just arrived. I came straight from the station. I come direct from Switzerland.' The general very nearly smiled but thought better of it and kept his smile back. Then he reflected, blinked his eyes, stared at his guest once more from head to foot, then abruptly motioned him to a chair, sat down himself, and waited with some impatience for the prince to speak. 
Gania stood at his table in the far corner of the room, turning over papers. "'I have not much time for making acquaintances as a rule,' said the general. "'But as, of course, you have your object in coming, I—' "'I felt sure you would think I had some object in view when I resolved to pay you this visit,' the prince interrupted. "'But I give you my word, beyond the pleasure of making your acquaintance, I had no personal object whatever.' the pleasure is of course mutual but life is not all pleasure as you are aware there is such a thing as business and i really do not see what possible reason there can be or what we have in common to oh there is no reason of course and i suppose there is nothing in common between us or very little for if i am prince muishkin and your wife happens to be a member of my house that can hardly be called a reason I quite understand that. And yet that was my whole motive for coming. You see, I have not been in Russia for four years, and knew very little about anything when I left. I had been very ill for a long time, and I feel now the need of a few good friends. In fact, I have a certain question upon which I much need advice, and do not know whom to go to for it. I thought of your family when I was passing through Berlin. They are almost relations, I said to myself. So I'll begin with them. Perhaps we may get on with each other, I with them and they with me, if they are kind people. And I have heard that you are very kind people." "'Oh, thank you, thank you, I'm sure,' replied the general, considerably taken aback. "'May I ask where you have taken up your quarters?' nowhere as yet what straight from the station to my house and how about your luggage i only had a small bundle containing linen with me nothing more i can carry it in my hand easily there will be plenty of time to take a room in some hotel by the evening oh then you do intend to take a room of course to judge from your words, you came straight to my house with the intention of staying there. That can only have been on your invitation. I confess, however, that I should not have stayed here, even if you had invited me. Not for any particular reason, but because it is, well, contrary to my practice and nature, somehow. Oh, indeed! Then it is perhaps as well that I neither did invite you, nor do invite you now. Excuse me, Prince, but we had better make this matter clear once for all. We have just agreed that with regard to our relationship there is not much to be said, though of course it would have been very delightful to us to feel that such relationship did actually exist. Therefore, perhaps, therefore perhaps I had better get up and go away said the prince, laughing merrily as he rose from his place, just as merrily as though the circumstances were by no means strained or difficult. And I give you my word, General, that though I know nothing whatever of manners and customs of society, and how people live and all that, yet I felt quite sure that this visit of mine would end exactly as it has ended now. Oh, well, I suppose it's all right especially as my letter was not answered. The prince's expression was so good-natured at this moment, and so entirely free even from a suspicion of unpleasant feeling was the smile with which he looked at the general as he spoke, that the latter suddenly paused, and appeared to gaze at his guest from quite a new point of view, all in an instant. "'Do you know, prince,' he said in quite a different tone, I do not know you at all, yet, and after all, Elizaveta Prokofievna would very likely be pleased to have a peep at a man of her own name. Wait a little, if you don't mind, and if you have time to spare. Oh, I assure you I have lots of time. My time is entirely my own. And the prince immediately replaced his soft round hat on the table. I confess I thought Elizaveta Prokofievna would very likely remember that I had written her a letter. Just now your servant, outside there, was dreadfully suspicious that I had come to beg of you. I noticed that. Probably he has very strict instructions on that score. 
but i assure you i did not come to beg i came to make some friends but i am rather bothered at having disturbed you that's all i care about look here prince said the general with a cordial smile if you really are the sort of man you appear to be it may be a source of great pleasure to us to make your better acquaintance but you see i am a very busy man and have to be perpetually sitting here and signing papers or off to see his excellency or to my department or somewhere so that though i should be glad to see more of people nice people you see i however i'm sure you're so well brought up that you will see at once and but how old are you prince twenty-six no i thought you very much younger yes they say i have a young face as to disturbing you i shall soon learn to avoid doing that for i hate disturbing people besides you and i are so differently constituted i should think that there must be very little in common between us not that i will ever believe that there is nothing in common between any two people as some declare is the case i am sure people make a great mistake in sorting each other into groups by appearances but i am boring you i see you just two words have you any means at all or perhaps you may be intending to undertake some sort of employment excuse my questioning you but oh my dear sir i esteem and understand your kindness in putting the question no at present i have no means whatever and no employment either but i hope to find some i was living on other people abroad schneider the professor who treated me and taught me too in switzerland gave me just enough money for my journey so that now i have but a few kopecks left there certainly is one question upon which i am anxious to have advice but tell me how do you intend to live now and what are your plans interrupted the general i wish to work somehow or other oh yes but then you see you are a philosopher have you any talents or ability in any direction that is any that would bring in money and bread excuse me again oh don't apologize no i don't think i have either talents or special abilities of any kind on the contrary i have always been an invalid and unable to learn much as for bread i should think the general interrupted once more with questions while the prince again replied with the narrative we have heard before it appeared that the general had known pavlicheff but why the latter had taken an interest in the prince that young gentleman could not explain probably by virtue of the old friendship with his father he thought the prince had been left an orphan when quite a little child and pavlicheff had entrusted him to an old lady a relative of his own living in the country the child needing the fresh air and exercise of country life he was educated first by a governess and afterwards by a tutor but could not remember much about this time of his life his fits were so frequent then that they made almost an idiot of him the prince used the expression idiot himself pavlicheff had met professor schneider in berlin and the latter had persuaded him to send the boy to switzerland to schneider's establishment there for the cure of his epilepsy and five years before this time the prince was sent off but pavlicheff had died two or three years since and schneider had himself supported the young fellow from that day to this at his own expense although he had not quite cured him he had greatly improved his condition and now at last at the prince's own desire and because of a certain matter which came to the ears of the latter schneider had dispatched the young man to russia the general was much astonished then you have no one absolutely no one in russia he asked no one at present but i hope to make friends and then i have a letter from at all events put in the general not listening to the news about the letter at all events you must have learned something and your malady would not prevent your undertaking some easy work in one of the departments for instance 
oh dear no oh no as for a situation i should much like to find one for i am anxious to discover what i really am fit for i have learned a good deal in the last four years and besides i read a great many russian books russian books indeed then of course you can read and write quite correctly oh dear yes capital and your handwriting ah there i am really talented i may say i am a real calligraphist let me write you something just to show you said the prince with some excitement with pleasure in fact it is very necessary i like your readiness prince in fact i must say i i like you very well altogether said the general what delightful writing materials you have here such a lot of pencils and things and what beautiful paper it's a charming room altogether i know that picture it's a swiss view i'm sure the artist painted it from nature and that i have seen the very place quite likely though i bought it here gania give the prince some paper here are pens and paper now then take this table what's this the general continued to gania who had that moment taken a large photograph out of his portfolio and shown it to his senior hello nastasia filipovna did she send it to herself herself he inquired with much curiosity and great animation she gave it me just now when i called in to congratulate her i asked her for it long ago i don't know whether she meant it for a hint that i had come empty-handed without a present for her birthday or what added gania with an unpleasant smile oh nonsense nonsense said the general with decision what extraordinary ideas you have gania as if she would hint that's not her way at all besides what could you give her without having thousands at your disposal you might have given her your portrait however has she ever asked you for it no not yet very likely she never will i suppose you haven't forgotten about to-night have you ivan fyodorovitch you were one of those specially invited you know oh no i remember all right and i shall go of course i should think so she's twenty-five years old to-day and you know gania you must be ready for great things she has promised both myself and afanasy ivanovitch that she will give a decided answer to-night yes or no so be prepared gania suddenly became so ill at ease that his face grew paler than ever are you sure she said that he asked and his voice seemed to quiver as he spoke yes she promised we both worried her so that she gave in but she wished us to tell you nothing about it until the day the general watched gania's confusion intently and clearly did not like it remember ivan fyodorovitch said gania in great agitation that i was to be free too until her decision and that even then i was to have my yes or no free why don't you aren't you began the general in alarm oh don't misunderstand but my dear fellow what are you doing what do you mean oh i'm not rejecting her i may have expressed myself badly but i didn't mean that reject her i should think not said the general with annoyance and apparently not in the least anxious to conceal it why my dear fellow it's not a question of your rejecting her it is whether you are prepared to receive her consent joyfully and with proper satisfaction how are things going on at home at home oh i can do as i like there of course only my father will make a fool of himself as usual he is rapidly becoming a general nuisance i don't ever talk to him now but i hold him in check safe enough i swear if it had not been for my mother i would have shown him the way out long ago my mother is always crying of course and my sister sulks 
I had to tell them at last that I intended to be master of my own destiny, and that I expect to be obeyed at home. At least I gave my sister to understand as much, and my mother was present. "'Well, I must say I cannot understand it,' said the general, shrugging his shoulders and dropping his hands. "'You remember your mother, Nina Alexandrovna? That day she came and sat here and groaned, and when I asked her what was the matter, she said, "'Oh, it's such a dishonour to us! Dishonour! Stuff and nonsense! I should like to know who can reproach Nastasia Filipovna, or who can say a word of any kind against her. Did she mean because Nastasia had been living with Totsky? What nonsense it is! You would not let her come near your daughters, says Nina Alexandrovna. What next, I wonder? I don't see how she can fail to, to understand. Her own position, prompted Gania. She does understand. Don't be annoyed with her. I have warned her not to meddle in other people's affairs. However, although there's comparative peace at home at present, the storm will break if anything is finally settled to-night. The prince heard the whole of the foregoing conversation as he sat at the table writing. He finished at last, and brought the result of his labour to the general's desk. "'So this is Nastasia Filipovna,' he said, looking attentively and curiously at the portrait. "'How wonderfully beautiful!' he immediately added, with warmth. The picture was certainly that of an unusually lovely woman. She was photographed in a black silk dress of simple design. Her hair was evidently dark and plainly arranged. Her eyes were deep and thoughtful, the expression of her face passionate but proud. She was rather thin, perhaps, and a little pale. Both Gania and the general gazed at the prince in amazement. "'How do you know it's Nastasia Filipovna?' asked the general. "'You surely don't know her already, do you?' "'Yes, I do. I have only been one day in Russia, but I have heard of the great beauty.' And the prince proceeded to narrate his meeting with Rogozhin in the train and the whole of the latter's story. "'There's news!' said the general in some excitement, after listening to the story with engrossed attention. "'Oh, of course it's nothing but humbug!' cried Gania, a little disturbed, however. "'It's all humbug! The young merchant was pleased to indulge in a little innocent recreation. I have heard something of Rogozhin.' "'Yes, so have I,' replied the general. "'Nastasia Filipovna told us all about the earrings that very day. But now it's quite a different matter. You see, the fellow really has a million of roubles, and he is passionately in love.' The whole story smells of passion, and we all know what this class of gentry is capable of when infatuated. I am much afraid of some disagreeable scandal. I am indeed." "'You are afraid of the million, I suppose,' said Gania, grinning and showing his teeth. "'And you are not, I presume, hm? "'How did he strike you, Prince?' asked Gania suddenly. "'Did he seem to be a serious sort of a man, or just a common rowdy fellow? "'What was your opinion about the matter?' While Gania put this question, a new idea suddenly flashed into his brain, and blazed out impatiently in his eyes. The general, who was really agitated and disturbed, looked at the prince too, but did not seem to expect much from his reply. "'I really don't quite know how to tell you,' replied the prince, "'but it certainly did seem to me that the man was full of passion, and not perhaps quite healthy passion. He seemed to be still far from well. Very likely he will be in bed again in a day or two, especially if he lives fast.' "'No, do you think so?' said the general, catching at the idea. "'Yes, I do think so. Yes, but the sort of scandal I referred to may happen at any moment. It may be this very evening,' remarked Gania to the general, with a smile. "'Of course, quite so. In that case it all depends upon what is going on in her brain at this moment.' 
You know the kind of person she is at times. How? What kind of person is she? cried the general, arrived at the limits of his patience. Look here, Gania, don't you go annoying her tonight. What you are to do is to be as agreeable towards her as ever you can. Well, what are you smiling at? You must understand, Gania, that I have no interest whatever in speaking like this. Whichever way the question is settled, it will be to my advantage. Nothing will move Totsky from his resolution, so I run no risk. If there is anything I desire, you must know that it is your benefit only. Can't you trust me? You are a sensible fellow, and I have been counting on you, for in this matter that, that... Yes, that's the chief thing, said Gania, helping the general out of his difficulties again, and curling his lips in an envenomed smile, which he did not attempt to conceal. He gazed with his fevered eyes straight into those of the general, as though he were anxious that the latter might read his thoughts. The general grew purple with anger. Yes, of course it is the chief thing, he cried, looking sharply at Gania. What a very curious man you are, Gania. You actually seem to be glad to hear of this millionaire fellow's arrival, just as though you wished for an excuse to get out of the whole thing. This is an affair in which you ought to act honestly with both sides, and give due warning, to avoid compromising others. But even now there is still time. Do you understand me? I wish to know whether you desire this arrangement, or whether you do not. If not, say so, and, and welcome. No one is trying to force you into the snare, Gavrila Ardalionovitch, if you see a snare in the matter, at least. I do desire it, murmured Gania softly but firmly, lowering his eyes, and he relapsed into gloomy silence. The general was satisfied. He had excited himself, and was evidently now regretting that he had gone so far. He turned to the prince, and suddenly the disagreeable thought of the latter's presence struck him, and the certainty that he must have heard every word of the conversation. But he felt at ease in another moment. It only needed one glance at the prince to see that in that quarter there was nothing to fear. Oh cried the general, catching sight of the prince's specimen of calligraphy, which the latter had now handed him for inspection. "'Why, this is simply beautiful! Look at that, Gania, there's real talent there!' On a sheet of thick writing-paper the prince had written in medieval characters the legend, "'The gentle Abbot Pafnute signed this.' "'There!' explained the prince with great delight and animation there that's the abbot's real signature from a manuscript of the fourteenth century all these old abbots and bishops used to write most beautifully with such taste and so much care and diligence have you no copy of pagodin general if you had one i could show you another type stop a bit here you have the large round writing common in france during the eighteenth century some of the letters are shaped quite differently from those now in use. It was the writing current then, and employed by public writers generally. I copied this from one of them, and you can see how good it is. Look at the well-rounded A and D. I have tried to translate the French character into the Russian letters, a difficult thing to do, but I think I have succeeded fairly. Here is a fine sentence written in a good original hand. Zeal triumphs over all. That is the script of the Russian War Office. That is how official documents addressed to important personages should be written. The letters are round, the type black, and the style somewhat remarkable. A stylist would not allow these ornaments or attempts at flourishes just look at these unfinished tales but it has distinction and really depicts the soul of the writer he would like to give play to his imagination and follow the inspiration of his genius but a soldier is only at ease in the guard-room and the pen stops half-way a slave to discipline 
how delightful the first time i met an example of this handwriting i was positively astonished and where do you think i chanced to find it in switzerland of all places now that is an ordinary english hand it can hardly be improved it is so refined and exquisite almost perfection this is an example of another kind a mixture of styles the copy was given me by a french commercial traveller it is founded on the english but the downstrokes are a little blacker and more marked notice that the oval has some slight modification it is more rounded this writing allows for flourishes now a flourish is a dangerous thing its use requires such taste but if successful what a distinction it gives to the whole it results in an incomparable type one to fall in love with dear me how you have gone into all the refinements and details of the question why my dear fellow you are not a calligraphist you are an artist hey gania wonderful said gania and he knows it too he added with a sarcastic smile you may smile but there's a career in this said the general you don't know what a great personage i shall show this to prince why you can command a situation at thirty-five roubles per month to start with however it's half-past twelve he concluded looking at his watch so to business prince for i must be setting to work and shall not see you again to-day sit down a minute i have told you that i cannot receive you myself very often but i should like you but i should like to be of some assistance to you some small assistance of a kind that would give you satisfaction i shall find you a place in one of the state departments an easy place but you will require to be accurate now as to your plans in the house or rather in the family of garnia here my young friend whom i hope you will know better his mother and sister have prepared two or three rooms for lodgers and let them to highly recommended young fellows with board and attendance i am sure nina alexandrovna will take you in on my recommendation there you will be comfortable and well taken care of for i do not think prince that you are the sort of man to be left to the mercy of fate in a town like petersburg nina alexandrovna gania's mother and varvara alexandrovna are ladies for whom i have the highest possible esteem and respect nina alexandrovna is the wife of general ardalion alexandrovitch my old brother-in-arms with whom i regret to say on account of certain circumstances i am no longer acquainted i give you all this information prince in order to make it clear to you that i am personally recommending you to this family and that in so doing i am more or less taking upon myself to answer for you the terms are most reasonable and i trust that your salary will very shortly prove amply sufficient for your expenditure of course pocket money is a necessity if only a little do not be angry prince if i strongly recommend you to avoid carrying money in your pocket but as your purse is quite empty at the present moment you must allow me to press these twenty-five roubles upon your acceptance as something to begin with of course we will settle this little matter another time and if you are the upright honest man you look i anticipate very little trouble between us on that score taking so much interest in you as you may perceive i do i am not without my object and you shall know it in good time you see i am perfectly candid with you i hope gania you have nothing to say against the prince's taking up his abode in your house oh on the contrary my mother will be very glad said gania courteously and kindly i think only one of your rooms is engaged as yet is it not that fellow fared fared ferdishenko yes i don't like that ferdishenko i can't understand why nastasia philipovna encourages him so is he really her cousin as he says oh dear no it's all a joke you know more cousin than i am well what do you think of the arrangement prince 
Thank you, General. You have behaved very kindly to me. All the more so since I did not ask you to help me. I don't say that out of pride. I certainly did not know where to lay my head to-night. Rogozhin asked me to come to his house, of course, but— Rogozhin, no, no, my good fellow, I should strongly recommend you, paternally, or, if you prefer it, as a friend, to forget all about Rogozhin, and, in fact, to stick to the family in which you are about to enter. Thank you, began the prince, and since you are so very kind, there is just one matter which I— You really must excuse me, interrupted the general, but I positively haven't another moment now. I shall just tell Elizaveta Prokofievna about you, and if she wishes to receive you at once, as I shall advise her, I strongly recommend you to ingratiate yourself with her at the first opportunity, for my wife may be of the greatest service to you in many ways. If she cannot receive you now, you must be content to wait till another time. Meanwhile, you, Gania, just look over these accounts, will you? We mustn't forget to finish off that matter. The general left the room, and the prince never succeeded in broaching the business which he had on hand, though he had endeavoured to do so four times. Gania lit a cigarette and offered one to the prince. The latter accepted the offer, but did not talk, being unwilling to disturb Gania's work. He commenced to examine the study and its contents. But Gania hardly so much as glanced at the papers lying before him. He was absent and thoughtful, and his smile and general appearance struck the prince still more disagreeably now that the two were left alone together. Suddenly Gania approached our hero, who was at the moment standing over Nastasia Filipovna's portrait, gazing at it. "'Do you admire that sort of woman, prince?' he asked, looking intently at him. He seemed to have some special object in the question. "'It's a wonderful face,' said the prince, "'and I feel sure that her destiny is not by any means an ordinary, uneventful one. Her face is smiling enough, but she must have suffered terribly, hasn't she? Her eyes show it, those two bones there, the little points under her eyes, just where her cheek begins. It's a proud face, too, terribly proud. And I, I can't say whether she is good and kind or not. Oh, if she be but good, that would make all well. And would you marry a woman like that now? continued Gania, never taking his excited eyes off the prince's face. I cannot marry at all, said the latter. I am an invalid. Would Rogozhin marry her, do you think? Why not? Certainly he would, I should think. He would marry her to-morrow. Marry her to-morrow and murder her in a week. Hardly had the prince uttered the last word when Gania gave such a fearful shudder that the prince almost cried out. "'What's the matter?' said he, seizing Gania's hand. "'Your Highness, his Excellency begs your presence in Her Excellency's apartments,' announced the footman, appearing at the door. The prince immediately followed the man out of the room. End of Part 1 Chapter 3 Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey Part 1 Chapter 4 of The Idiot This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen The Idiot by Fyodor Dostoevsky Translated by Eva M. Martin Part 1 Chapter 4 all three of the Miss Yepanchins were fine, healthy girls, well-grown, with good shoulders and busts, and strong, almost masculine hands. And, of course, with all the above attributes, they enjoyed capital appetites, of which they were not in the least ashamed. Elizaveta Prokofievna sometimes informed the girls that they were a little too candid in this matter, 
but in spite of their outward deference to their mother these three young women in solemn conclave had long agreed to modify the unquestioning obedience which they had been in the habit of according to her and mrs general Yepanchin had judged it better to say nothing about it though of course she was well aware of the fact it is true that her nature sometimes rebelled against these dictates of reason and that she grew yearly more capricious and impatient but having a respectful and well-disciplined husband under her thumb at all times she found it possible as a rule to empty any little accumulations of spleen upon his head and therefore the harmony of the family was kept duly balanced and things went as smoothly as family matters can mrs Yepanchin had a fair appetite herself and generally took her share of the capital midday lunch which was always served for the girls and which was nearly as good as a dinner the young ladies used to have a cup of coffee each before this meal at ten o'clock while still in bed this was a favourite and unalterable arrangement with them at half-past twelve the table was laid in the small dining-room and occasionally the general himself appeared at the family gathering if he had time besides tea and coffee cheese honey butter pancakes of various kinds the lady of the house loved these best cutlets and so on there was generally strong beef soup and other substantial delicacies on the particular morning on which our story has opened the family had assembled in the dining-room and were waiting the general's appearance the latter having promised to come this day if he had been one moment late he would have been sent for at once but he turned up punctually as he came forward to wish his wife good morning and kiss her hands as his custom was he observed something in her look which boded ill he thought he knew the reason and had expected it but still he was not altogether comfortable his daughters advanced to kiss him too and though they did not look exactly angry there was something strange in their expression as well the general was owing to certain circumstances a little inclined to be too suspicious at home and needlessly nervous but as an experienced father and husband he judged it better to take measures at once to protect himself from any dangers there might be in the air however i hope i shall not interfere with the proper sequence of my narrative too much if i diverge for a moment at this point in order to explain the mutual relations between general Yepanchin's family and others acting a part in this history at the time when we take up the thread of their destiny i have already stated that the general though he was a man of lowly origin and of poor education was for all that an experienced and talented husband and father among other things he considered it undesirable to hurry his daughters to the matrimonial altar and to worry them too much with assurances of his paternal wishes for their happiness as is the custom among parents of many grown-up daughters he even succeeded in ranging his wife on his side on this question though he found the feat very difficult to accomplish because unnatural but the general's arguments were conclusive and founded upon obvious facts the general considered that the girl's taste and good sense should be allowed to develop and mature deliberately and that the parent's duty should merely be to keep watch in order that no strange or undesirable choice be made but that the selection once effected both father and mother were bound from that moment to enter heart and soul into the cause and to see that the matter progressed without hindrance until the altar should be happily reached besides this it was clear that the yepanchin's position gained each year with geometrical accuracy both as to financial solidity and social weight and therefore the longer the girls waited the better was their chance of making a brilliant match 
but again amidst the incontrovertible facts just recorded one more equally significant rose up to confront the family and this was that the eldest daughter alexandra had imperceptibly arrived at her twenty-fifth birthday almost at the same moment afanasy ivanovitch totsky a man of immense wealth high connections and good standing announced his intention of marrying afanasy ivanovitch was a gentleman of fifty-five years of age artistically gifted and of most refined tastes he wished to marry well and moreover he was a keen admirer and judge of beauty now since totsky had of late been upon terms of great cordiality with yepanchin which excellent relations were intensified by the fact that they were so to speak partners in several financial enterprises it so happened that the former now put in a friendly request to the general for counsel with regard to the important step he meditated might he suggest for instance such a thing as a marriage between himself and one of the general's daughters evidently the quiet pleasant current of the family life of the yepanchins was about to undergo a change the undoubted beauty of the family par excellence was the youngest aglaya as aforesaid but totsky himself though an egotist of the extremest type realized that he had no chance there aglaya was clearly not for such as he perhaps the sisterly love and friendship of the three girls had more or less exaggerated aglaya's chances of happiness in their opinion the latter's destiny was not merely to be very happy she was to live in a heaven on earth aglaya's husband was to be a compendium of all the virtues and of all success not to speak of fabulous wealth the two elder sisters had agreed that all was to be sacrificed by them if need be for aglaya's sake her dowry was to be colossal and unprecedented the general and his wife were aware of this agreement and therefore when totsky suggested himself for one of the sisters the parents made no doubt that one of the two elder girls would probably accept the offer since totsky would certainly make no difficulty as to dowry the general valued the proposal very highly he knew life and realized what such an offer was worth the answer of the sisters to the communication was if not conclusive at least consoling and hopeful it made known that the eldest alexandra would very likely be disposed to listen to a proposal alexandra was a good-natured girl though she had a will of her own she was intelligent and kind-hearted and if she were to marry totsky she would make him a good wife she did not care for a brilliant marriage she was eminently a woman calculated to soothe and sweeten the life of any man decidedly pretty if not absolutely handsome what better could totsky wish so the matter crept slowly forward the general and totsky had agreed to avoid any hasty and irrevocable step alexandra's parents had not even begun to talk to their daughters freely upon the subject when suddenly as it were a dissonant chord was struck amid the harmony of the proceedings mrs yepanchin began to show signs of discontent and this was a serious matter a certain circumstance had crept in a disagreeable and troublesome factor which threatened to overturn the whole business this circumstance had come into existence eighteen years before close to an estate of totsky's in one of the central provinces of russia there lived at that time a poor gentleman whose estate was of the wretchedest description this gentleman was noted in the district for his persistent ill fortune his name was barashkov and as regards family and descent he was vastly superior to totsky but his estate was mortgaged to the last acre 
one day when he had ridden over to the town to see a creditor the chief peasant of his village followed him shortly after with the news that his house had been burnt down and that his wife had perished with it but his children were safe even barashkov inured to the storms of evil fortune as he was could not stand this last stroke he went mad and died shortly after in the town hospital his estate was sold for the creditors and the little girls two of them of seven and eight years of age respectively were adopted by totsky who undertook their maintenance and education in the kindness of his heart they were brought up together with the children of his german bailiff very soon however there was only one of them left nastasia filipovna for the other little one died of whooping cough totsky who was living abroad at this time very soon forgot all about the child but five years after returning to russia it struck him that he would like to look over his estate and see how matters were going there and arrived at his bailiff's house he was not long in discovering that among the children of the latter there now dwelt a most lovely little girl of twelve sweet and intelligent and bright and promising to develop beauty of most unusual quality as to which last totsky was an undoubted authority he only stayed at his country seat a few days on this occasion but he had time to make his arrangements great changes took place in the child's education a good governess was engaged a swiss lady of experience and culture for four years this lady resided in the house with little nastya and then the education was considered complete the governess took her departure and another lady came down to fetch nastya by totsky's instructions the child was now transported to another of totsky's estates in a distant part of the country here she found a delightful little house just built and prepared for her reception with great care and taste and here she took up her abode together with the lady who had accompanied her from her old home in the house there were two experienced maids musical instruments of all sorts a charming young lady's library pictures paint boxes a lap-dog and everything to make life agreeable within a fortnight totsky himself arrived and from that time he appeared to have taken a great fancy to this part of the world and came down each summer staying two and three months at a time so passed four years peacefully and happily in charming surroundings at the end of that time and about four months after totsky's last visit he had stayed but a fortnight on this occasion a report reached nastasia filipovna that he was about to be married in st petersburg to a rich eminent and lovely woman the report was only partially true the marriage project being only in an embryo condition but a great change now came over nastasia filipovna she suddenly displayed unusual decision of character and without wasting time in thought she left her country home and came up to st petersburg straight to totsky's house all alone the latter amazed at her conduct began to express his displeasure but he very soon became aware that he must change his voice style and everything else with this young lady the good old times were gone an entirely new and different woman sat before him between whom and the girl he had left in the country last july there seemed nothing in common in the first place this new woman understood a good deal more than was usual for young people of her age so much indeed that totsky could not help wondering where she had picked up her knowledge surely not from her young lady's library it even embraced legal matters and the world in general to a considerable extent 
her character was absolutely changed no more of the girlish alternations of timidity and petulance the adorable naivete the reveries the tears the playfulness it was an entirely new and hitherto unknown being who now sat and laughed at him and informed him to his face that she had never had the faintest feeling for him of any kind except loathing and contempt contempt which had followed closely upon her sensations of surprise and bewilderment after her first acquaintance with him this new woman gave him further to understand that though it was absolutely the same to her whom he married yet she had decided to prevent this marriage for no particular reason but that she chose to do so and because she wished to amuse herself at his expense for that it was quite her turn to laugh a little now such were her words very likely she did not give her real reason for this eccentric conduct but at all events that was all the explanation she deigned to offer meanwhile totsky thought the matter over as well as his scattered ideas would permit his meditations lasted a fortnight however and at the end of that time his resolution was taken the fact was totsky was at that time a man of fifty years of age his position was solid and respectable his place in society had long been firmly fixed upon safe foundations he loved himself his personal comforts and his position better than all the world as every respectable gentleman should at the same time his grasp of things in general soon showed totsky that he now had to deal with a being who was outside the pale of the ordinary rules of traditional behaviour and who would not only threaten mischief but would undoubtedly carry it out and stop for no one there was evidently he concluded something at work here some storm of the mind some paroxysm of romantic anger goodness knows against whom or what some insatiable contempt in a word something altogether absurd and impossible but at the same time most dangerous to be met with by any respectable person with a position in society to keep up for a man of Totsky's wealth and standing, it would of course have been the simplest possible matter to take steps which would rid him at once from all annoyance, while it was obviously impossible for Nastasia Filipovna to harm him in any way, either legally or by stirring up a scandal, for in the case of the latter danger he could so easily remove her to a sphere of safety. However, these arguments would only hold good in case of Nastasia acting as others might in such an emergency. She was much more likely to overstep the bounds of reasonable conduct by some extraordinary eccentricity. Here the sound judgment of Totsky stood him in good stead. He realised that Nastasia Filipovna must be well aware that she could do nothing by legal means to injure him and that her flashing eyes betrayed some entirely different intention. Nastasia Filipovna was quite capable of ruining herself, and even of perpetrating something which would send her to Siberia, for the mere pleasure of injuring a man for whom she had developed so inhuman a sense of loathing and contempt. He had sufficient insight to understand that she valued nothing in the world, herself least of all, and he made no attempt to conceal the fact that he was a coward in some respects. For instance, if he had been told that he would be stabbed at the altar, or publicly insulted, he would undoubtedly have been frightened, but not so much at the idea of being murdered, or wounded, or insulted, as at the thought that if such things were to happen, he would be made to look ridiculous in the eyes of society. He knew well that Nastasia thoroughly understood him, and where to wound him and how. And therefore, as the marriage was still only in embryo, 
Totsky decided to conciliate her by giving it up. His decision was strengthened by the fact that Nastasia Filipovna had curiously altered of late. It would be difficult to conceive how different she was physically, at the present time, to the girl of a few years ago. She was pretty then, but now... Totsky laughed angrily when he thought how short-sighted he had been. In days gone by he remembered how he had looked at her beautiful eyes, how even then he had marvelled at their dark, mysterious depths, and at their wondering gaze which seemed to seek an answer to some unknown riddle. Her complexion also had altered. She was now exceedingly pale, but curiously this change only made her more beautiful. Like most men of the world, Totsky had rather despised such a cheaply bought conquest, but of late years he had begun to think differently about it. It had struck him as long ago as last spring that he ought to be finding a good match for Nastasia. For instance, some respectable and reasonable young fellow serving in a government office in another part of the country. How maliciously Nastasia laughed at the idea of such a thing now! However, it appeared to Totsky that he might make use of her in another way, and he determined to establish her in St. Petersburg, surrounding her with all the comforts and luxuries that his wealth could command. In this way he might gain glory in certain circles. Five years of this Petersburg life went by, and of course during that time a great deal happened. Totsky's position was very uncomfortable. Having funked once, he could not totally regain his ease. He was afraid, he did not know why, but he was simply afraid of Nastasia Filipovna. For the first two years or so he had suspected that she wished to marry him herself, and that only her vanity prevented her telling him so. He thought that she wanted him to approach her with a humble proposal from his own side, but to his great and not entirely pleasurable amazement he discovered that this was by no means the case, and that were he to offer himself he would be refused. He could not understand such a state of things, and was obliged to conclude that it was pride, the pride of an injured and imaginative woman, which had gone to such lengths that it preferred to sit and nurse its contempt and hatred in solitude, rather than mount to heights of hitherto unattainable splendour. To make matters worse, she was quite impervious to mercenary considerations, and could not be bribed in any way. Finally, Totsky took cunning means to try to break his chains and be free. He tried to tempt her in various ways to lose her heart. He invited princes, hussars, secretaries of embassies, poets, novelists, even socialists to see her but not one of them all made the faintest impression upon Nastasia. It was as though she had a pebble in place of a heart, as though her feelings and affections were dried up and withered for ever. She lived almost entirely alone. She read, she studied, she loved music. Her principal acquaintances were poor women of various grades, a couple of actresses, and the family of a poor schoolteacher. Among these people she was much beloved. She received four or five friends sometimes of an evening. Totsky often came. Lately, too, General Yepanchin had been enabled with great difficulty to introduce himself into her circle. Gania made her acquaintance also, and others were Ferdishenko, an ill-bred and would-be witty young clerk, and Ptitsin, a money-lender of modest and polished manners, who had risen from poverty. In fact, Nastasia Filipovna's beauty became a thing known to all the town, but not a single man could boast of anything more than his own admiration for her, and this reputation of hers, and her wit and culture and grace, 
all confirmed Totsky in the plan he had now prepared. And it was at this moment that General Yepanchin began to play so large and important a part in the story. When Totsky had approached the general with his request for friendly counsel, as to a marriage with one of his daughters, he had made a full and candid confession. He had said that he intended to stop at no means to obtain his freedom. Even if Nastasia were to promise to leave him entirely alone in future, he would not, he said, believe and trust her. Words were not enough for him. He must have solid guarantees of some sort. So he and the general determined to try what an attempt to appeal to her heart would effect. Having arrived at Nastasia's house one day with Yepanchin, Totsky immediately began to speak of the intolerable torment of his position. He admitted that he was to blame for all, but candidly confessed that he could not bring himself to feel any remorse for his original guilt towards herself, because he was a man of sensual passions, which were inborn and ineradicable and that he had no power over himself in this respect, but that he wished seriously to marry at last, and that the whole fate of the most desirable social union which he contemplated was in her hands. In a word, he confided his all to her generosity of heart. General Yepanchin took up his part, and spoke in the character of father of a family. He spoke sensibly, and without wasting words over any attempt at sentimentality, he merely recorded his full admission of her right to be the arbiter of Totsky's destiny at this moment. He then pointed out that the fate of his daughter, and very likely of both his other daughters, now hung upon her reply. To Nastasia's question as to what they wished her to do, Totsky confessed that he had been so frightened by her five years ago that he could never now be entirely comfortable until she herself married. He immediately added that such a suggestion from him would, of course, be absurd, unless accompanied by remarks of a more pointed nature. He very well knew, he said, that a certain young gentleman of good family, namely Gavrila Ardalionovich Volgin, with whom she was acquainted, and whom she received at her house, had long loved her passionately, and would give his life for some response from her. The young fellow had confessed this love of his to him, Totsky, and had also admitted it in the hearing of his benefactor, General Yepanchin. Lastly, he could not help being of opinion that Nastasia must be aware of Gania's love for her, and if he, Totsky, mistook not, she had looked with some favour upon it, being often lonely and rather tired of her present life. Having remarked how difficult it was for him of all people to speak to her of these matters, Totsky concluded by saying that he trusted Nastasia Filipovna would not look with contempt upon him, if he now expressed his sincere desire to guarantee her future by a gift of seventy-five thousand roubles. He added that the sum would have been left her all the same in his will, and that therefore she must not consider the gift as in any way an indemnification to her for anything but that there was no reason, after all, why a man should not be allowed to entertain a natural desire to lighten his conscience, etc., etc. In fact, all that would naturally be said under the circumstances. Totsky was very eloquent all through, and in conclusion just touched on the fact that not a soul in the world, not even General Yepanchin, had ever heard a word about the above seventy-five thousand roubles, and that this was the first time he had ever given expression to his intentions in respect to them. Nastasia Filipovna's reply to this long rigmarole astonished both the friends considerably. Not only was there no trace of her former irony, of her old hatred and enmity, and of that dreadful laughter the very recollection of which sent a cold chill down Totsky's back to this very day. 
but she seemed charmed and really glad to have the opportunity of talking seriously with him for once in a way she confessed that she had long wished to have a frank and free conversation and to ask for friendly advice but that pride had hitherto prevented her now however that the ice was broken nothing could be more welcome to her than this opportunity first with a sad smile and then with a twinkle of merriment in her eyes she admitted that such a storm as that of five years ago was now quite out of the question she said that she had long since changed her views of things and recognized that facts must be taken into consideration in spite of the feelings of the heart what was done was done and ended and she could not understand why totsky should still feel alarmed she next turned to general epanchin and observed most courteously that she had long since known of his daughters and that she had heard none but good report that she had learned to think of them with deep and sincere respect the idea alone that she could in any way serve them would be to her both a pride and a source of real happiness it was true that she was lonely in her present life totsky had judged her thoughts aright she longed to rise if not to love at least to family life and new hopes and objects but as to gavrila ardalionovitch she could not as yet say much she thought it must be the case that he loved her she felt that she too might learn to love him if she could be sure of the firmness of his attachment to herself but he was very young and it was a difficult question to decide what she specially liked about him was that he worked and supported his family by his toil she had heard that he was proud and ambitious she had heard much that was interesting of his mother and sister she had heard of them from mr ptitsin and would much like to make their acquaintance but another question would they like to receive her into their house at all events though she did not reject the idea of this marriage she desired not to be hurried as for the seventy-five thousand roubles mr totsky need not have found any difficulty or awkwardness about the matter she quite understood the value of money and would of course accept the gift she thanked him for his delicacy however but saw no reason why gavrila ardalionovitch should not know about it she would not marry the latter she said until she felt persuaded that neither on his part nor on the part of his family did there exist any sort of concealed suspicions as to herself she did not intend to ask forgiveness for anything in the past which fact she desired to be known she did not consider herself to blame for anything that had happened in former years and she thought that gavrila ardalionovitch should be informed as to the relations which had existed between herself and totsky during the last five years if she accepted this money it was not to be considered as indemnification for her misfortune as a young girl which had not been in any degree her own fault but merely as compensation for her ruined life she became so excited and agitated during all these explanations and confessions that general epanchin was highly gratified and considered the matter satisfactorily arranged once for all but the once bitten totsky was twice shy and looked for hidden snakes among the flowers however the special point to which the two friends particularly trusted to bring about their object namely gania's attractiveness for nastasia philipovna stood out more and more prominently the pourparlers had commenced and gradually even totsky began to believe in the possibility of success before long nastasia and gania had talked the matter over very little was said her modesty seemed to suffer under the infliction of discussing such a question but she recognized his love on the understanding that she bound herself to nothing whatever 
and that she reserved the right to say no up to the very hour of the marriage ceremony. Gania was to have the same right of refusal at the last moment. It soon became clear to Gania, after scenes of wrath and quarrellings at the domestic hearth, that his family was seriously opposed to the match, and that Nastasia was aware of this fact was equally evident. She said nothing about it, though he daily expected her to do so. There were several rumours afloat before long, which upset Totsky's equanimity a good deal, but we will not now stop to describe them, merely mentioning an instance or two. One was that Nastasia had entered into close and secret relations with the Yapanchin girls, a most unlikely rumour. Another was that Nastasia had long satisfied herself of the fact that Gania was merely marrying her for money, and that his nature was gloomy and greedy, impatient and selfish to an extraordinary degree, and that although he had been keen enough in his desire to achieve a conquest before, yet since the two friends had agreed to exploit his passion for their own purposes, it was clear enough that he had begun to consider the whole thing a nuisance and a nightmare. In his heart passion and hate seemed to hold divided sway, and although he had at last given his consent to marry the woman, as he said, under the stress of circumstances, yet he promised himself that he would take it out of her, after marriage. Nastasia seemed to Totsky to have divined all this, and to be preparing something on her own account, which frightened him to such an extent that he did not dare communicate his views even to the general. But at times he would pluck up his courage, and be full of hope and good spirits again, acting, in fact, as weak men do act in such circumstances. However, both the friends felt that the thing looked rosy indeed when one day Nastasia informed them that she would give her final answer on the evening of her birthday, which anniversary was due in a very short time. A strange rumour began to circulate, meanwhile, no less than that the respectable and highly respected General Yepanchin was himself so fascinated by Nastasia Filipovna that his feeling for her amounted almost to passion. What he thought to gain by Gania's marriage to the girl it was difficult to imagine. Possibly he counted on Gania's complacence for Totsky had long suspected that there existed some secret understanding between the general and his secretary. At all events the fact was known that he had prepared a magnificent present of pearls for Nastasia's birthday, and that he was looking forward to the occasion when he should present his gift with the greatest excitement and impatience. The day before her birthday he was in a fever of agitation. Mrs. Yepanchin, long accustomed to her husband's infidelities, had heard of the pearls, and the rumour excited her liveliest curiosity and interest. The general remarked her suspicions, and felt that a grand explanation must shortly take place, which fact alarmed him much. This is the reason why he was so unwilling to take lunch, on the morning upon which we took up this narrative with the rest of his family. Before the prince's arrival he had made up his mind to plead business and cut the meal, which simply meant running away. He was particularly anxious that this one day should be passed, especially the evening, without unpleasantness between himself and his family. And just at the right moment the prince turned up, as though heaven had sent him on purpose said the general to himself, as he left the study to seek out the wife of his bosom. End of Part 1 Chapter 4 Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey Part 1 Chapter 5 of The Idiot This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen
the idiot by fyodor dostoevsky translated by eva m martin part one chapter five mrs general yepanchin was a proud woman by nature what must her feelings have been when she heard that prince muishkin the last of his and her line had arrived in beggar's guise a wretched idiot a recipient of charity all of which details the general gave out for greater effect he was anxious to steal her interest at the first swoop so as to distract her thoughts from other matters nearer home mrs yepanchin was in the habit of holding herself very straight and staring before her without speaking in moments of excitement she was a fine woman of the same age as her husband with a slightly hooked nose a high narrow forehead thick hair turning a little grey and a sallow complexion her eyes were grey and wore a very curious expression at times she believed them to be most effective a belief that nothing could alter what receive him now at once asked mrs yepanchin gazing vaguely at her husband as he stood fidgeting before her oh dear me i assure you there is no need to stand on ceremony with him the general explained hastily he is quite a child not to say a pathetic looking creature he has fits of some sort and has just arrived from switzerland straight from the station dressed like a german and without a farthing in his pocket i gave him twenty-five roubles to go on with and am going to find him some easy place in one of the government offices i should like you to ply him well with the victuals my dears for i should think he must be very hungry you astonish me said the lady gazing as before fits and hungry too what sort of fits oh they don't come on frequently besides he's a regular child though he seems to be fairly educated i should like you if possible my dears the general added making slowly for the door to put him through his paces a bit and see what he is good for i think you should be kind to him it is a good deed you know however just as you like of course but he is a sort of relation remember and i thought it might interest you to see the young fellow seeing that this is so oh of course mamma if we needn't stand on ceremony with him we must give the poor fellow something to eat after his journey especially as he has not the least idea where to go said alexandra the eldest of the girls besides he's quite a child we can entertain him with a little hide-and-seek in case of need said adelaida hide-and-seek what do you mean inquired mrs yepanchin oh do stop pretending mamma cried aglaya in vexation send him up father mother allows the general rang the bell and gave orders that the prince should be shown in only on condition that he has a napkin under his chin at lunch then said mrs yepanchin and let fyodor or mavra stand behind him while he eats is he quiet when he has these fits he doesn't show violence does he on the contrary he seems to be very well brought up his manners are excellent but here he is himself here you are prince let me introduce you the last of the muishkins a relative of your own my dear or at least of the same name receive him kindly please they'll bring in lunch directly prince you must stop and have some but you must excuse me i'm in a hurry i must be off we all know where you must be off to said mrs yepanchin in a meaning voice yes yes i must hurry away i'm late look here dears let him write you something in your albums you've no idea what a wonderful calligraphist he is wonderful talent he has just written out abbot pafnute signed this for me well au revoir stop a minute where are you off to who is this abbot 
cried mrs epanchin to her retreating husband in a tone of excited annoyance yes my dear it was an old abbot of that name i must be off to see the count he's waiting for me i'm late good-bye au revoir prince and the general bolted at full speed oh yes i know what count you're going to see remarked his wife in a cutting manner as she turned her angry eyes on the prince now then what's all this about what abbot who's pafnute she added brusquely mamma said alexandra shocked at her rudeness aglaya stamped her foot nonsense let me alone said the angry mother now then prince sit down here no nearer come nearer the light i want to have a good look at you so now then who is this abbot abbot pafnute said our friend seriously and with deference pafnute yes and who was he mrs epanchin put these questions hastily and brusquely and when the prince answered she nodded her head sagely at each word he said the abbot pafnute lived in the fourteenth century began the prince he was in charge of one of the monasteries on the volga about where our present kostroma government lies he went to oriol and helped in the great matters then going on in the religious world he signed an edict there and i have seen a print of his signature it struck me so i copied it when the general asked me in his study to write something for him to show my handwriting i wrote the abbot pafnute signed this in the exact handwriting of the abbot the general liked it very much and that's why he recalled it just now aglaya make a note of pafnute or we shall forget him hmm. and where is this signature i think it was left on the general's table let it be sent for at once oh i'll write you a new one in half a minute said the prince if you like of course mamma said alexandra but let's have lunch now we are all hungry yes come along prince said the mother are you very hungry yes i must say that i am pretty hungry thanks very much hmm. i like to see that you know your manners and you are by no means such a person as the general thought fit to describe you come along you sit here opposite to me she continued i wish to be able to see your face alexandra adelaida look after the prince he doesn't seem so very ill does he i don't think he requires a napkin under his chin after all are you accustomed to having one on prince formerly when i was seven years old or so i believe i wore one but now i usually hold my napkin on my knee when i eat of course of course and about your fits fits asked the prince slightly surprised i very seldom have fits nowadays i don't know how it may be here though they say the climate may be bad for me he talks very well you know said mrs epanchin who still continued to nod at each word the prince spoke i really did not expect it at all in fact i suppose it was all stuff and nonsense on the general's part as usual eat away prince and tell me where you were born and where you were brought up i wish to know all about you you interest me very much the prince expressed his thanks once more and eating heartily the while recommenced the narrative of his life in switzerland all of which we have heard before mrs epanchin became more and more pleased with her guest the girls too listened with considerable attention in talking over the question of relationship it turned out that the prince was very well up in the matter and knew his pedigree off by heart it was found that scarcely any connection existed between himself and mrs epanchin but the talk and the opportunity of conversing about her family tree gratified the latter exceedingly and she rose from the table in great good humour let's all go to my boudoir she said and they shall bring some coffee in there 
"'That's the room where we all assemble and busy ourselves as we like best,' she explained. "'Alexandra, my eldest here, plays the piano, or reads or sews. Adelaida paints landscapes and portraits, but never finishes any. And Aglaya sits and does nothing. I don't work too much, either.' Here we are now. Sit down, Prince, near the fire, and talk to us. I want to hear you relate something. I wish to make sure of you first, and then tell my old friend, Princess Bielokonsky, about you. I wish you to know all the good people and to interest them. Now then, begin. Mamma, it's rather a strange order, that, said Adelaida, who was fussing among her paints and paint-brushes at the easel. Aglaya and Alexandra had settled themselves with folded hands on a sofa, evidently meaning to be listeners. The prince felt that the general attention was concentrated upon himself. "'I should refuse to say a word if I were ordered to tell a story like that,' observed Aglaya. "'Why, what's there strange about it? He has a tongue. Why shouldn't he tell us something? I want to judge whether he is a good storyteller.' anything you like prince how you liked switzerland what was your first impression anything you'll see he'll begin directly and tell us all about it beautifully the impression was forcible the prince began there you see girls said the impatient lady he has begun you see well well then let him talk mamma said alexandra this prince is a great humbug and by no means an idiot she whispered to aglaya oh i saw that at once replied the latter i don't think it at all nice of him to play a part what does he wish to gain by it i wonder my first impression was a very strong one repeated the prince when they took me away from russia i remember i passed through many german towns and looked out of the windows but did not trouble so much as to ask questions about them. This was after a long series of fits. I always used to fall into a sort of torpid condition after such a series, and lost my memory almost entirely. And though I was not altogether without reason at such times, yet I had no logical power of thought. This would continue for three or four days, and then I would recover myself again. I remember my melancholy was intolerable. I felt inclined to cry. I sat and wondered and wondered uncomfortably. The consciousness that everything was strange weighed terribly upon me. I could understand that it was all foreign and strange. I recollect I awoke from this state for the first time at Baal one evening. The bray of a donkey aroused me a donkey in the town market. I saw the donkey and was extremely pleased with it, and from that moment my head seemed to clear. A donkey! How strange! Yet it is not strange. Any one of us might fall in love with a donkey. It happened in mythological times, said Madame Yepanchin, looking wrathfully at her daughters who had begun to laugh. Go on, prince since that evening i have been specially fond of donkeys i began to ask questions about them for i had never seen one before and i at once came to the conclusion that this must be one of the most useful of animals strong willing patient cheap and thanks to this donkey i began to like the whole country i was travelling through and my melancholy passed away all this is very strange and interesting said mrs epanchin now let's leave the donkey and go on to other matters what are you laughing at aglaya and you too adelaida the prince told us his experiences very cleverly he saw the donkey himself and what have you ever seen you have never been abroad i have seen a donkey though mamma said aglaya and i've heard one said adelaida and all three of the girls laughed out loud and the prince laughed with them well it's too bad of you said mamma 
you must forgive them prince they are good girls i am very fond of them though i often have to be scolding them they are all as silly and mad as march hares oh why shouldn't they laugh said the prince i shouldn't have let the chance go by in their place i know but i stick up for the donkey all the same he's a patient good-natured fellow are you a patient man prince i ask out of curiosity said mrs epanchin all laughed again oh that wretched donkey again i see cried the lady i assure you prince i was not guilty of the least insinuation oh i assure you i take your word for it and the prince continued laughing merrily i must say it's very nice of you to laugh i see you really are a kind-hearted fellow said mrs epanchin i'm not always kind though i am kind myself and always kind too if you please she retorted unexpectedly and that is my chief fault for one ought not to be always kind i am often angry with these girls and their father but the worst of it is i am always kindest when i am cross i was very angry just before you came and aglaya there read me a lesson thanks aglaya dear come and kiss me there that's enough she added as aglaya came forward and kissed her lips and then her hand now then go on prince perhaps you can think of something more exciting than about the donkey hmm? i must say again i can't understand how you can expect any one to tell you stories straight away so said adelaida i know i never could yes but the prince can because he is clever cleverer than you are by ten or twenty times if you like there that's so prince and seriously let's drop the donkey now what else did you see abroad besides the donkey yes but the prince told us about the donkey very cleverly all the same said alexandra i have always been most interested to hear how people go mad and get well again and that sort of thing especially when it happens suddenly quite so quite so said mrs epanchin delighted i see you can be sensible now and then alexandra you were speaking of switzerland prince yes we came to lucerne and i was taken out in a boat i felt how lovely it was but the loveliness weighed upon me somehow or other and made me feel melancholy why asked alexandra i don't know i always feel like that when i look at the beauties of nature for the first time but then i was ill at that time of course oh but i should like to see it said adelaida and i don't know when we shall ever go abroad i've been two years looking out for a good subject for a picture i've done all i know the north and south i know by heart as our poet observes do help me to a subject prince oh but i know nothing about painting it seems to me one only has to look and paint what one sees but i don't know how to see nonsense what rubbish you talk the mother struck in not know how to see open your eyes and look if you can't see here you won't see abroad either tell us what you saw yourself prince yes that's better said adelaida the prince learned to see abroad oh i hardly know you see i only went to restore my health i don't know whether i learned to see exactly i was very happy however nearly all the time happy you can be happy cried aglaya then how can you say you did not learn to see i should think you could teach us to see oh do teach us laughed adelaida oh i can't do that said the prince laughing too i lived almost all the while in one little swiss village what can i teach you at first i was only just not absolutely dull then my health began to improve then every day became dearer and more precious to me 
and the longer I stayed, the dearer became the time to me. So much so that I could not help observing it, but why this was so it would be difficult to say. So that you didn't care to go anywhere else? Well, at first I did. I was restless. I didn't know, however, I should manage to support life. You know there are such moments, especially in solitude. There was a waterfall near us, such a lovely thin streak of water, like a thread but white and moving. It fell from a great height, but it looked quite low, and it was half a mile away, though it did not seem fifty paces. I loved to listen to it at night, but it was then that I became so restless. Sometimes I went and climbed the mountain and stood there in the midst of the tall pines, all alone in the terrible silence, with our little village in the distance, and the sky so blue and the sun so bright, and an old ruined castle on the mountainside far away. I used to watch the line where earth and sky met, and longed to go and seek there the key of all mysteries thinking that I might find there a new life, perhaps some great city, where life should be grander and richer. And then it struck me that life may be grand enough even in a prison. I read that last most praiseworthy thought in my manual when I was twelve years old," said Aglaya. "'All this is pure philosophy,' said Adelaida. You are a philosopher, prince, and have come here to instruct us in your views." "'Perhaps you are right,' said the prince, smiling. "'I think I am a philosopher, perhaps. And who knows, perhaps I do wish to teach my views of things to those I meet with. Your philosophy is rather like that of an old woman we know, who is rich and yet does nothing but try how little she can spend. She talks of nothing but money all day. Your great philosophical idea of a grand life in a prison, and your four happy years in that Swiss village, are like this, rather," said Aglaya. "'As to life in a prison, of course there may be two opinions,' said the prince. I once heard the story of a man who lived twelve years in a prison. I heard it from the man himself. He was one of the persons under treatment with my professor. He had fits and attacks of melancholy, then he would weep, and once he tried to commit suicide. His life in prison was sad enough. His only acquaintances were spiders and a tree that grew outside his grating. But I think I had better tell you of another man I met last year. There was a very strange feature in this case strange because of its extremely rare occurrence. This man had once been brought to the scaffold, in company with several others, and had had the sentence of death by shooting passed upon him for some political crime. Twenty minutes later he had been reprieved, and some other punishments substituted. But the interval between the two sentences, twenty minutes, or at least a quarter of an hour, had been passed in the certainty that within a few minutes he must die. I was very anxious to hear him speak of his impressions during that dreadful time, and I several times inquired of him as to what he thought and felt. He remembered everything with the most accurate and extraordinary distinctness and declared that he would never forget a single iota of the experience. About twenty paces from the scaffold, where he had stood to hear the sentence, were three posts fixed in the ground, to which to fasten the criminals, of whom there were several. The first three criminals were taken to the posts, dressed in long white tunics with white caps drawn over their faces, so that they could not see the rifles pointed at them. Then a group of soldiers took their stand opposite to each post. My friend was the eighth on the list, and therefore he would have been among the third lot to go up. A priest went about among them with a cross, and there was about five minutes of time left for him to live. 
he said that those five minutes seemed to him to be a most interminable period an enormous wealth of time he seemed to be living in these minutes so many lives that there was no need as yet to think of that last moment so that he made several arrangements dividing up the time into portions one for saying farewell to his companions two minutes for that then a couple more for thinking over his own life and career and all about himself and another minute for a last look around he remembered having divided his time like this quite well while saying good-bye to his friends he recollected asking one of them some very usual everyday question and being much interested in the answer then having bade farewell he embarked upon those two minutes which he had allotted for looking into himself he knew beforehand what he was going to think about he wished to put it to himself as quickly and clearly as possible that here was he a living thinking man and that in three minutes he would be nobody or if somebody or something then what and where he thought he would decide this question once and for all in these last three minutes a little way off there stood a church and its gilded spire glittered in the sun he remembered staring stubbornly at this spire and at the rays of light sparkling from it he could not tear his eyes from these rays of light he got the idea that these rays were his new nature and that in three minutes he would become one of them amalgamated somehow with them the repugnance to what must ensue almost immediately and the uncertainty were dreadful he said but worst of all was the idea what should i do if i were not to die now what if i were to return to life again what an eternity of days and all mine how i should grudge and count up every minute of it so as not to waste a single instant he said that this thought weighed so upon him and became such a terrible burden upon his brain that he could not bear it and wished they would shoot him quickly and have done with it the prince paused and all waited expecting him to go on again and finish the story is that all asked aglaya all yes said the prince emerging from a momentary reverie and why did you tell us this oh i happened to recall it that's all it fitted into the conversation you probably wish to deduce prince said alexandra that moments of time cannot be reckoned by money value and that sometimes five minutes are worth priceless treasures all this is very praiseworthy but may i ask about this friend of yours who told you the terrible experience of his life he was reprieved you say in other words they did restore him to that eternity of days what did he do with these riches of time did he keep careful account of his minutes oh no he didn't i asked him myself he said that he had not lived a bit as he had intended and had wasted many and many a minute very well then there's an experiment and the thing is proved one cannot live and count each moment say what you like but one cannot that is true said the prince i have thought so myself and yet why shouldn't one do it you think then that you could live more wisely than other people said aglaya i have had that idea and you have it still yes i have it still the prince replied he had contemplated aglaya until now with a pleasant though rather timid smile but as the last words fell from his lips he began to laugh and looked at her merrily you are not very modest said she but how brave you are said he you are laughing and i that man's tale impressed me so much that i dreamt of it afterwards yes i dreamt of those five minutes he looked at his listeners again with that same serious searching expression you are not angry with me 
he asked suddenly and with a kind of nervous hurry although he looked them straight in the face why should we be angry they cried only because i seem to be giving you a lecture all the time at this they laughed heartily please don't be angry with me continued the prince i know very well that i have seen less of life than other people and have less knowledge of it i must appear to speak strangely sometimes he said the last words nervously you say you have been happy and that proves you have lived not less but more than other people why make all these excuses interrupted aglaya in a mocking tone of voice besides you need not mind about lecturing us you have nothing to boast of with your quietism one could live happily a hundred years at least one might show you the execution of a felon or show you one's little finger you could draw a moral from either and be quite satisfied that sort of existence is easy enough i can't understand why you always fly into a temper said mrs epanchin who had been listening to the conversation and examining the faces of the speakers in turn i do not understand what you mean what has your little finger to do with it the prince talks well though he is not amusing he began all right but now he seems sad never mind mamma prince i wish you had seen an execution said aglaya i should like to ask you a question about that if you had i have seen an execution said the prince you have cried aglaya i might have guessed it that's a fitting crown to the rest of the story if you have seen an execution how can you say you lived happily all the while but is there capital punishment where you were asked adelaida i saw it at lyon schneider took us there and as soon as we arrived we came in for that well and did you like it very much was it very edifying and instructive asked aglaya no i didn't like it at all and was ill after seeing it but i confess i stared as though my eyes were fixed to the sight i could not tear them away i too should have been unable to tear my eyes away said aglaya they do not at all approve of women going to see an execution there the women who do go are condemned for it afterwards in the newspapers that is by contending that it is not a sight for women they admit that it is a sight for men i congratulate them on the deduction i suppose you quite agree with them prince tell us about the execution put in adelaida i would much rather not just now said the prince a little disturbed and frowning slightly you don't seem to want to tell us said aglaya with a mocking air no the thing is i was telling all about the execution a little while ago and whom did you tell about it the man-servant while well, i was waiting to see the general our man-servant exclaimed several voices at once yes the one who waits in the entrance hall a greyish red-faced man the prince is clearly a democrat remarked aglaya well if you could tell alexey about it surely you can tell us too i do so want to hear about it repeated adelaida just now i confess began the prince with more animation when you asked me for a subject for a picture i confess i had serious thoughts of giving you one i thought of asking you to draw the face of a criminal one minute before the fall of the guillotine while the wretched man is still standing on the scaffold preparatory to placing his neck on the block what his face only his face asked adelaida that would be a strange subject indeed and what sort of picture would that make oh why not the prince insisted with some warmth when i was in Basle, i saw a picture very much in that style i should like to tell you about it i will some time or other it struck me very forcibly oh you shall tell us about the Basle picture another time now we must have all about the execution 
said adelaida tell us about that face as it appeared to your imagination how should it be drawn just the face alone do you mean it was just a minute before the execution began the prince readily carried away by the recollection and evidently forgetting everything else in a moment just at the instant when he stepped off the ladder onto the scaffold he happened to look in my direction i saw his eyes and understood all at once but how am i to describe it i do so wish you or somebody else could draw it you if possible I thought at the time what a picture it would make. You must imagine all that went before, of course, all, all. He had lived in the prison for some time, and had not expected that the execution would take place for at least a week yet. He had counted on all the formalities and so on taking time. But it so happened that his papers had been got ready quickly. At five o'clock in the morning he was asleep. It was October, and at five in the morning it was cold and dark. The governor of the prison comes in on tiptoe and touches the sleeping man's shoulder gently. He starts up. What is it? he says. The execution is fixed for ten o'clock. He was only just awake and would not believe it at first, but began to argue that his papers would not be out for a week and so on. When he was wide awake and realised the truth, he became very silent and argued no more, so they say. But after a bit he said, It comes very hard on one so suddenly. And then he was silent again and said nothing. The three or four hours went by, of course, in necessary preparations. The priest, breakfast, coffee, meat and some wine they gave him. Doesn't it seem ridiculous? and yet i believe these people give them a good breakfast out of pure kindness of heart and believe that they are doing a good action then he is dressed and and then begins the procession through the town to the scaffold i think he too must feel that he has an age to live still while they cart him along probably he thought on the way oh i have a long long time yet three streets of life yet when we've passed this street there'll be that other one and then that one where the baker's shop is on the right and when shall we get there it's ages ages around him are crowds shouting yelling ten thousand faces twenty thousand eyes all this has to be endured and especially the thought here are ten thousand men and not one of them is going to be executed and yet I am to die. Well, all that is preparatory. At the scaffold there is a ladder, and just there he bursts into tears. And this was a strong man, and a terribly wicked one, they say. There was a priest with him the whole time, talking. Even in the cart as they drove along he talked and talked. Probably the other heard nothing. He would begin to listen now and then, and at the third word or so he had forgotten all about it. At last he began to mount the steps. His legs were tied so that he had to take very small steps. The priest, who seemed to be a wise man, had stopped talking now, and only held the cross for the wretched fellow to kiss. At the foot of the ladder he had been pale enough, but when he set foot on the scaffold at the top, his face suddenly became the colour of paper, positively like white note-paper. His legs must have become suddenly feeble and helpless, and he felt a choking in his throat. You know the sudden feeling one has in moments of terrible fear, when one does not lose one's wits, but is absolutely powerless to move. If some dreadful thing were suddenly to happen, if a house were just about to fall on one, don't you know how one would long to sit down and shut one's eyes and wait and wait well when this terrible feeling came over him the priest quickly pressed the cross to his lips without a word a little silver cross it was and he kept on pressing it to the man's lips every second 
and whenever the cross touched his lips the eyes would open for a moment and the legs moved once and he kissed the cross greedily hurriedly just as though he were anxious to catch hold of something in case of its being useful to him afterwards though he could hardly have had any connected religious thoughts at the time and so up to the very block how strange that criminals seldom swoon at such a moment on the contrary the brain is especially active and works incessantly probably hard 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 like an engine at full pressure i imagine that various thoughts must beat loud and fast through his head all unfinished ones and strange funny thoughts very likely like this for instance that man is looking at me and he has a wart on his forehead and the executioner has burst one of his buttons and the lowest one is all rusty and meanwhile he notices and remembers everything there is one point that cannot be forgotten round which everything else dances and turns about and because of this point he cannot faint and this lasts until the very final quarter of a second when the wretched neck is on the block and the victim listens and waits and knows that's the point he knows that he is just now about to die and listens for the rasp of the iron above his head if i lay there i should certainly listen for that grating sound and hear it too there would probably be but the tenth part of an instant left to hear it in but one would certainly hear it and imagine some people declare that when the head flies off it is conscious of having flown off just imagine what a thing to realize fancy if consciousness were to last for even five seconds draw the scaffold so that only the top step of the ladder comes in clearly the criminal must be just stepping on to it his face as white as note-paper the priest is holding the cross to his blue lips and the criminal kisses it and knows and sees and understands everything the cross and the head there's your picture the priest and the executioner with his two assistants and a few heads and eyes below those might come in as subordinate accessories a sort of mist there's a picture for you the prince paused and looked around certainly that isn't much like quietism murmured alexandra half to herself now tell us about your love affairs said adelaida after a moment's pause the prince gazed at her in amazement you know adelaida continued you owe us a description of the baal picture but first i wish to hear how you fell in love don't deny the fact for you did of course besides you stop philosophizing when you are telling about anything why are you ashamed of your stories the moment after you have told them asked aglaya suddenly how silly you are said mrs epanchin looking indignantly towards the last speaker yes that wasn't a clever remark said alexandra don't listen to her prince said mrs epanchin she says that sort of thing out of mischief don't think anything of their nonsense it means nothing they love to chaff but they like you i can see it in their faces i know their faces i know their faces too said the prince with a peculiar stress on the words how so asked adelaida with curiosity what do you know about our faces exclaimed the other two in chorus but the prince was silent and serious all awaited his reply i'll tell you afterwards he said quietly ah you want to arouse our curiosity said aglaya and how terribly solemn you are about it very well interrupted adelaida then if you can read faces so well you must have been in love come now i've guessed let's have the secret i have not been in love 
said the prince as quietly and seriously as before i have been happy in another way how how well i'll tell you said the prince apparently in a deep reverie end of part 1 chapter 5 recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey part 1 chapter 6 of the idiot this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by martin geeson the idiot by fyodor dostoevsky translated by eva m martin part 1 chapter 6 here you all are began the prince settling yourselves down to listen to me with so much curiosity that if i do not satisfy you you will probably be angry with me no no i'm only joking he added hastily with a smile well then they were all children there and i was always among children and only with children they were the children of the village in which i lived and they went to the school there all of them i did not teach them oh no there was a master for that one jules thibault i may have taught them some things but i was among them just as an outsider and i passed all four years of my life there among them i wished for nothing better i used to tell them everything and hid nothing from them their fathers and relations were very angry with me because the children could do nothing without me at last and used to throng after me at all times the schoolmaster was my greatest enemy in the end i had many enemies and all because of the children even schneider reproached me what were they afraid of one can tell a child everything anything i have often been struck by the fact that parents know their children so little they should not conceal so much from them how well even little children understand that their parents conceal things from them because they consider them too young to understand children are capable of giving advice in the most important matters how can one deceive these dear little birds when they look at one so sweetly and confidingly i call them birds because there is nothing in the world better than birds however most of the people were angry with me about one and the same thing but thibault simply was jealous of me at first he had wagged his head and wondered how it was that the children understood what i told them so well and could not learn from him and he laughed like anything when i replied that neither he nor i could teach them very much but that they might teach us a good deal how he could hate me and tell scandalous stories about me living among children as he did is what i cannot understand children soothe and heal the wounded heart i remember there was one poor fellow at our professors who was being treated for madness and you have no idea what those children did for him eventually i don't think he was mad but only terribly unhappy but i'll tell you all about him another day now i must get on with this story the children did not love me at first i was such a sickly awkward kind of a fellow then and i know i am ugly besides i was a foreigner the children used to laugh at me at first and they even went so far as to throw stones at me when they saw me kiss marie i only kissed her once in my life no no don't laugh the prince hastened to suppress the smiles of his audience at this point it was not a matter of love at all if only you knew what a miserable creature she was you would have pitied her just as i did she belonged to our village her mother was an old old woman and they used to sell string and thread and soap and tobacco out of the window of their little house and lived by the pittance they gained by this trade the old woman was ill and very old and could hardly move 
Marie was her daughter, a girl of twenty, weak and thin and consumptive, but still she did heavy work at the houses around day by day. Well, one fine day a commercial traveller betrayed her and carried her off, and a week later he deserted her. She came home dirty, draggled and shoeless. She had walked for a whole week without shoes. She had slept in the fields and caught a terrible cold. Her feet were swollen and sore, and her hands torn and scratched all over. She never had been pretty even before but her eyes were quiet, innocent, kind eyes. She was very quiet always, and I remember once when she had suddenly begun singing at her work, everyone said, Marie tried to sing today, and she got so chaffed that she was silent for ever after. She had been treated unkindly in the place before, but when she came back now, ill and shunned and miserable, not one of them all had the slightest sympathy for her. Cruel people! Oh, what hazy understandings they have on such matters! Her mother was the first to show the way. She received her wrathfully, unkindly, and with contempt. You have disgraced me, she said. She was the first to cast her into ignominy. But when they all heard that Marie had returned to the village, they ran out to see her, and crowded into the little cottage. Old men, children, women, girls. Such a hurrying, stamping, greedy crowd. Marie was lying on the floor at the old woman's feet, hungry, torn, draggled, crying, miserable. When everyone crowded into the room, she hid her face in her dishevelled hair, and lay cowering on the floor. Everyone looked at her as though she were a piece of dirt off the road. The old men scolded and condemned, and the young ones laughed at her. The women condemned her too, and looked at her contemptuously, just as if she were some loathsome insect. Her mother allowed all this to go on, and nodded her head and encouraged them. The old woman was very ill at that time, and knew she was dying. She really did die a couple of months later, and though she felt the end approaching, she never thought of forgiving her daughter to the very day of her death. She would not even speak to her. She made her sleep on straw in a shed, and hardly gave her food enough to support life. Marie was very gentle to her mother, and nursed her, and did everything for her. But the old woman accepted all her services without a word, and never showed her the slightest kindness. Marie bore all this, and I could see when I got to know her that she thought it quite right and fitting, considering herself the lowest and meanest of creatures. When the old woman took to her bed finally, the other old women in the village sat with her by turns, as the custom is there and then Marie was quite driven out of the house. They gave her no food at all, and she could not get any work in the village. None would employ her. The men seemed to consider her no longer a woman. They said such dreadful things to her. Sometimes on Sundays, if they were drunk enough, they used to throw her a penny or two into the mud, and Marie would silently pick up the money. She had begun to spit blood at that time. At last her rags became so tattered and torn that she was ashamed of appearing in the village any longer. The children used to pelt her with mud, so she begged to be taken on as an assistant cowherd, but the cowherd would not have her. Then she took to helping him without leave, and he saw how valuable her assistance was to him, and did not drive her away again. On the contrary, he occasionally gave her the remnants of his dinner bread and cheese. He considered that he was being very kind. When the mother died, the village parson was not ashamed to hold Marie up to public derision and shame. Marie was standing at the coffin's head, in all her rags, crying. A crowd of people had collected to see how she would cry. 
the parson a young fellow ambitious of becoming a great preacher began his sermon and pointed to marie there he said there is the cause of the death of this venerable woman which was a lie because she had been ill for at least two years there she stands before you and dares not lift her eyes from the ground because she knows that the finger of god is upon her look at her tatters and rags the badge of those who lose their virtue who is she her daughter and so on to the end and just fancy this infamy pleased them all of them nearly only the children had altered for then they were all on my side and had learned to love marie this is how it was i had wished to do something for marie i longed to give her some money but i never had a farthing while i was there but i had a little diamond pin and this i sold to a travelling pedlar he gave me eight francs for it it was worth at least forty i long sought to meet marie alone and at last i did meet her on the hillside beyond the village i gave her the eight francs and asked her to take care of the money because i could get no more and then i kissed her and said that she was not to suppose i kissed her with any evil motives or because i was in love with her for that i did so solely out of pity for her and because from the first i had not accounted her as guilty so much as unfortunate i longed to console and encourage her somehow and to assure her that she was not the low base thing which she and others strove to make out but i don't think she understood me she stood before me dreadfully ashamed of herself and with downcast eyes and when i had finished she kissed my hand i would have kissed hers but she drew it away just at this moment the whole troop of children saw us i found out afterwards that they had long kept a watch upon me they all began whistling and clapping their hands and laughing at us marie ran away at once and when i tried to talk to them they threw stones at me all the village heard of it the same day and marie's position became worse than ever the children would not let her pass now in the streets but annoyed her and threw dirt at her more than before they used to run after her she racing away with her poor feeble lungs panting and gasping and they pelting her and shouting abuse at her once i had to interfere by force and after that i took to speaking to them every day and whenever i could occasionally they stopped and listened but they teased marie all the same i told them how unhappy marie was and after a while they stopped their abuse of her and let her go by silently little by little we got into the way of conversing together the children and i i concealed nothing from them i told them all they listened very attentively and soon began to be sorry for marie at last some of them took to saying good morning to her kindly when they met her it is the custom there to salute any one you meet with good morning whether acquainted or not i can imagine how astonished marie was at these first greetings from the children once two little girls got hold of some food and took it to her and came back and told me they said she had burst into tears and that they loved her very much now very soon after that they all became fond of marie and at the same time they began to develop the greatest affection for myself they often came to me and begged me to tell them stories i think i must have told stories well for they did so love to hear them at last i took to reading up interesting things on purpose to pass them on to the little ones and this went on for all the rest of my time there three years later when every one even schneider was angry with me for hiding nothing from the children i pointed out how foolish it was for they always knew things only they learnt them in a way that soiled their minds but not so from me one only has to remember one's own childhood to admit the truth of this 
but nobody was convinced. It was two weeks before her mother died that I kissed Marie, and when the clergyman preached that sermon the children were all on my side. When I told them what a shame it was of the parson to talk as he had done, and explained my reason, they were so angry that some of them went and broke his windows with stones. Of course I stopped them, for that was not right, but all the village heard of it, and how I caught it for spoiling the children. Everyone discovered now that the little ones had taken to being fond of Marie, and their parents were terribly alarmed. But Marie was so happy. The children were forbidden to meet her, but they used to run out of the village to the herd and take her food and things, and sometimes just ran off there and kissed her, and said, Je vous aime, Marie, and then trotted back again. They imagined that I was in love with Marie, and this was the only point on which I did not undeceive them, for they got such enjoyment out of it, and what delicacy and tenderness they showed. In the evening I used to walk to the waterfall. There was a spot there which was quite closed in and hidden from view by large trees, and to this spot the children used to come to me. They could not bear that their dear Léon should love a poor girl without shoes to her feet, and dressed all in rags and tatters. So, would you believe it, they actually clubbed together somehow, and bought her shoes and stockings, and some linen, and even a dress. I can't understand how they managed it, but they did it all together. When I asked them about it, they only laughed and shouted, and the little girls clapped their hands and kissed me. I sometimes went to see Marie secretly, too. She had become very ill and could hardly walk. She still went with the herd, but could not help the herdsman any longer. She used to sit on a stone near, and wait there almost motionless all day till the herd went home. Her consumption was so advanced, and she was so weak, that she used to sit with closed eyes, breathing heavily. Her face was as thin as a skeleton's, and sweat used to stand on her white brow in large drops. I always found her sitting just like that. I used to come up quietly to look at her, but Marie would hear me, open her eyes, and tremble violently as she kissed my hands. I did not take my hand away, because it made her happy to have it and so she would sit and cry quietly. Sometimes she tried to speak, but it was very difficult to understand her. She was almost like a madwoman, with excitement and ecstasy, whenever I came. Occasionally the children came with me. When they did so, they would stand some way off and keep guard over us, so as to tell me if anybody came near. This was a great pleasure to them. When we left her, Marie used to relapse at once into her old condition, and sit with closed eyes and motionless limbs. One day she could not go out at all, and remained at home all alone in the empty hut. But the children very soon became aware of the fact, and nearly all of them visited her that day as she lay alone and helpless in her miserable bed. For two days the children looked after her and then, when the village people got to know that Marie was really dying, some of the old women came and took it in turns to sit by her and look after her a bit. I think they began to be a little sorry for her in the village at last. At all events they did not interfere with the children any more on her account. Marie lay in a state of uncomfortable delirium the whole while. She coughed dreadfully. The old women would not let the children stay in the room, but they all collected outside the window each morning, if only for a moment, and shouted, Bonjour, notre bonne Marie, and Marie no sooner caught sight of or heard them, and she became quite animated at once, and in spite of the old women, would try to sit up and nod her head and smile at them, and thank them. The little ones used to bring her nice things and sweets to eat, but she could hardly touch anything. 
thanks to them i assure you the girl died almost perfectly happy she almost forgot her misery and seemed to accept their love as a sort of symbol of pardon for her offence though she never ceased to consider herself a dreadful sinner they used to flutter at her window just like little birds calling out nous t'aimons marie she died very soon i had thought she would live much longer the day before her death i went to see her for the last time just before sunset i think she recognized me for she pressed my hand next morning they came and told me that marie was dead the children could not be restrained now they went and covered her coffin with flowers and put a wreath of lovely blossoms on her head the pastor did not throw any more shameful words at the poor dead woman but there were very few people at the funeral however when it came to carrying the coffin all the children rushed up to carry it themselves of course they could not do it alone but they insisted on helping and walked alongside and behind crying they have planted roses all round her grave and every year they look after the flowers and make marie's resting place as beautiful as they can i was in ill odour after all this with the parents of the children and especially with the parson and schoolmaster schneider was obliged to promise that i should not meet them and talk to them but we conversed from a distance by signs and they used to write me sweet little notes afterwards i came closer than ever to those little souls but even then it was very dear to me to have them so fond of me schneider said that i did the children great harm by my pernicious system what nonsense that was and what did he mean by my system he said afterwards that he believed i was a child myself just before i came away you have the form and face of an adult he said but as regards soul and character and perhaps even intelligence you are a child in the completest sense of the word and always will be if you live to be sixty i laughed very much for of course that is nonsense but it is a fact that i do not care to be among grown-up people and much prefer the society of children however kind people may be to me i never feel quite at home with them and am always glad to get back to my little companions now my companions have always been children not because i was a child myself once but because young things attract me on one of the first days of my stay in switzerland i was strolling about alone and miserable when i came upon the children rushing noisily out of school with their slates and bags and books their games their laughter and shouts and my soul went out to them i stopped and laughed happily as i watched their little feet moving so quickly girls and boys laughing and crying for as they went home many of them found time to fight and make peace to weep and play i forgot my troubles in looking at them and then all those three years i tried to understand why men should be forever tormenting themselves i lived the life of a child there and thought i should never leave the little village indeed i was far from thinking that i should ever return to russia but at last i recognized the fact that schneider could not keep me any longer and then something so important happened that schneider himself urged me to depart i am going to see now if i can get good advice about it perhaps my lot in life will be changed but that is not the principal thing the principal thing is the entire change that has already come over me i left many things behind me too many they have gone on the journey i said to myself i am going into the world of men i don't know much perhaps but a new life has begun for me i made up my mind to be honest and steadfast in accomplishing my task perhaps i shall meet with troubles and many disappointments but i have made up my mind to be polite and sincere to everyone 
more cannot be asked of me people may consider me a child if they like i am often called an idiot and at one time i certainly was so ill that i was nearly as bad as an idiot but i am not an idiot now how can i possibly be so when i know myself that i am considered one when i received a letter from those dear little souls while passing through berlin i only then realized how much i loved them it was very very painful getting that first little letter how melancholy they had been when they saw me off for a month before they had been talking of my departure and sorrowing over it and at the waterfall of an evening when we parted for the night they would hug me so tight and kiss me so warmly far more so than before and every now and then they would turn up one by one when i was alone just to give me a kiss and a hug to show their love for me the whole flock went with me to the station which was about a mile from the village and every now and then one of them would stop to throw his arms round me and all the little girls had tears in their voices though they tried hard not to cry as the train steamed out of the station i saw them all standing on the platform waving to me and crying hurrah till they were lost in the distance i assure you when i came in here just now and saw your kind faces i can read faces well my heart felt light for the first time since that moment of parting i think i must be one of those who were born to be in luck for one does not often meet with people whom one feels he can love from the first sight of their faces and yet no sooner do i step out of the railway carriage than i happen upon you i know it is more or less a shamefaced thing to speak of one's feelings before others and yet here am i talking like this to you and am not a bit ashamed or shy i am an unsociable sort of fellow and shall very likely not come to see you again for some time but don't think the worse of me for that it is not that i do not value your society and you must never suppose that i have taken offence at anything you asked me about your faces and what i could read in them i will tell you with the greatest pleasure you adelaida ivanovna have a very happy face it is the most sympathetic of the three not to speak of your natural beauty one can look at your face and say to oneself she has the face of a kind sister you are simple and merry but you can see into another's heart very quickly that's what i read in your face you too alexandra ivanovna have a very lovely face but i think you may have some secret sorrow your heart is undoubtedly a kind good one but you are not merry there is a suspicion of shadow in your face like in that of holbein's madonna in dresden so much for your face have i guessed right as for your face lizaveta prokofievna i not only think but am perfectly sure that you are an absolute child in all in all mind both good and bad and in spite of your years don't be angry with me for saying so you know what my feelings for children are and do not suppose that i am so candid out of pure simplicity of soul oh dear no it is by no means the case perhaps i have my own very profound object in view end of part one chapter six recording by martin geeson part one chapter seven of the idiot this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by martin geeson the idiot by fyodor dostoevsky translated by eva m martin part one chapter seven when the prince ceased speaking all were gazing merrily at him even aglaya but lizaveta prokofievna looked the jolliest of all 
well she cried we have put him through his paces with a vengeance my dears you imagined i believe that you were about to patronize this young gentleman like some poor protege picked up somewhere and taken under your magnificent protection what fools we were and what especially big fool is your father well done prince i assure you the general actually asked me to put you through your paces and examine you as to what you said about my face you are absolutely correct in your judgment i am a child and know it i knew it long before you said so you have expressed my own thoughts i think your nature and mine must be extremely alike and i am very glad of it we are like two drops of water only you are a man and i a woman and i've not been to switzerland and that is all the difference between us don't be in a hurry mother the prince says that he has some motive behind his simplicity cried aglaya yes yes so he does laughed the others oh don't you begin bantering him said mamma he is probably a good deal cleverer than all three of you girls put together we shall see only you haven't told us anything about aglaya yet prince and aglaya and i are both waiting to hear i cannot say anything at present i'll tell you afterwards why her face is clear enough isn't it oh yes of course you are very beautiful aglaya ivanovna so beautiful that one is afraid to look at you is that all what about her character persisted mrs Yepanchin. it is difficult to judge when such beauty is concerned i have not prepared my judgment beauty is a riddle that means you have set aglaya a riddle said adelaida guess it aglaya but she's pretty prince isn't she most wonderfully so said the latter warmly gazing at aglaya with admiration almost as lovely as nastasia philipovna but quite a different type all present exchanged looks of surprise as lovely as who said mrs Yepanchin. as nastasia philipovna where have you seen nastasia philipovna what nastasia philipovna gavrila ardalionovitch showed the general her portrait just now how so did he bring the portrait for my husband only to show it nastasia philipovna gave it to gavrila ardalionovitch to-day and the latter brought it here to show the general i must see it cried mrs Yepanchin. where is the portrait if she gave it to him he must have it and he is still in the study he never leaves before four o'clock on wednesdays send for gavrila ardalionovitch at once no i don't long to see him so much look here dear prince be so kind will you just step to the study and fetch this portrait say we want to look at it please do this for me will you he is a nice fellow but a little too simple said adelaida as the prince left the room he is indeed said alexandra almost laughably so at times neither one nor the other seemed to give expression to her full thoughts he got out of it very neatly about our faces though said aglaya he flattered us all round even mamma nonsense cried the latter he did not flatter me it was i who found his appreciation flattering i think you are a great deal more foolish than he is he is simple of course but also very knowing just like myself how stupid of me to speak of the portrait thought the prince as he entered the study with a feeling of guilt at his heart and yet perhaps i was right after all he had an idea unformed as yet but a strange idea gavrila ardalionovitch was still sitting in the study 
buried in a mass of papers he looked as though he did not take his salary from the public company whose servant he was for a sinecure he grew very wroth and confused when the prince asked for the portrait and explained how it came about that he had spoken of it oh curse it all he said what on earth must you go blabbing for you know nothing about the thing and yet idiot he added muttering the last word to himself in irrepressible rage i am very sorry i was not thinking at the time i merely said that aglaya was almost as beautiful as nastasia filipovna gania asked for further details and the prince once more repeated the conversation gania looked at him with ironical contempt the while nastasia filipovna he began and there paused he was clearly much agitated and annoyed the prince reminded him of the portrait listen prince said gania as though an idea had just struck him i wish to ask you a great favour and yet i really don't know he paused again he was trying to make up his mind to something and was turning the matter over the prince waited quietly once more gania fixed him with intent and questioning eyes prince he began again they are rather angry with me in there owing to a circumstance which i need not explain so that i do not care to go in at present without an invitation i particularly wish to speak to aglaya but i have written a few words in case i shall not have the chance of seeing her here the prince observed a small note in his hand and i do not know how to get my communication to her don't you think you could undertake to give it to her at once but only to her mind and so that no one else should see you give it it isn't much of a secret but still well will you do it i don't quite like it replied the prince oh but it is absolutely necessary for me gania entreated believe me if it were not so i would not ask you how else am i to get it to her it is most important dreadfully important gania was evidently much alarmed at the idea that the prince would not consent to take his note and he looked at him now with an expression of absolute entreaty well i will take it then but mind nobody is to see cried the delighted gania and of course i may rely on your word of honour hmm. i won't show it to any one said the prince the letter is not sealed continued gania and paused in confusion oh i won't read it said the prince quite simply he took up the portrait and went out of the room gania left alone clutched his head with his hands one word from her he said one word from her and i may yet be free he could not settle himself to his papers again for agitation and excitement but began walking up and down the room from corner to corner the prince walked along musing he did not like his commission and disliked the idea of gania sending a note to aglaya at all but when he was two rooms distant from the drawing-room where they all were he stopped as though recalling something went to the window nearer the light and began to examine the portrait in his hand he longed to solve the mystery of something in the face of nastasia filipovna something which had struck him as he looked at the portrait for the first time the impression had not left him it was partly the fact of her marvellous beauty that struck him and partly something else there was a suggestion of immense pride and disdain in the face almost of hatred and at the same time something confiding and very full of simplicity the contrast aroused a deep sympathy in his heart as he looked at the lovely face the blinding loveliness of it was almost intolerable this pale thin face with its flaming eyes 
it was a strange beauty the prince gazed at it for a minute or two then glanced around him and hurriedly raised the portrait to his lips when a minute after he reached the drawing-room door his face was quite composed but just as he reached the door he met aglaya coming out alone gavrila ardalionovitch begged me to give you this he said handing her the note aglaya stopped took the letter and gazed strangely into the prince's eyes there was no confusion in her face a little surprise perhaps but that was all by her look she seemed merely to challenge the prince to an explanation as to how he and gania happened to be connected in this matter but her expression was perfectly cool and quiet and even condescending so they stood for a moment or two confronting one another at length a faint smile passed over her face and she passed by him without a word mrs epanchin examined the portrait of nastasia philipovna for some little while holding it critically at arm's length yes she is pretty she said at last even very pretty i have seen her twice but only at a distance so you admire this kind of beauty do you she asked the prince suddenly yes i do this kind do you mean especially this kind yes especially this kind why there is much suffering in this face murmured the prince more as though talking to himself than answering the question i think you are wandering a little prince mrs epanchin decided after a lengthened survey of his face and she tossed the portrait onto the table haughtily alexandra took it and adelaida came up and both the girls examined the photograph just then aglaya entered the room what a power cried adelaida suddenly as she earnestly examined the portrait over her sister's shoulder whom what power asked her mother crossly such beauty is real power said adelaida with such beauty as that one might overthrow the world she returned to her easel thoughtfully aglaya merely glanced at the portrait frowned and put out her under lip then went and sat on the sofa with folded hands mrs epanchin rang the bell ask gavrila ardalionovitch to step this way said she to the man who answered mamma cried alexandra significantly i shall just say two words to him that's all said her mother silencing all objection by her manner she was evidently seriously put out you see prince it's all secrets with us just now all secrets it seems to be the etiquette of the house for some reason or other stupid nonsense and in a matter which ought to be approached with all candour and open-heartedness there is a marriage being talked of and i don't like this marriage mamma what are you saying said alexandra again hurriedly well what my dear girl as if you can possibly like it yourself the heart is the great thing and the rest is all rubbish though one must have sense as well perhaps sense is really the great thing don't smile like that aglaya i don't contradict myself a fool with a heart and no brains is just as unhappy as a fool with brains and no heart i am one and you are the other and therefore both of us suffer both of us are unhappy why are you so unhappy mother asked adelaida who alone of all the company seemed to have preserved her good temper and spirits up to now in the first place because of my carefully brought up daughters said mrs epanchin cuttingly and as that is the best reason i can give you we need not bother with any other at present enough of words now we shall see how both of you i don't count aglaya will manage your business and whether you most revered alexandra ivanovna will be happy with your fine mate ah 
she added as gania suddenly entered the room here's another marrying subject how do you do she continued in response to gania's bow but she did not invite him to sit down you are going to be married married how what marriage murmured gania overwhelmed with confusion are you about to take a wife i ask if you prefer that expression no no i i no said gania bringing out his lie with a tell-tale blush of shame he glanced keenly at aglaya who was sitting some way off and dropped his eyes immediately aglaya gazed coldly intently and composedly at him without taking her eyes off his face and watched his confusion no you say no do you continued the pitiless mrs general very well i shall remember that you told me this wednesday morning in answer to my question that you are not going to be married what day is it wednesday isn't it yes i think so said adelaida you never know the day of the week what's the day of the month twenty-seventh said gania twenty-seventh very well good-bye now you have a good deal to do i'm sure and i must dress and go out take your portrait give my respects to your unfortunate mother nina alexandrovna au revoir dear prince come in and see us often do and i shall tell old princess bielokonski about you i shall go and see her on purpose and listen my dear boy i feel sure that god has sent you to petersburg from switzerland on purpose for me maybe you will have other things to do besides but you are sent chiefly for my sake i feel sure of it god sent you to me au revoir alexandra come with me my dear mrs epanchin left the room gania confused annoyed furious took up his portrait and turned to the prince with a nasty smile on his face prince he said i am just going home if you have not changed your mind as to living with us perhaps you would like to come with me you don't know the address i believe wait a minute prince said aglaya suddenly rising from her seat do write something in my album first will you father says you are a most talented calligraphist i'll bring you my book in a minute she left the room well au revoir prince said adelaida i must be going too she pressed the prince's hand warmly and gave him a friendly smile as she left the room she did not so much as look at gania this is your doing prince said gania turning on the latter so soon as the others were all out of the room this is your doing sir you have been telling them that i am going to be married he said this in a hurried whisper his eyes flashing with rage and his face ablaze you shameless tattler i assure you you are under a delusion said the prince calmly and politely i did not even know that you were to be married you heard me talking about it the general and me you heard me say that everything was to be settled to-day at nastasia philipovna's and you went and blurted it out here you lie if you deny it who else could have told them devil take it sir who could have told them except yourself didn't the old woman as good as hint as much to me if she hinted to you who told her you must know best of course but i never said a word about it did you give my note is there an answer interrupted gania impatiently but at this moment aglaya came back and the prince had no time to reply there prince said she there's my album now choose a page and write me something will you there's a pen a new one do you mind a steel one i have heard that you calligraphists don't like steel pens conversing with the prince aglaya did not even seem to notice that gania was in the room but while the prince was getting his pen ready finding a page and making his preparations to write 
Gania came up to the fireplace where Aglaya was standing, to the right of the prince, and in trembling, broken accents said, almost in her ear, One, one word, just one word from you and I'm saved. The prince turned sharply round and looked at both of them. Gania's face was full of real despair. He seemed to have said the words almost unconsciously and on the impulse of the moment. Aglaya gazed at him for some seconds, with precisely the same composure and calm astonishment as she had shown a little while before, when the prince handed her the note, and it appeared that this calm surprise and seemingly absolute incomprehension of what was said to her were more terribly overwhelming to Gania than even the most plainly expressed disdain would have been. "'What shall I write?' asked the prince. "'I'll dictate to you,' said Aglaya, coming up to the table. "'Now then, are you ready? Write, I never condescend to bargain. Now put your name and the date. Let me see it.' The prince handed her the album. "'Capital! How beautifully you have written it! Thanks so much! Au revoir, prince! Wait a minute,' she added. I want to give you something for a keepsake. Come with me this way, will you?" The prince followed her. Arrived at the dining-room, she stopped. "'Read this,' she said, handing him Gania's note. The prince took it from her hand, but gazed at her in bewilderment. "'Oh, I know you haven't read it, and that you could never be that man's accomplice. Read it. I wish you to read it.' The letter had evidently been written in a hurry. My fate is to be decided to-day, it ran. You know how. This day I must give my word irrevocably. I have no right to ask your help, and I dare not allow myself to indulge in any hopes. But once you said just one word, and that word lighted up the night of my life, and became the beacon of my days say one more such word and save me from utter ruin only tell me break off the whole thing and i will do so this very day oh what can it cost you to say just this one word in doing so you will but be giving me a sign of your sympathy for me and of your pity only this only this nothing more nothing I dare not indulge in any hope, because I am unworthy of it. But if you say but this word, I will take up my cross again with joy, and return once more to my battle with poverty. I shall meet the storm and be glad of it. I shall rise up with renewed strength. Send me back, then, this one word of sympathy, only sympathy. I swear to you, and, oh, do not be angry with the audacity of despair, with the drowning man who has dared to make this last effort to save himself from perishing beneath the waters. G. L. This man assures me, said Aglaya scornfully, when the prince had finished reading the letter, that the words break off everything, do not commit me to anything whatever and himself gives me a written guarantee to that effect in this letter. Observe how ingenuously he underlines certain words, and how crudely he glosses over his hidden thoughts. He must know that if he broke off everything, first, by himself, and without telling me a word about it, or having the slightest hope on my account, that in that case I should perhaps be able to change my opinion of him, and even accept his friendship. He must know that, but his soul is such a wretched thing. He knows it, and cannot make up his mind. He knows it, and yet asks for guarantees. He cannot bring himself to trust. He wants me to give him hopes of myself, before he lets go of his hundred thousand roubles. As to the former word, which he declared lighted up the night of his life, he is simply an impudent liar. I merely pitied him once. But he is audacious and shameless, 
he immediately began to hope at that very moment i saw it he has tried to catch me ever since he is still fishing for me well enough of this take the letter and give it back to him as soon as you have left our house not before of course and what shall i tell him by way of answer nothing of course that's the best answer is it the case that you are going to live in his house yes your father kindly recommended me to him then look out for him i warn you he won't forgive you easily for taking back the letter aglaya pressed the prince's hand and left the room her face was serious and frowning she did not even smile as she nodded good-bye to him at the door i'll just get my parcel and we'll go said the prince to gania as he re-entered the drawing-room gania stamped his foot with impatience his face looked dark and gloomy with rage at last they left the house behind them the prince carrying his bundle the answer quick the answer said gania the instant they were outside what did she say did you give the letter the prince silently held out the note gania was struck motionless with amazement ha huh, what my letter he cried he never delivered it i might have guessed it oh curse him of course she did not understand what i meant naturally why 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 didn't you give her the note you excuse me i was about to deliver it almost immediately after receiving your commission and i gave it too just as you asked me to it has come into my hands now because aglaya ivanovna has just returned it to me how when as soon as i finished writing in her album for her and when she asked me to come out of the room with her you heard we went into the dining-room and she gave me your letter to read and then told me to return it to read cried gania almost at the top of his voice to read and you read it and again he stood like a log in the middle of the pavement so amazed that his mouth remained open after the last word had left it yes i have just read it and she gave it you to read herself herself yes herself and you may believe me when i tell you that i would not have read it for anything without her permission gania was silent for a minute or two as though thinking out some problem suddenly he cried it's impossible she cannot have given it you to read you are lying you read it yourself i am telling you the truth said the prince in his former composed tone of voice and believe me i am extremely sorry that the circumstance should have made such an unpleasant impression upon you but you wretched man at least she must have said something there must be some answer from her yes of course she did say something out with it then damn it out with it at once and gania stamped his foot twice on the pavement as soon as i had finished reading it she told me that you were fishing for her that you wished to compromise her so far as to receive some hopes from her trusting to which hopes you might break with the prospect of receiving a hundred thousand roubles she said that if you had done this without bargaining with her if you had broken with the money prospects without trying to force a guarantee out of her first she might have been your friend that's all i think oh no when i asked her what i was to say as i took the letter she replied that no answer is the best answer i think that was it forgive me if i do not use her exact expressions i tell you the sense as i understood it myself ungovernable rage and madness took entire possession of gania and his fury burst out without the least attempt at restraint oh that's it is it he yelled she throws my letters out of the window does she oh 
and she does not condescend to bargain while i do eh we shall see we shall see i shall pay her out for this he twisted himself about with rage and grew paler and paler he shook his fist so the pair walked along a few steps gania did not stand on ceremony with the prince he behaved just as though he were alone in his room he clearly counted the latter as a non-entity but suddenly he seemed to have an idea and recollected himself but how was it he asked how was it that you idiot that you are he added to himself were so very confidential a couple of hours after your first meeting with these people how was that hm? up to this moment jealousy had not been one of his torments now it suddenly gnawed at his heart that is a thing i cannot undertake to explain replied the prince gania looked at him with angry contempt oh i suppose the present she wished to make to you when she took you into the dining-room was her confidence hm? i suppose that was it i cannot explain it otherwise but why why devil take it what did you do in there why did they fancy you look here can't you remember exactly what you said to them from the very beginning can't you remember oh we talked of a great many things when first i went in we began to speak of switzerland oh the devil take switzerland then about executions executions yes at least about one then i told the whole three years story of my life and the history of a poor peasant girl oh damn the peasant girl go on go on said gania impatiently then how schneider told me about my childish nature and oh curse schneider and his dirty opinions go on then i began to talk about faces at least about the expressions of faces and said that aglaya ivanovna was nearly as lovely as nastasia filipovna it was then i blurted out about the portrait but you didn't repeat what you heard in the study you didn't repeat that hm no i tell you i did not then how did they look here did aglaya show my letter to the old lady oh there i can give you my fullest assurance that she did not i was there all the while she had no time to do it but perhaps you may not have observed it oh you damned idiot you he shouted quite beside himself with fury you can't even describe what went on gania having once descended to abuse and receiving no check very soon knew no bounds or limit to his license as is often the way in such cases his rage so blinded him that he had not even been able to detect that this idiot whom he was abusing to such an extent was very far from being slow of comprehension and had a way of taking in an impression and afterwards giving it out again which was very unidiotic indeed but something a little unforeseen now occurred i think i ought to tell you gavrila ardalionovitch said the prince suddenly that though i once was so ill that i really was little better than an idiot yet now i am almost recovered and that therefore it is not altogether pleasant to be called an idiot to my face of course your anger is excusable considering the treatment you have just experienced but i must remind you that you have twice abused me rather rudely i do not like this sort of thing and especially so at the first time of meeting a man and therefore as we happen to be at this moment standing at a cross-road don't you think we had better part you to the left homewards and i to the right here i have twenty-five roubles and i shall easily find a lodging gania was much confused and blushed for shame do forgive me prince he cried suddenly changing his abusive tone for one of great courtesy for heaven's sake forgive me you see what a miserable plight i am in but you hardly know anything of the facts of the case as yet 
if you did i am sure you would forgive me at least partially of course it was inexcusable of me i know but oh dear me i really do not require such profuse apologies replied the prince hastily i quite understand how unpleasant your position is and that is what made you abuse me so come along to your house after all i shall be delighted i am not going to let him go like this thought gania glancing angrily at the prince as they walked along the fellow has sucked everything out of me and now he takes off his mask there's something more than appears here we shall see it shall all be as clear as water by to-night everything but by this time they had reached gania's house end of part 1 chapter 7 recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey part 1 chapter 8 of the idiot this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by martin geeson the idiot by fyodor dostoevsky translated by eva m martin part 1 chapter 8 the flat occupied by gania and his family was on the third floor of the house it was reached by a clean light staircase and consisted of seven rooms a nice enough lodging and one would have thought it a little too good for a clerk on two thousand roubles a year but it was designed to accommodate a few lodgers on board terms and had been taken a few months since much to the disgust of gania at the urgent request of his mother and his sister varvara ardalionovna who longed to do something to increase the family income a little and fixed their hopes upon letting lodgings gania frowned upon the idea he thought it infra dig and did not quite like appearing in society afterwards that society in which he had been accustomed to pose up to now as a young man of rather brilliant prospects all these concessions and rebuffs of fortune of late had wounded his spirit severely and his temper had become extremely irritable his wrath being generally quite out of proportion to the cause but if he had made up his mind to put up with this sort of life for a while it was only on the plain understanding with his inner self that he would very soon change it all and have things as he chose again yet the very means by which he hoped to make this change threatened to involve him in even greater difficulties than he had had before the flat was divided by a passage which led straight out of the entrance hall along one side of this corridor lay the three rooms which were designed for the accommodation of the highly recommended lodgers besides these three rooms there was another small one at the end of the passage close to the kitchen which was allotted to general ivolgin the nominal master of the house who slept on a wide sofa and was obliged to pass into and out of his room through the kitchen and up or down the back stairs kolya gania's younger brother a schoolboy of thirteen shared this room with his father he too had to sleep on an old sofa a narrow uncomfortable thing with a torn rug over it his chief duty being to look after his father who needed to be watched more and more every day the prince was given the middle room of the three the first being occupied by one ferdishenko while the third was empty but gania first conducted the prince to the family apartments these consisted of a salon which became the dining-room when required a drawing-room which was only a drawing-room in the morning and became gania's study in the evening and his bedroom at night and lastly nina alexandrovna's and varvara's bedroom a small close chamber which they shared together in a word the whole place was confined and a tight fit for the party 
Gania used to grind his teeth with rage over the state of affairs, though he was anxious to be dutiful and polite to his mother. However, it was very soon apparent to anyone coming into the house that Gania was the tyrant of the family. Nina Alexandrovna and her daughter were both seated in the drawing-room, engaged in knitting, and talking to a visitor, Ivan Petrovitch Ptitsin. The lady of the house appeared to be a woman of about fifty years of age, thin-faced and with black lines under the eyes. She looked ill and rather sad, but her face was a pleasant one for all that, and from the first word that fell from her lips any stranger would at once conclude that she was of a serious and particularly sincere nature. In spite of her sorrowful expression, she gave the idea of possessing considerable firmness and decision. Her dress was modest and simple to a degree, dark and elderly in style, but both her face and appearance gave evidence that she had seen better days. Varvara was a girl of some twenty-three summers, of middle height, thin, but possessing a face which, without being actually beautiful, had the rare quality of charm, and might fascinate even to the extent of passionate regard. She was very like her mother, she even dressed like her, which proved that she had no taste for smart clothes. The expression of her grey eyes was merry and gentle, when it was not, as lately, too full of thought and anxiety. The same decision and firmness was to be observed in her face as in her mother's, but her strength seemed to be more vigorous than that of Nina Alexandrovna. She was subject to outbursts of temper, of which even her brother was a little afraid. The present visitor, Ptitsin, was also afraid of her. This was a young fellow of something under thirty, dressed plainly but neatly. His manners were good, but rather ponderously so. His dark beard bore evidence to the fact that he was not in any government employ. He could speak well, but preferred silence. On the whole he made a decidedly agreeable impression. He was clearly attracted by Varvara, and made no secret of his feelings. She trusted him in a friendly way but had not shown him any decided encouragement as yet, which fact did not quell his ardour in the least. Nina Alexandrovna was very fond of him, and had grown quite confidential with him of late. Ptitsin, as was well known, was engaged in the business of lending out money on good security, and at a good rate of interest. He was a great friend of Gania's. After a formal introduction by Gania, who greeted his mother very shortly, took no notice of his sister, and immediately marched Ptitsin out of the room, Nina Alexandrovna addressed a few kind words to the prince, and forthwith requested Kolya, who had just appeared at the door, to show him to the middle room. Kolya was a nice-looking boy. His expression was simple and confiding and his manners were very polite and engaging. "'Where's your luggage?' he asked, as he led the prince away to his room. "'I had a bundle. It's in the entrance hall.' "'I'll bring it to you directly. We only have a cook and one maid, so I have to help as much as I can. Varia looks after things generally, and loses her temper over it. Gania says that you have only just arrived from Switzerland.' "'Yes.' Is it jolly there? Very. Mountains? Yes. I'll go and get your bundle. Here Varvara joined them. The maid shall bring your bed linen directly. Have you a portmanteau? No, a bundle. Your brother has just gone to the hall for it. There's nothing there except this, said Kolya, returning at this moment. Where did you put it? Oh, but that's all I have, said the prince, taking it. Ah, I thought perhaps Ferdishenko had taken it. Don't talk nonsense, said Varya severely. She seemed put out, and was only just polite with the prince. 
oh laughed the boy you can be nicer than that to me you know i'm not ptitsin you ought to be whipped colia you silly boy if you want anything to the prince please apply to the servant we dine at half past four you can take your dinner with us or have it in your room just as you please come along colia don't disturb the prince at the door they met gania coming in is father in he asked colia whispered something in his ear and went out just a couple of words prince if you'll excuse me don't blab over there about what you may see here or in this house as to all that about aglaya and me you know things are not altogether pleasant in this establishment devil take it all you'll see at all events keep your tongue to yourself for to-day i assure you i blabbed a great deal less than you seem to suppose said the prince with some annoyance clearly the relations between gania and himself were by no means improving oh well i caught it quite hot enough to-day thanks to you however i forgive you i think you might fairly remember that i was not in any way bound i had no reason to be silent about that portrait you never asked me not to mention it Pooh! what a wretched room this is dark and the window looking out into the yard your coming to our house is in no respect opportune however it's not my affair i don't keep the lodgings ptitsin here looked in and beckoned to gania who hastily left the room in spite of the fact that he had evidently wished to say something more and had only made the remark about the room to gain time the prince had hardly had time to wash and tidy himself a little when the door opened once more and another figure appeared this was a gentleman of about thirty tall broad-shouldered and red-haired his face was red too and he possessed a pair of thick lips a wide nose small eyes rather bloodshot and with an ironical expression in them as though he were perpetually winking at someone his whole appearance gave one the idea of impudence his dress was shabby he opened the door just enough to let his head in his head remained so placed for a few seconds while he quietly scrutinized the room the door then opened enough to admit his body but still he did not enter he stood on the threshold and examined the prince carefully at last he gave the door a final shove entered approached the prince took his hand and seated himself and the owner of the room on two chairs side by side Ferdishenko, he said, gazing intently and inquiringly into the prince's eyes. "'Very well. What next?' said the latter, almost laughing in his face. "'A lodger here,' continued the other, staring as before. "'Do you wish to make acquaintance?' asked the prince. "'Ah!' said the visitor, passing his fingers through his hair and sighing. He then looked over to the other side of the room and around it got any money he asked suddenly not much how much twenty-five roubles let's see it the prince took his banknote out and showed it to ferdishenko the latter unfolded it and looked at it then he turned it round and examined the other side then he held it up to the light how strange that it should have browned so he said reflectively these twenty-five rouble notes brown in a most extraordinary way while other notes often grow paler take it the prince took his note ferdishenko rose i came here to warn you he said in the first place don't lend me any money for i shall certainly ask you to very well shall you pay here yes i intend to oh i don't intend to thanks i live here next door to you you noticed a room did you don't come to me very often i shall see you here quite often enough have you seen the general no nor heard him no of course not 
Well, you'll both hear and see him soon. He even tries to bo borrow money from me. A vie au lecteur. Goodbye. Do you think a man can possibly live with a name like Ferdishenko? Why not? Goodbye. And so he departed. The prince found out afterwards that this gentleman made it his business to amaze people with his originality and wit, but that it did not as a rule come off. He even produced a bad impression on some people, which grieved him sorely, but he did not change his ways for all that. As he went out of the prince's room, he collided with yet another visitor coming in. Ferdishenko took the opportunity of making several warning gestures to the prince from behind the new arrival's back, and left the room in conscious pride. This next arrival was a tall, red-faced man of about fifty-five, with greyish hair and whiskers, and large eyes which stood out of their sockets. His appearance would have been distinguished had it not been that he gave the idea of being rather dirty. He was dressed in an old coat, and he smelled of vodka when he came near. His walk was effective, and he clearly did his best to appear dignified, and to impress people by his manner. This gentleman now approached the prince slowly, and with a most courteous smile, silently took his hand and held it in his own, as he examined the prince's features, as though searching for familiar traits therein. "'Tis he, tis he,' he said at last, quietly, but with much solemnity, "'as though he were alive once more. I heard the familiar name, the dear familiar name, and, oh, how it reminded me of the irrevocable past. Prince Muishkin, I believe. Exactly so. General Ivolgin, retired and unfortunate. May I ask your Christian and generic names? Lyof Nikolaevich. So, so. The son of my old, I may say, my childhood's friend, Nikolai Petrovitch. My father's name was Nikolai Lvovitch. Lvovitch, repeated the general without the slightest haste, and with perfect confidence, just as though he had not committed himself the least in the world, but merely made a little slip of the tongue. He sat down, and taking the prince's hand, drew him to a seat next to himself. "'I carried you in my arms as a baby,' he observed. "'Really?' asked the prince. "'Why, it's twenty years since my father died.' "'Yes, yes, twenty years and three months. We were educated together. I went straight into the army, and he—' "'My father went straight into the army, too. He was a sub-lieutenant in the Vasilievsky regiment.' No, sir, in the Bielomirsky. He changed into the latter shortly before his death. I was at his bedside when he died, and gave him my blessing for eternity. Your mother, the general paused as though overcome with emotion. She died a few months later from a cold, said the prince. Oh, not cold. Believe an old man not from a cold but from grief for her prince. Oh, your mother, your mother, hey ho Youth, youth! Your father and I, old friends as we were, nearly murdered each other for her sake. The prince began to be a little incredulous. I was passionately in love with her when she was engaged, engaged to my friend. The prince noticed the fact and was furious. He came and woke me at seven o'clock one morning. I rise and dress in amazement. Silence on both sides. I understand it all. He takes a couple of pistols out of his pocket, across a handkerchief, without witnesses. Why invite witnesses when both of us would be walking in eternity, in a couple of minutes? The pistols are loaded. We stretch the handkerchief and stand opposite one another. We aim the pistols at each other's hearts. 
suddenly tears start to our eyes our hands shake we weep we embrace the battle is one of self-sacrifice now the prince shouts she is yours i cry she is yours in a word in a word you've come to live with us hey yes yes for a while i think stammered the prince prince mother begs you to come to her said kolya appearing at the door the prince rose to go but the general once more laid his hand in a friendly manner on his shoulder and dragged him down onto the sofa as the true friend of your father i wish to say a few words to you he began i have suffered there was a catastrophe i suffered without a trial i had no trial nina alexandrovna my wife is an excellent woman so is my daughter varvara we have to let lodgings because we are poor a dreadful unheard-of come-down for us for me who should have been a governor-general but we are very glad to have you at all events meanwhile there is a tragedy in the house the prince looked inquiringly at the other yes a marriage is being arranged a marriage between a questionable woman and a young fellow who might be a flunkey they wish to bring this woman into the house where my wife and daughter reside but while i live and breathe she shall never enter my doors i shall lie at the threshold and she shall trample me under foot if she does i hardly talk to gania now and avoid him as much as i can i warn you of this beforehand but you cannot fail to observe it but you are the son of my old friend and i hope prince be so kind as to come to me for a moment in the drawing-room said nina alexandrovna herself appearing at the door imagine my dear cried the general it turns out that i have nursed the prince on my knee in the old days his wife looked searchingly at him and glanced at the prince but said nothing the prince rose and followed her but hardly had they reached the drawing-room and nina alexandrovna had begun to talk hurriedly when in came the general she immediately relapsed into silence the master of the house may have observed this but at all events he did not take any notice of it he was in high good humour a son of my old friend dear he cried surely you must remember prince nikolai lvovitch you saw him at, at tver i don't remember any nikolai lvovitch was that your father she inquired of the prince yes but he died at lizavietgrad not at tver said the prince rather timidly so pavlicheff told me no tver insisted the general he removed just before his death you are very small and cannot remember and pavlicheff though an excellent fellow may have made a mistake you knew pavlicheff then oh yes a wonderful fellow but i was present myself i gave him my blessing my father was just about to be tried when he died said the prince although i never knew of what he was accused he died in hospital oh it was the kalpakov business and of course he would have been acquitted y yes do you know that for a fact asked the prince whose curiosity was aroused by the general's words i should think so indeed cried the latter the court-martial came to no decision it was a mysterious and impossible business one might say captain larionov commander of the company had died his command was handed over to the prince for the moment very well this soldier kalpakov stole some leather from one of his comrades intending to sell it and spend the money on drink well the prince you understand that what follows took place in the presence of the sergeant-major and a corporal the prince rated kalpakov soundly and threatened to have him flogged well 
Kalpakov went back to the barracks, lay down on a camp bedstead, and in a quarter of an hour was dead. You quite understand. It was, as I said, a strange, almost impossible affair. In due course, Kolpakov was buried. The prince wrote his report. The deceased's name was removed from the roll. All as it should be, is it not? But exactly three months later, at the inspection of the brigade, the man Kolpakov was found in the third company of the second battalion of infantry, Novozemlyansky division, just as if nothing had happened. What? said the prince, much astonished. It did not occur. It's a mistake, said Nina Alexandrovna quickly, looking at the prince rather anxiously. Mon mari se trompe, she added, speaking in French. My dear, se trompe is easily said. Do you remember any case at all like it? Everybody was at their wits' end. I should be the first to say qu'on se trompe. But, unfortunately, I was an eye-witness, and was also on the commission of inquiry. Everything proved that it was really he, the very same soldier, Kalpakov, who had been given the usual military funeral to the sound of the drum. It is, of course, a most curious case, nearly an impossible one. I recognise that. But, father, your dinner is ready said Varvara at this point, putting her head in at the door. "'Very glad. I'm particularly hungry. Yes, yes, a strange coincidence. Almost a psychological. Your soup'll be cold. Do come.' "'Coming, coming,' said the general. "'Son of my old friend,' he was heard muttering as he went down the passage. "'You will have to excuse very much in my husband, if you stay with us,' said Nina Alexandrovna. "'But he will not disturb you often. "'He dines alone. "'Everyone has his little peculiarities, you know, "'and some people perhaps have more than those who are most pointed at and laughed at. "'One thing I must beg of you. "'If my husband applies to you for payment for board and lodging, Tell him that you have already paid me. Of course, anything paid by you to the general would be as fully settled as if paid to me, so far as you are concerned. But I wish it to be so, if you please, for convenience sake. What is it, Varya? Varya had quietly entered the room, and was holding out the portrait of Nastasia Filipovna to her mother. Nina Alexandrovna started and examined the photograph intently, gazing at it long and sadly. At last she looked up inquiringly at Varya. "'It's a present from herself to him,' said Varya. "'The question is to be finally decided this evening.' "'This evening,' repeated her mother in a tone of despair, but softly, as though to herself. "'Then it's all settled, of course.' and there's no hope left to us. She has anticipated her answer by the present of her portrait. Did he show it you himself? she added in some surprise. You know we have hardly spoken to each other for a whole month. Ptitsin told me all about it, and the photo was lying under the table, and I picked it up. Prince, asked Nina Alexandrovna, I wanted to inquire whether you have known my son long. I think he said you had only arrived today from somewhere. The prince gave a short narrative of what we have heard before, leaving out the greater part. The two ladies listened intently. I did not ask about Garnia out of curiosity, said the elder at last. I wish to know how much you know about him, because he said just now that we need not stand on ceremony with you. What exactly does that mean? At this moment Gania and Ptitsin entered the room together, and Nina Alexandrovna immediately became silent again. The prince remained seated next to her, but Varya moved to the other end of the room. The portrait of Nastasia Filipovna remained lying as before on the work-table. 
Gania observed it there, and with a frown of annoyance snatched it up and threw it across to his writing-table, which stood at the other end of the room. "'Is it to-day, Gania?' asked Nina Alexandrovna at last. "'Is what to-day?' cried the former. Then suddenly recollecting himself, he turned sharply on the prince. "'Oh!' he growled. "'I see you are here. That explains it. Is it a disease, or what, that you can't hold your tongue? Look here, understand once for all, prince. I am to blame in this, Gania, no one else," said Ptitsin. Gania glanced inquiringly at the speaker. It's better so, you know, Gania, especially as, from one point of view, the matter may be considered as settled," said Ptitsin and sitting down a little way from the table, he began to study a paper covered with pencil writing. Gania stood and frowned. He expected a family scene. He never thought of apologising to the prince, however. "'If it's all settled, Gania, then of course Mr. Ptitsin is right,' said Nina Alexandrovna. "'Don't frown. You need not worry yourself, Gania. I shall ask you no questions. You need not tell me anything you don't like. I assure you I have quite submitted to your will." She said all this, knitting away the while, as though perfectly calm and composed. Gania was surprised, but cautiously kept silence, and looked at his mother, hoping that she would express herself more clearly. Nina Alexandrovna observed his cautiousness, and added, with a bitter smile, you are still suspicious, I see, and do not believe me. But you may be quite at your ease. There shall be no more tears nor questions. Not from my side, at all events. All I wish is that you may be happy, you know that. I have submitted to my fate. But my heart will always be with you, whether we remain united or whether we part. Of course I only answer for myself. You can hardly expect your sister. My sister again, cried Gania, looking at her with contempt and almost hate. Look here, mother, I have already given you my word that I shall always respect you fully and absolutely, and so shall everyone else in this house, be it who it may who shall cross this threshold. Gania was so much relieved that he gazed at his mother almost affectionately. I was not at all afraid for myself, Gania, as you know well. It was not for my own sake that I have been so anxious and worried all this time. They say it is all to be settled to-day. What is to be settled?" She has promised to tell me to-night at her own house whether she consents or not, replied Gania. We have been silent on this subject for three weeks, said his mother and it was better so. And now I will only ask you one question. How can she give her consent, and make you a present of her portrait, when you do not love her? How can such a—such a—practised hand, eh? I was not going to express myself so. But how could you so blind her? Nina Alexandrovna's question betrayed intense annoyance. Gania waited a moment, and then said, without taking the trouble to conceal the irony of his tone, "'There you are, mother. You are always like that. You begin by promising that there are to be no reproaches, or insinuations, or questions. And here you are beginning them at once. We had better drop the subject. We had, really. I shall never leave you, mother. Any other man would cut and run from such a sister as this. See how she is looking at me at this moment. Besides, how do you know that I am blinding Nastasia Filipovna? As for Varya, I don't care. She can do just as she pleases. There, that's quite enough." Gania's irritation increased with every word he uttered, as he walked up and down the room. These conversations always touched the family sores before long. I have said already that the moment she comes in, I go out, and I shall keep my word. 
remarked Varya. "'Out of obstinacy!' shouted Gania. "'You haven't married either, thanks to your obstinacy. Oh, you needn't frown at me, Varvara. You can go at once, for all I care. I am sick enough of your company. What, you are going to leave us, are you, too?' he cried, turning to the prince, who was rising from his chair. Gania's voice was full of the most uncontrolled and uncontrollable irritation. The prince turned at the door to say something, but perceiving in Gania's expression that there was but that one drop wanting to make the cup overflow, he changed his mind and left the room without a word. A few minutes later he was aware from the noisy voices in the drawing-room that the conversation had become more quarrelsome than ever after his departure. He crossed the salon and the entrance hall so as to pass down the corridor into his own room. As he came near the front door he heard someone outside vainly endeavouring to ring the bell, which was evidently broken, and only shook a little without emitting any sound. The prince took down the chain and opened the door. He started back in amazement, for there stood Nastasia Filipovna. He knew her at once from her photograph. Her eyes blazed with anger as she looked at him. She quickly pushed by him into the hall, shouldering him out of her way, and said furiously as she threw off her fur cloak, if you are too lazy to mend your bell, you should at least wait in the hall, to let people in when they rattle the bell-handle. There now, you've dropped my fur cloak, dummy!" Sure enough the cloak was lying on the ground. Nastasia had thrown it off towards the prince, expecting him to catch it, but the prince had missed it. "'Now then, announce me, quick!' The prince wanted to say something but was so confused and astonished that he could not. However, he moved off towards the drawing-room with the cloak over his arm. "'Now then, where are you taking my cloak to? Oh, 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 are you mad?' The prince turned and came back, more confused than ever. When she burst out laughing, he smiled, but his tongue could not form a word as yet. At first, when he had opened the door and saw her standing before him, he had become as pale as death, but now the red blood had rushed back to his cheeks in a torrent. "'Why, what an idiot it is!' cried Nastasia, stamping her foot with irritation. "'Go on, do! Whom are you going to announce?' "'Nastasia Filipovna,' murmured the prince. "'And how do you know that?' she asked him sharply. "'I have never seen you before. "'Go on, announce me. "'What's that noise?' "'They are quarrelling,' said the prince, and entered the drawing-room, just as matters in there had almost reached a crisis. Nina Alexandrovna had forgotten that she had submitted to everything. She was defending Varya. Ptitsin was taking her part, too. Not that Varya was afraid of standing up for herself, she was by no means that sort of a girl, but her brother was becoming ruder and more intolerable every moment. Her usual practice in such cases as the present was to say nothing, but stare at him without taking her eyes off his face for an instant. This manoeuvre, as she well knew, could drive Gania distracted. Just at this moment the door opened, and the prince entered, announcing, Nastasia Filipovna. End of Part 1, Chapter 8 Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey Part 1, Chapter 9 of The Idiot This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen The Idiot by Fyodor Dostoevsky Translated by Eva M. Martin Part 1, Chapter 9 Silence immediately fell on the room. All looked at the prince as though they neither understood nor hoped to understand. 
Gania was motionless with horror. Nastasia's arrival was a most unexpected and overwhelming event to all parties. In the first place she had never been before. Up to now she had been so haughty that she had never even asked Gania to introduce her to his parents. Of late she had not so much as mentioned them. Gania was partly glad of this, but still he had put it to her debit in the account to be settled after marriage. He would have borne anything from her rather than this visit, but one thing seemed to him quite clear. Her visit now and the present of her portrait on this particular day, pointed out plainly enough which way she intended to make her decision. The incredulous amazement with which all regarded the prince did not last long, for Nastasia herself appeared at the door, and passed in, pushing by the prince again. "'At last I've stormed the citadel! Why do you tie up your bell?' she said merrily, as she pressed Gania's hand, the latter having rushed up to her as soon as she made her appearance. "'What are you looking so upset about? Introduce me, please!' The bewildered Gania introduced her first to Varya, and both women, before shaking hands, exchanged looks of strange import. Nastasia, however, smiled amiably, but Varya did not try to look amiable, and kept her gloomy expression. She did not even vouchsafe the usual courteous smile of etiquette. Gania darted a terrible glance of wrath at her for this. But Nina Alexandrovna mended matters a little when Gania introduced her at last. Hardly, however, had the old lady begun about her highly gratified feelings, and so on, when Nastasia left her, and flounced into a chair by Gania's side in the corner by the window, and cried, "'Where's your study? And where are the, the lodgers? You do take in lodgers, don't you?' Gania looked dreadfully put out, and tried to say something in reply, but Nastasia interrupted him. "'Why, where are you going to squeeze lodgers in here? Don't you use a study? Does this sort of thing pay?' she added, turning to Nina Alexandrovna. "'Well, it is troublesome, rather,' said the latter. "'But I suppose it will pay pretty well. We have only just begun, however.' Again Nastasia Filipovna did not hear the sentence out. She glanced at Gania, and cried, laughing, "'Ah! What a face! My goodness, what a face you have on at this moment!' Indeed, Gania did not look in the least like himself. His bewilderment and his alarmed perplexity passed off, however, and his lips now twitched with rage as he continued to stare evilly at his laughing guest, while his countenance became absolutely livid. There was another witness who, though standing at the door motionless and bewildered himself, still managed to remark Gania's death-like pallor, and the dreadful change that had come over his face. This witness was the prince, who now advanced in alarm and muttered to Gania, "'Drink some water, and don't look like that.' It was clear that he came out with these words quite spontaneously, on the spur of the moment, but his speech was productive of much, for it appeared that all Gania's rage now overflowed upon the prince. He seized him by the shoulder, and gazed with an intensity of loathing and revenge at him, but said nothing, as though his feelings were too strong to permit of words. General agitation prevailed. Nina Alexandrovna gave a little cry of anxiety. Ptitsin took a step forward in alarm. Kolya and Ferdishenko stood stock still at the door in amazement. Only Varya remained coolly watching the scene from under her eyelashes. She did not sit down, but stood by her mother with folded hands. However, Gania recollected himself almost immediately. He let go of the prince, and burst out laughing. "'Why, are you a doctor, prince, or what?' 
he asked as naturally as possible. I declare you quite frightened me. Nastasia Filipovna, let me introduce this interesting character to you, though I have only known him myself since the morning. Nastasia gazed at the prince in bewilderment. Prince? He a prince? Why, I took him for footman just now, and sent him in to announce me. Ha 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 ha! Isn't that good? Not bad, that, not bad at all, put in Ferdishenko. Se non è vero! I rather think I pitched into you too, didn't I? Forgive me, do. Who is he, did you say? What prince? Mwishkin, she added, addressing Gania. He is a lodger of ours, explained the latter. An idiot. The prince distinctly heard the word half whispered from behind him. This was Ferdishenko's voluntary information for Nastasia's benefit. Tell me, why didn't you put me right when I made such a dreadful mistake just now? Continued the latter, examining the prince from head to foot without the slightest ceremony. She awaited the answer as though convinced that it would be so foolish that she must inevitably fail to restrain her laughter over it. "'I was astonished, seeing you so suddenly,' murmured the prince. "'How did you know who I was? Where had you seen me before? And why were you so struck dumb at the sight of me? What was there so overwhelming about me?' Oh, ho 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 cried ferdishenko now then prince my word what things i would say if i had such a chance as that my goodness prince go on so should i in your place i've no doubt laughed the prince to ferdishenko then continued addressing nastasia your portrait struck me very forcibly this morning then i was talking about you to the yepanchins and then in the train before i reached petersburg parfion rogozhin told me a good deal about you and at the very moment that i opened the door to you i happened to be thinking of you when there you stood before me and how did you recognize me from the portrait what else i seemed to imagine you exactly as you are I seemed to have seen you somewhere. Where? Where? I seem to have seen your eyes somewhere. But it cannot be. I have not seen you. I never was here before. I may have dreamed of you. I don't know. The prince said all this with manifest effort, in broken sentences, and with many drawings of breath. He was evidently much agitated. Nastasia Filipovna looked at him inquisitively, but did not laugh. "'Bravo, prince!' cried Ferdishenko, delighted. At this moment a loud voice from behind the group which hedged in the prince and Nastasia Filipovna divided the crowd, as it were, and before them stood the head of the family, General Ivolgin. He was dressed in evening clothes, his moustache was dyed. This apparition was too much for Gania. Vain and ambitious almost to morbidness, he had had much to put up with in the last two months, and was seeking feverishly for some means of enabling himself to lead a more presentable kind of existence. At home he now adopted an attitude of absolute cynicism, but he could not keep this up before Nastasia Filipovna although he had sworn to make her pay after marriage for all he suffered now. He was experiencing a last humiliation, the bitterest of all at this moment, the humiliation of blushing for his own kindred in his own house. A question flashed through his mind as to whether the game was really worth the candle for that had happened at this moment which for two months had been his nightmare, which had filled his soul with dread and shame, the meeting between his father and Nastasia Filipovna. He had often tried to imagine such an event, but had found the picture too mortifying and exasperating, and had quietly dropped it. 
very likely he anticipated far worse things than was at all necessary it is often so with vain persons he had long since determined therefore to get his father out of the way anywhere before his marriage in order to avoid such a meeting but when nastasia entered the room just now he had been so overwhelmed with astonishment that he had not thought of his father and had made no arrangements to keep him out of the way and now it was too late there he was and got up too in a dress coat and white tie and nastasia in the very humour to heap ridicule on him and his family circle of this last fact he felt quite persuaded what else had she come for there were his mother and his sister sitting before her and she seemed to have forgotten their very existence already and if she behaved like that he thought she must have some object in view ferdishenko led the general up to nastasia philipovna ardalion alexandrovitch ivolgin said the smiling general with a low bow of great dignity an old soldier unfortunate and the father of this family but happy in the hope of including in that family so exquisite he did not finish his sentence for at this moment ferdishenko pushed a chair up from behind and the general not very firm on his legs at this post-prandial hour flopped into it backwards it was always a difficult thing to put this warrior to confusion and his sudden descent left him as composed as before he had sat down just opposite to nastasia whose fingers he now took and raised to his lips with great elegance and much courtesy the general had once belonged to a very select circle of society but he had been turned out of it two or three years since on account of certain weaknesses in which he now indulged with all the less restraint but his good manners remained with him to this day in spite of all nastasia philipovna seemed delighted at the appearance of this latest arrival of whom she had of course heard a good deal by report i have heard that my son began ardalion alexandrovitch your son indeed a nice papa you are you might have come to see me anyhow without compromising any one do you hide yourself or does your son hide you the children of the nineteenth century and their parents began the general again nastasia philipovna will you excuse the general for a moment someone is inquiring for him said nina alexandrovna in a loud voice interrupting the conversation excuse him oh no i have wished to see him too long for that why what business can he have he has retired hasn't he you won't leave me general will you i give you my word that he shall come and see you but he he needs rest just now general they say you require rest said nastasia philipovna with the melancholy face of a child whose toy is taken away ardalion alexandrovitch immediately did his best to make his foolish position a great deal worse my dear my dear he said solemnly and reproachfully looking at his wife with one hand on his heart won't you leave the room mamma asked varia aloud no varia i shall sit it out to the end nastasia must have heard both question and reply but her vivacity was not in the least damped on the contrary it seemed to increase she immediately overwhelmed the general once more with questions and within five minutes that gentleman was as happy as a king and holding forth at the top of his voice amid the laughter of almost all who heard him kolya jogged the prince's arm can't you get him out of the room somehow do please and tears of annoyance stood in the boy's eyes curse that gania he muttered between his teeth oh yes i knew general yepanchin well general ivolgin was saying at this moment 
he and prince nikolai ivanovich muishkin whose son i have this day embraced after an absence of twenty years and i were three inseparables alas one is in the grave torn to pieces by calumnies and bullets another is now before you still battling with calumnies and bullets bullets cried nastasia yes here in my chest i received them at the siege of kars and i feel them in bad weather now and as to the third of our trio yepanchin of course after that little affair with the poodle in the railway carriage it was all up between us poodle what was that and in a railway carriage dear me said nastasia thoughtfully as though trying to recall something to mind oh just a silly little occurrence not really worth telling about princess bielokonski's governess miss smith and oh it is really not worth telling no no we must have it cried nastasia merrily yes of course cried ferdishenko c'est du nouveau ardalion said nina alexandrovitch entreatingly papa you are wanted cried kolya well it is a silly little story in a few words began the delighted general a couple of years ago soon after the new railway was opened i had to go somewhere or other on business well i took a first-class ticket sat down and began to smoke or rather continued to smoke for i had lighted up before i was alone in the carriage smoking is not allowed but is not prohibited either it is half allowed so to speak winked at i had the window open suddenly just before the whistle in came two ladies with a little poodle and sat down opposite to me not bad-looking women one was in light blue the other in black silk the poodle a beauty with a silver collar lay on light blue's knee they looked haughtily about and talked english together i took no notice just went on smoking i observed that the ladies were getting angry over my cigar doubtless one looked at me through her tortoiseshell eyeglass i took no notice because they never said a word if they didn't like the cigar why couldn't they say so not a word not a hint suddenly and without the very slightest suspicion of warning light blue seizes my cigar from between my fingers and whew, out of the window with it well on flew the train and i sat bewildered and the young woman tall and fair and rather red in the face too red glared at me with flashing eyes i didn't say a word but with extreme courtesy i may say with the most refined courtesy i reached my finger and thumb over towards the poodle took it up delicately by the nape of the neck and chucked it out of the window after the cigar the train went flying on and the poodle's yells were lost in the distance oh you naughty man cried nastasia laughing and clapping her hands like a child bravo said ferdishenko ptitsin laughed too though he had been very sorry to see the general appear even kolya laughed and said bravo and i was right truly right cried the general with warmth and solemnity for if cigars are forbidden in railway carriages poodles are much more so well and what did the lady do asked nastasia impatiently she oh, that's where all the mischief of it lies replied ivolgin frowning without a word as it were of warning she slapped me on the cheek an extraordinary woman and you the general dropped his eyes and elevated his brows shrugged his shoulders tightened his lips spread his hands and remained silent at last he blurted out i lost my head did you hit her no oh no 
There was a great flare-up, but I didn't hit her. I had to struggle a little, purely to defend myself, but the very devil was in the business. It turned out that Light Blue was an Englishwoman, governess or something, at Princess Bielokonski's, and the other woman was one of the old maid princesses Bielokonski. Well, everybody knows what great friends the princess and Mrs. Yepanchin are, so there was a pretty kettle of fish. All the Bielokonskis went into mourning for the poodle. Six princesses in tears, and the Englishwoman shrieking. Of course I wrote an apology and called, but they would not receive either me or my apology, and the Yepanchins cut me too. But wait, said Nastasia, how is it that five or six days since I read exactly the same story in the paper as happening between a Frenchman and an English girl? The cigar was snatched away exactly as you describe, and the poodle was chucked out of the window after it. The slapping came off too, as in your case, and the girl's dress was light blue." The general blushed dreadfully. Kolya blushed too, and Ptitsin turned hastily away. Ferdishenko was the only one who laughed as gaily as before. As to Gania, I need not say that he was miserable. He stood dumb and wretched, and took no notice of anybody. "'I assure you,' said the general, "'that exactly the same thing happened to myself. I remembered there was some quarrel between father and Miss Smith, the Bielokonski's governess,' said Kolya. "'How very curious! Point for point the same anecdote, and happening at different ends of Europe! Even the light blue dress the same!' continued the pitiless Nastasia. "'I must really send you the paper.' "'You must observe,' insisted the general, "'that my experience was two years earlier.' "'Ah, that's it, no doubt!' Nastasia Filipovna laughed hysterically. "'Father, will you hear a word from me outside?' said Gania, his voice shaking with agitation, as he seized his father by the shoulder. His eyes shone with a blaze of hatred. At this moment there was a terrific bang at the front door, almost enough to break it down. Some most unusual visitor must have arrived. Collier ran to open. End of Part 1 Chapter 9 Recording by Martin Geeson in Hazelmere, Surrey Part 1 Chapter 10 of The Idiot This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Geeson The Idiot by Fyodor Dostoevsky Translated by Eva M. Martin Part 1 Chapter 10 the entrance hall suddenly became full of noise and people. To judge from the sounds which penetrated to the drawing-room, a number of people had already come in, and the stampede continued. Several voices were talking and shouting at once, others were talking and shouting on the stairs outside. It was evidently a most extraordinary visit that was about to take place. Everyone exchanged startled glances. Gania rushed out towards the dining-room, but a number of men had already made their way in, and met him. "'Ah, oh, here he is, the Judas!' cried a voice which the prince recognised at once. "'How do you do, Gania, you old blackguard?' "'Yes, that's the man,' said another voice. There was no room for doubt in the prince's mind. One of the voices was Rogozhin's, and the other Lebedev's. Gania stood at the door like a block and looked on in silence, putting no obstacle in the way of their entrance, and ten or a dozen men marched in behind Parfion Rogozhin. They were a decidedly mixed-looking collection, and some of them came in in their furs and caps. 
None of them were quite drunk, but all appeared to be considerably excited. They seemed to need each other's support, morally, before they dared come in. Not one of them would have entered alone, but with the rest each one was brave enough. Even Rogozhin entered rather cautiously at the head of his troop, but he was evidently preoccupied. He appeared to be gloomy and morose, and had clearly come with some end in view. All the rest were merely chorus, brought in to support the chief character. Besides Lebedev, there was the dandy Zalezhev, who came in with his coat and hat. Two or three others followed his example. The rest were more uncouth. They included a couple of young merchants, a man in a greatcoat, a medical student, a little pole, a small fat man who laughed continuously, and an enormously tall stout one who apparently put great faith in the strength of his fists. A couple of ladies of some sort put their heads in at the front door, but did not dare come any farther. Kolya promptly banged the door in their faces and locked it. "'Hello, Gania, you blackguard! You didn't expect Rogozhin, hey?' said the latter, entering the drawing-room and stopping before Gania. But at this moment he saw seated before him Nastasia Filipovna. He had not dreamed of meeting her here, evidently, for her appearance produced a marvellous effect upon him. He grew pale, and his lips became actually blue. "'I suppose it is true, then,' he muttered to himself, and his face took on an expression of despair. "'So that's the end of it. Now you, sir, will you answer me or not?' he went on suddenly, gazing at Garnier with ineffable malice. "'Now then, you!' He panted, and could hardly speak for agitation. He advanced into the room mechanically, but perceiving Nina Alexandrovna and Varya, he became more or less embarrassed in spite of his excitement. His followers entered after him, and all paused a moment at sight of the ladies. Of course their modesty was not fated to be long-lived, but for a moment they were abashed. Once let them begin to shout, however, and nothing on earth should disconcert them. "'What, you here too, Prince?' said Rogozhin absently, but a little surprised all the same. "'Still in your gaiters, eh?' He sighed, and forgot the Prince the next moment, and his wild eyes wandered over to Nastasia again, as though attracted in that direction by some magnetic force. Nastasia looked at the new arrivals with great curiosity. Gania recollected himself at last. "'Excuse me, sirs,' he said loudly, "'but what does all this mean?' He glared at the advancing crowd generally, but addressed his remarks especially to their captain, Rogozhin. "'You are not in a stable, gentlemen, though you may think it. My mother and sister are present.' "'Yes, I see your mother and sister,' muttered Rogozhin through his teeth, and Lebedev seemed to feel himself called upon to second the statement. "'At all events I must request you to step into the salon,' said Gania, his rage rising quite out of proportion to his words, "'and then I shall inquire. "'What, he doesn't know me,' said Rogozhin, showing his teeth disagreeably. He doesn't recognize Rogozhin. He did not move an inch, however. I have met you somewhere, I believe, but... Met me somewhere? Pooh! Why, it's only three months since I lost two hundred roubles of my father's money to you at cards. The old fellow died before he found out. Ptitsin knows all about it. Why, I've only to pull out a three-rouble note and show it to you, and you'd crawl on your hands and knees to the other end of the town for it. That's the sort of man you are. Why, I've come now at this moment to buy you up. Oh, you needn't think that because I wear these boots I have no money. I have lots of money, my beauty. 
enough to buy up you and all yours together so i shall if i like to i'll buy you up i will he yelled apparently growing more and more intoxicated and excited oh nastasia philipovna don't turn me out say one word do are you going to marry this man or not rogozhin asked his question like a lost soul appealing to some divinity with the reckless daring of one appointed to die who has nothing to lose he awaited the reply in deadly anxiety nastasia philipovna gazed at him with a haughty ironical expression of face but when she glanced at nina alexandrovna and varia and from them to gania she changed her tone all of a sudden certainly not what are you thinking of what could have induced you to ask such a question she replied quietly and seriously and even apparently with some astonishment no no shouted rogozhin almost out of his mind with joy you are not going to after all and they told me oh nastasia philipovna they said you had promised to marry him him as if you could do it him poh i don't mind saying it to everyone i'd buy him off for a hundred roubles any day Pfft. give him a thousand or three if he likes poor devil and he'd cut and run the day before his wedding and leave his bride to me wouldn't you gania you blackguard you'd take three thousand wouldn't you here's the money look i've come on purpose to pay you off and get your receipt formally I said I'd buy you up, and so I will. Get out of this, you drunken beast! cried Gania, who was red and white by turns. Rogozhin's troop, who were only waiting for an excuse, set up a howl at this. Lebedev stepped forward and whispered something in Parfion's ear. You're right, Clark, said the latter. You're right, tipsy spirit. You're right nastasia philipovna he added looking at her like some lunatic harmless generally but suddenly wound up to a pitch of audacity here are eighteen thousand roubles and you shall have more here he threw a packet of banknotes tied up in white paper on the table before her not daring to say all he wished to say no 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 muttered lebedeff clutching at his arm he was clearly aghast at the largeness of the sum and thought a far smaller amount should have been tried first no you fool you don't know whom you are dealing with and it appears i am a fool too said parfion trembling beneath the flashing glance of nastasia oh curse it all what a fool i was to listen to you he added with profound melancholy nastasia philipovna observing his woe-begone expression suddenly burst out laughing <laughs> eighteen thousand roubles for me why you declare yourself a fool at once she said with impudent familiarity as she rose from the sofa and prepared to go gania watched the whole scene with a sinking of the heart forty thousand then forty thousand roubles instead of eighteen ptitsin and another have promised to find me forty thousand roubles by seven o'clock to-night forty thousand roubles paid down on the nail the scene was growing more and more disgraceful but nastasia philipovna continued to laugh and did not go away nina alexandrovna and varia had both risen from their places and were waiting in silent horror to see what would happen varia's eyes were all ablaze with anger but the scene had a different effect on nina alexandrovna she paled and trembled and looked more and more like fainting every moment very well then a hundred thousand a hundred thousand paid this very day ptitsin find it for me a good share shall stick to your fingers come you are mad 
said ptitsin coming up quickly and seizing him by the hand you're drunk the police will be sent for if you don't look out think where you are yes he's boasting like a drunkard added nastasia as though with the sole intention of goading him i do not boast you shall have a hundred thousand this very day ptitsin get the money you gay usurer take what you like for it but get it by the evening i'll show that i'm in earnest cried rogozhin working himself up into a frenzy of excitement come come what's all this cried general ivolgin suddenly and angrily coming close up to rogozhin the unexpectedness of this sally on the part of the hitherto silent old man caused some laughter among the intruders hello what's this now laughed rogozhin you come along with me old fellow you shall have as much to drink as you like oh it's too horrible cried Porcalia, sobbing with shame and annoyance surely there must be some one among all of you here who will turn this shameless creature out of the room cried varia suddenly she was shaking and trembling with rage that's me i suppose i'm the shameless creature cried nastasia filipovna with amused indifference dear me and i came like a fool as i am to invite them over to my house for the evening look how your sister treats me gavrila ardalionovitch for some moments gania stood as if stunned or struck by lightning after his sister's speech but seeing that nastasia filipovna was really about to leave the room this time he sprang at varia and seized her by the arm like a madman what have you done he hissed glaring at her as though he would like to annihilate her on the spot he was quite beside himself and could hardly articulate his words for rage what have i done where are you dragging me to do you wish me to beg pardon of this creature because she has come here to insult our mother and disgrace the whole household you low base wretch cried varia looking back at her brother with proud defiance a few moments passed as they stood there face to face gania still holding her wrist tightly varia struggled once twice to get free then could restrain herself no longer and spat in his face there's a girl for you cried nastasia filipovna mr ptitsin i congratulate you on your choice gania lost his head forgetful of everything he aimed a blow at varia which would inevitably have laid her low but suddenly another hand caught his between him and varia stood the prince enough enough said the latter with insistence but all of a tremble with excitement are you going to cross my path for ever damn you cried gania and loosening his hold on varia he slapped the prince's face with all his force exclamations of horror arose on all sides the prince grew pale as death he gazed into gania's eyes with a strange wild reproachful look his lips trembled and vainly endeavoured to form some words then his mouth twisted into an incongruous smile very well never mind about me but i shall not allow you to strike her he said at last quietly then suddenly he could bear it no longer and covering his face with his hands turned to the wall and murmured in broken accents oh how ashamed you will be of this afterwards gania certainly did look dreadfully abashed kolya rushed up to comfort the prince and after him crowded varia rogozhin and all even the general it's nothing it's nothing said the prince and again he wore the smile which was so inconsistent with the circumstances yes he will be ashamed cried rogozhin 
you will be properly ashamed of yourself for having injured such a such a sheep he could not find a better word prince my dear fellow leave this and come away with me i'll show you how rogozhin shows his affection for his friends nastasia filipovna was also much impressed both with gania's action and with the prince's reply her usually thoughtful pale face which all this while had been so little in harmony with the jests and laughter which she had seemed to put on for the occasion was now evidently agitated by new feelings though she tried to conceal the fact and to look as though she were as ready as ever for jesting and irony i really think i must have seen him somewhere she murmured seriously enough oh aren't you ashamed of yourself aren't you ashamed are you really the sort of woman you are trying to represent yourself to be is it possible the prince was now addressing nastasia in a tone of reproach which evidently came from his very heart nastasia filipovna looked surprised and smiled but evidently concealed something beneath her smile and with some confusion and a glance at gania she left the room however she had not reached the outer hall when she turned round walked quickly up to nina alexandrovna seized her hand and lifted it to her lips he guessed quite right i am not that sort of woman she whispered hurriedly flushing red all over then she turned again and left the room so quickly that no one could imagine what she had come back for all they saw was that she said something to nina alexandrovna in a hurried whisper and seemed to kiss her hand varia however both saw and heard all and watched nastasia out of the room with an expression of wonder gania recollected himself in time to rush after her in order to show her out but she had gone he followed her to the stairs don't come with me she cried au revoir till the evening do you hear au revoir he returned thoughtful and confused the riddle lay heavier than ever on his soul he was troubled about the prince too and so bewildered that he did not even observe rogozhin's rowdy band crowd past him and step on his toes at the door as they went out they were all talking at once rogozhin went ahead of the others talking to ptitsin and apparently insisting vehemently upon something very important you've lost the game gania he cried as he passed the latter gania gazed after him uneasily but said nothing end of part 1 chapter 10 Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey Part 1, Chapter 11 of The Idiot This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen The Idiot by Fyodor Dostoevsky Translated by Eva M. Martin Part 1, Chapter 11 the prince now left the room and shut himself up in his own chamber kolya followed him almost at once anxious to do what he could to console him the poor boy seemed to be already so attached to him that he could hardly leave him you are quite right to go away he said the row will rage there worse than ever now and it's like this every day with us and all through that nastasia filipovna you have so many sources of trouble here kolya said the prince yes indeed and it is all our own fault but i have a great friend who is much worse off even than we are would you like to know him yes very much is he one of your schoolfellows well not exactly i will tell you all about him some day 
what do you think of nastasia philipovna she is beautiful isn't she i had never seen her before though i had a great wish to do so she fascinated me i could forgive gania if he were to marry her for love but for money oh dear that is horrible yes your brother does not attract me much i am not surprised at that after what you but i do hate that way of looking at things because some fool or a rogue pretending to be a fool strikes a man that man is to be dishonoured for his whole life unless he wipes out the disgrace with blood or makes his assailant beg forgiveness on his knees i think that's so very absurd and tyrannical lermontov's bal masque is based on that idea a stupid and unnatural one in my opinion but he was hardly more than a child when he wrote it i like your sister very much did you see how she spat in gania's face varia is afraid of no one but you did not follow her example and yet i am sure it was not through cowardice here she comes speak of a wolf and you see his tail i felt sure that she would come she is very generous though of course she has her faults varia pounced upon her brother this is not the place for you said she go to father is he plaguing you prince not in the least on the contrary he interests me scolding as usual varia it's the worst thing about her after all i believe father may have started off with rogozhin no doubt he is sorry now perhaps i had better go and see what he is doing added kolya running off thank god i have got mother away and put her to bed without another scene gania is worried and ashamed not without reason what a spectacle i have come to thank you once more prince and to ask you if you knew nastasia philipovna before no i have never known her then what did you mean when you said straight out to her that she was not really like that you guessed right i fancy it is quite possible she was not herself at the moment though i cannot fathom her meaning evidently she meant to hurt and insult us i have heard curious tales about her before now but if she came to invite us to her house why did she behave so to my mother ptitsin knows her very well he says he could not understand her to-day with rogozhin too no one with a spark of self-respect could have talked like that in the house of her mother is extremely vexed on your account too that is nothing said the prince waving his hand but how meek she was when you spoke to her meek what do you mean you told her it was a shame for her to behave so and her manner changed at once she was like another person you have some influence over her prince added varia smiling a little the door opened at this point and in came gania most unexpectedly he was not in the least disconcerted to see varia there but he stood a moment at the door and then approached the prince quietly prince he said with feeling i was a blackguard forgive me his face gave evidence of suffering the prince was considerably amazed and did not reply at once oh come forgive me forgive me gania insisted rather impatiently if you like i'll kiss your hand there the prince was touched he took gania's hands and embraced him heartily while each kissed the other i never never thought you were like that said muishkin drawing a deep breath i thought you weren't capable of of what apologizing eh and where on earth did i get the idea that you were an idiot you always observe what other people pass by unnoticed one could talk sense to you but here is another to whom you should apologize 
said the prince, pointing to Varia. No, no, they are all enemies. I've tried them often enough, believe me. And Gania turned his back on Varia with these words. But if I beg you to make it up, said Varia, and you'll go to Nastasia Filipovna's this evening, if you insist, but judge for yourself, can I go? Ought I to go? But she is not that sort of woman, I tell you, said Gania angrily. She was only acting. I know that, I know that, but what a part to play. And think what she must take you for, Gania. I know she kissed mother's hand and all that, but she laughed at you all the same. All that is not good enough for seventy-five thousand roubles, my dear boy. You are capable of honourable feelings still, and that's why I am talking to you so. Oh, do take care what you are doing. Don't you know yourself that it will end badly, Gania? So saying, and in a state of violent agitation, Varia left the room. There, they are all like that, said Gania, laughing. Just as if I do not know all about it much better than they do. He sat down with these words, evidently intending to prolong his visit. If you know it so well, said the prince a little timidly, why do you choose all this worry for the sake of the seventy-five thousand, which you confess does not cover it? I didn't mean that, said Gania, but while we are upon the subject, let me hear your opinion. Is all this worry worth seventy-five thousand or not? Certainly not. Of course, and it would be a disgrace to marry so, hm? A great disgrace. Oh, well, then you may know that I shall certainly do it now. I shall certainly marry her. I was not quite sure of myself before, but now I am. Don't say a word. I know what you want to tell me. No, I was only going to say that what surprises me most of all is your extraordinary confidence. How so? What in? That Nastasia Filipovna will accept you, and that the question is as good as settled. And secondly, that even if she did, you would be able to pocket the money. Of course, I know very little about it, but that's my view. When a man marries for money, it often happens that the wife keeps the money in her own hands. Of course you don't know all, but I assure you, you needn't be afraid. It won't be like that in our case. There are circumstances, said Gania rather excitedly. And as to her answer to me, there's no doubt about that. Why should you suppose she will refuse me? Oh, I only judge by what I see. Varvara Ardalyanovna said just now. Oh, she! They don't know anything about it. Nastasia was only chaffing Rogozhin. I was alarmed at first, but I have thought better of it now. She was simply laughing at him. She looks on me as a fool because I show that I want her money, and doesn't realise that there are other men who would deceive her in far worse fashion. I am not going to pretend anything, and you'll see she'll marry me all right. If she likes to live quietly, so she shall. But if she gives me any of her nonsense, I shall leave her at once. But I shall keep the money. I'm not going to look a fool. That's the first thing, not to look a fool. But Nastasia Filipovna seems to me such a sensible woman, and as such why should she run blindly into this business? That's what puzzles me so," said the prince. You don't know all, you see. I tell you there are things, and besides I'm sure she is persuaded that I love her to distraction, and I give you my word I have a strong suspicion that she loves me too, in her own way, of course. She thinks she will be able to make a sort of slave of me all my life, but I shall prepare a little surprise for her. I don't know whether I ought to be confidential with you, Prince, but I assure you, you are the only decent fellow I have come across. I have not spoken so sincerely as I am doing at this moment for years. 
there are uncommonly few honest people about prince there isn't one honester than ptitsin he's the best of the lot are you laughing you don't know perhaps that blackguards like honest people and being one myself i like you why am i a blackguard tell me honestly now they all call me a blackguard because of her and i have got into the way of thinking myself one that is what is so bad about the business i for one shall never think you a blackguard again said the prince i confess i had a poor opinion of you at first but i have been so joyfully surprised about you just now it's a good lesson for me i shall never judge again without a thorough trial i see now that you are not only not a blackguard but are not even quite spoiled i see that you are quite an ordinary man not original in the least degree but rather weak gania laughed sarcastically but said nothing the prince seeing that he did not quite like the last remark blushed and was silent too has my father asked you for money asked gania suddenly no don't give it to him if he does fancy he was a decent respectable man once he was received in the best society he was not always the liar he is now of course wine is at the bottom of it all but he is a good deal worse than an innocent liar now do you know that he keeps a mistress i can't understand how mother is so long suffering did he tell you the story of the siege of kars or perhaps the one about his grey horse that talked he loves to enlarge on these absurd histories and gania burst into a fit of laughter suddenly he turned to the prince and asked why are you looking at me like that i am surprised to see you laugh in that way like a child you came to make friends with me again just now and you said i will kiss your hand if you like just as a child would have said it and then all at once you are talking of this mad project of these seventy-five thousand roubles it all seems so absurd and impossible well what conclusion have you reached that you are rushing madly into the undertaking and that you would do well to think it over again it is more than possible that varvara ardalionovna is right ah now you begin to moralize i know that i am only a child very well replied gania impatiently that is proved by my having this conversation with you it is not for money only prince that i am rushing into this affair he continued hardly master of his words so closely had his vanity been touched if i reckoned on that i should certainly be deceived for i am still too weak in mind and character i am obeying a passion an impulse perhaps because i have but one aim one that overmasters all else you imagine that once i am in possession of these seventy-five thousand roubles i shall rush to buy a carriage no i shall go on wearing the old overcoat i have worn for three years and i shall give up my club i shall follow the example of men who have made their fortunes when ptitsin was seventeen he slept in the street he sold penknives and began with a kopeck now he has sixty thousand roubles but to get them what has he not done well i shall be spared such a hard beginning and shall start with a little capital in fifteen years people will say look that's ivolgin the king of the jews you say that i have no originality now mark this prince there is nothing so offensive to a man of our time and race than to be told that he is wanting in originality that he is weak in character has no particular talent and is in short an ordinary person you have not even done me the honour of looking upon me as a rogue do you know i could have knocked you down for that just now you wounded me more cruelly than yepanchin 
who thinks me capable of selling him my wife observe it was a purely gratuitous idea on his part seeing there has never been any discussion of it between us this has exasperated me and i am determined to make a fortune i will do it once i am rich i shall be a genius an extremely original man one of the vilest and most hateful things connected with money is that it can buy even talent and will do so as long as the world lasts you will say that this is childish or romantic well that will be all the better for me but the thing shall be done i will carry it through he laughs most who laughs last why does yepanchin insult me simply because socially i am a nobody however enough for the present collier has put his nose in to tell us dinner is ready twice i'm dining out i shall come and talk to you now and then you shall be comfortable enough with us they are sure to make you one of the family i think you and i will either be great friends or enemies look here now supposing i had kissed your hand just now as i offered to do in all sincerity should i have hated you for it afterwards certainly but not always you would not have been able to keep it up and would have ended by forgiving me said the prince after a pause for reflection and with a pleasant smile oh how careful one has to be with you prince haven't you put a drop of poison in that remark now eh by the way <laughs> i forgot to ask was i right in believing that you were a good deal struck yourself with nastasia filipovna yes are you in love with her no and yet you flush up as red as a rosebud come it's all right i'm not going to laugh at you do you know she is a very virtuous woman believe it or not as you like you think she and totsky not a bit of it not a bit of it not for ever so long au revoir gania left the room in great good humour the prince stayed behind and meditated alone for a few minutes at length collier popped his head in once more i don't want any dinner thanks collier i had too good a lunch at general yepanchin's collier came into the room and gave the prince a note it was from the general and was carefully sealed up it was clear from collier's face how painful it was to him to deliver the missive the prince read it rose and took his hat it's only a couple of yards said collier blushing he's sitting there over his bottle and how they can give him credit i cannot understand don't tell mother i brought you the note prince i have sworn not to do it a thousand times but i'm always so sorry for him don't stand on ceremony give him some trifle and let that end it come along collier i want to see your father i have an idea said the prince end of part one chapter eleven recording by martin geeson part one chapter twelve of the idiot this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Martin Giessen The Idiot by Fyodor Dostoevsky Translated by Eva M. Martin Part 1, Chapter 12 Kolya took the prince to a public house in the Litania, not far off. In one of the side-rooms there sat at a table, looking like one of the regular guests of the establishment, Ardalion Alexandrovitch, with a bottle before him, and a newspaper on his knee. He was waiting for the prince, and no sooner did the latter appear than he began a long harangue about something or other. But so far gone was he that the prince could hardly understand a word. 
i have not got a ten rouble note said the prince but here is a twenty-five change it and give me back the fifteen or i shall be left without a farthing myself oh of course of course and you quite understand that i yes and i have another request to make general have you ever been at nastasia philipovna's i i do you mean me often my friend often i only pretended i had not in order to avoid a painful subject you saw to-day you were a witness that i did all that a kind and indulgent father could do now a father of altogether another type shall step into the scene you shall see the old soldier shall lay bare this intrigue or a shameless woman will force her way into a respectable and noble family yes quite so i wished to ask you whether you could show me the way to nastasia philipovna's to-night i must go i have business with her i was not invited but i was introduced anyhow i am ready to trespass the laws of propriety if only i can get in somehow or other my dear young friend you have hit on my very idea it was not for this rubbish i asked you to come over here he pocketed the money however at this point it was to invite your alliance in the campaign against nastasia philipovna to-night how well it sounds general ivolgin and prince muishkin that'll fetch her i think hm capital we'll go at nine there's time yet where does she live oh a long way off near the great theatre just in the square there it won't be a large party the general sat on and on he had ordered a fresh bottle when the prince arrived this took him an hour to drink and then he had another and another during the consumption of which he told pretty nearly the whole story of his life the prince was in despair he felt that though he had but applied to this miserable old drunkard because he saw no other way of getting to nastasia philipovna's yet he had been very wrong to put the slightest confidence in such a man at last he rose and declared he would wait no longer the general rose too drank the last drops that he could squeeze out of the bottle staggered into the street muishkin began to despair he could not imagine how he had been so foolish as to trust this man he only wanted one thing and that was to get to nastasia philipovna's even at the cost of a certain amount of impropriety but now the scandal threatened to be more than he had bargained for by this time ardalion alexandrovitch was quite intoxicated and he kept his companion listening while he discoursed eloquently and pathetically on subjects of all kinds interspersed with torrents of recrimination against the members of his family he insisted that all his troubles were caused by their bad conduct and time alone would put an end to them at last they reached the litania the thaw, thaw increased steadily a warm unhealthy wind blew through the streets vehicles splashed through the mud and the iron shoes of horses and mules rang on the paving stones crowds of melancholy people plodded wearily along the footpaths with here and there a drunken man among them do you see those brightly lighted windows said the general many of my old comrades in arms live about here and i who served longer and suffered more than any of them am walking on foot to the house of a woman of rather questionable reputation a man look you who has thirteen bullets on his breast you don't believe it well i can assure you it was entirely on my account that pirogov telegraphed to paris and left sevastopol at the greatest risk during the siege 
Nelaton, the Tuileries surgeon, demanded a safe conduct in the name of science into the besieged city in order to attend my wounds. The government knows all about it. That's the Evolgin with thirteen bullets in him. That's how they speak of me. Do you see that house, Prince? One of my old friends lives on the first floor, with his large family. In this and five other houses, three overlooking Nevsky, two in the Morskaya, are all that remain of my personal friends. Nina Alexandrovna gave them up long ago, but I keep in touch with them still. I may say I find refreshment in this little coterie in thus meeting my old acquaintances and subordinates, who worship me still, in spite of all. General Sokolovitch, by the way I have not called on him lately, or seen Anna Fyodorovna. You know, my dear prince, when a person does not receive company himself, he gives up going to other people's houses involuntarily, and yet well you look as if you didn't believe me well now why should i not present the son of my old friend and companion to this delightful family general ivolgin and prince muishkin you will see a lovely girl what am i saying a lovely girl no indeed two three ornaments of this city and of society beauty education culture the woman question poetry everything added to which is the fact that each one will have a do of at least eighty thousand roubles no bad thing eh in a word i absolutely must introduce you to them it is a duty an obligation general ivolgin and prince muishkin <coughs> tableau at once now you must have forgotten began the prince no i have forgotten nothing come this is the house up this magnificent staircase i am surprised not to see the porter but it is a holiday and the man has gone off drunken fool why have they not got rid of him Sakalovitch owes all the happiness he has had in the service and in his private life to me and me alone but here we are the prince followed quietly making no further objection for fear of irritating the old man at the same time he fervently hoped that general Sakalovitch and his family would fade away like a mirage in the desert so that the visitors could escape by merely returning downstairs. But to his horror he saw that General Ivolgin was quite familiar with the house and really seemed to have friends there. At every step he named some topographical or biographical detail that left nothing to be desired on the score of accuracy. When they arrived at last on the first floor, and the general turned to ring the bell to the right the prince decided to run away but a curious incident stopped him momentarily you have made a mistake general said he the name on the door is koulakov and you are going to see general sokolovitch koulakov koulakov means nothing this is sokolovitch's flat and i am ringing at his door what do I care for Kolakov? Here comes someone to open. In fact, the door opened directly, and the footman informed the visitors that the family were all away. What a pity! What a pity! It's just my luck, repeated Ardalion Alexandrovitch over and over again, in regretful tones. When your master and mistress return, my man, tell them that General Ivolgin and Prince Muishkin desired to present themselves, and that they were extremely sorry, excessively grieved. 
just then another person belonging to the household was seen at the back of the hall it was a woman of some forty years dressed in sombre colours probably a housekeeper or a governess hearing the names she came forward with a look of suspicion on her face marie alexandrovna is not at home said she staring hard at the general she has gone to her mother's with alexandra mikhailovna alexandra mikhailovna out too how disappointing would you believe it i am always so unfortunate may i most respectfully ask you to present my compliments to alexandra mikhailovna and remind her tell her that with my whole heart i wish for her what she wished for herself on thursday evening while she was listening to chopin's ballade she will remember i wish it with all sincerity general ivolgin and prince muishkin the woman's face changed she lost her suspicious expression i will not fail to deliver your message she replied and bowed them out as they went downstairs the general regretted repeatedly that he had failed to introduce the prince to his friends you know i am a bit of a poet said he have you noticed it the poetic soul you know then he added suddenly but after all after all i believe we made a mistake this time i remember that the sokoloviches live in another house and what is more they are just now in moscow yes i was certainly at fault however it is of no consequence just tell me said the prince in reply may i count still on your assistance or shall i go on alone to see nastasia philipovna count on my assistance go alone how can you ask me that question when it is a matter on which the fate of my family so largely depends you don't know ivolgin my friend to trust ivolgin is to trust a rock that's how the first squadron i commanded spoke of me depend upon ivolgin said they all he is as steady as a rock but excuse me i must just call at a house on our way a house where i have found consolation and help in all my trials for years you are going home no i wish to visit madame terentieff the widow of captain terentieff my old subordinate and friend she helps me to keep up my courage and to bear the trials of my domestic life and as i have an extra burden on my mind to-day it seems to me interrupted the prince that i was foolish to trouble you just now however at present you good-bye indeed you must not go away like that young man you must not cried the general my friend here is a widow the mother of a family her words come straight from her heart and find an echo in mine a visit to her is merely an affair of a few minutes i am quite at home in her house i will have a wash and dress and then we can drive to the grand theatre make up your mind to spend the evening with me we are just there that's the house why kolya you here well is marfa borisovna at home or oh, have you only just come oh no i have been here a long while replied kolya who was at the front door when the general met him i am keeping hippolyte company he is worse and has been in bed all day i came down to buy some cards marfa borisovna expects you but what a state you are in father added the boy noticing his father's unsteady gait well let us go in on meeting kolya the prince determined to accompany the general though he made up his mind to stay as short a time as possible 
he wanted collier but firmly resolved to leave the general behind he could not forgive himself for being so simple as to imagine that ivolgin would be of any use the three climbed up the long staircase until they reached the fourth floor where madame terentieff lived you intend to introduce the prince asked kolya as they went up yes my boy i wish to present him general ivolgin and prince muishkin but what's the matter what how is marfa borisovna you know father you would have done much better not to come at all she is ready to eat you up you have not shown yourself since the day before yesterday and she is expecting the money why did you promise her any you are always the same well now you will have to get out of it as best you can they stopped before a somewhat low doorway on the fourth floor ardalion alexandrovitch evidently much out of countenance pushed muishkin in front i will wait here he stammered i should like to surprise her kolya entered first and as the door stood open the mistress of the house peeped out the surprise of the general's imagination fell very flat for she at once began to address him in terms of reproach marfa borisovna was about forty years of age she wore a dressing jacket her feet were in slippers her face painted and her hair was in dozens of small plaits no sooner did she catch sight of ardalion alexandrovitch than she screamed there he is that wicked mean wretch i knew it was he my heart misgave me the old man tried to put a good face on the affair come let us go in it's all right he whispered in the prince's ear but it was more serious than he wished to think as soon as the visitors had crossed the low dark hall and entered the narrow reception room furnished with half a dozen cane chairs and two small card tables madame terentieff in the shrill tones habitual to her continued her stream of invectives are you not ashamed are you not ashamed you barbarian you tyrant you have robbed me of all i possessed you have sucked my bones to the marrow how long shall i be your victim shameless dishonourable man marfa borisovna marfa borisovna here is the prince muishkin general ivolgin and prince muishkin stammered the disconcerted old man would you believe said the mistress of the house suddenly addressing the prince would you believe that that man has not even spared my orphan children he has stolen everything i possessed sold everything pawned everything he has left me nothing nothing what am i to do with your i o u s you cunning unscrupulous rogue answer devourer answer heart of stone how shall i feed my orphans with what shall i nourish them and now he has come he is drunk he can scarcely stand how oh how have i offended the almighty that he should bring this curse upon me answer you worthless villain answer but this was too much for the general here are twenty-five roubles marfa borisovna it is all that i can give and i owe even these to the prince's generosity my noble friend i have been cruelly deceived such is life now excuse me i am very weak he continued standing in the centre of the room and bowing to all sides i am faint excuse me lenotchka a cushion my dear lenotchka a little girl of eight ran to fetch the cushion at once and placed it on the rickety old sofa the general meant to have said much more 
but as soon as he had stretched himself out he turned his face to the wall and slept the sleep of the just with a grave and ceremonious air marfa borisovna motioned the prince to a chair at one of the card tables she seated herself opposite leaned her right cheek on her hand and sat in silence her eyes fixed on muishkin now and again sighing deeply the three children two little girls and a boy Lenotchka being the eldest came and leant on the table and also stared steadily at him presently kolya appeared from the adjoining room i am very glad indeed to have met you here kolya said the prince can you do something for me i must see nastasia filipovna and i asked ardalion alexandrovitch just now to take me to her house but he has gone to sleep as you see will you show me the way for i do not know the street i have the address though it is close to the grand theatre nastasia filipovna she does not live there and to tell you the truth my father has never been to her house it is strange that you should have depended on him she lives near vladimir street at the five corners and it is quite close by will you go directly it is just half past nine i will show you the way with pleasure kolya and the prince went off together alas the latter had no money to pay for a cab so they were obliged to walk i should have liked to have taken you to see hippolyte said kolya he is the eldest son of the lady you met just now and was in the next room he is ill and has been in bed all day but he is rather strange and extremely sensitive and i thought he might be upset considering the circumstances in which you came somehow it touches me less as it concerns my father while it is his mother that of course makes a great difference what is a terrible disgrace to a woman does not disgrace a man at least not in the same way perhaps public opinion is wrong in condemning one sex and excusing the other hippolyte is an extremely clever boy but so prejudiced he is really a slave to his opinions do you say he is consumptive yes it really would be happier for him to die young if i were in his place i should certainly long for death he is unhappy about his brother and sisters the children you saw if it were possible if we only had a little money we should leave our respective families and live together in an apartment of our own it is our dream but do you know when i was talking over your affair with him he was angry and said that any one who did not call out a man who had given him a blow was a coward he is very irritable to-day and i left off arguing the matter with him so nastasia filipovna has invited you to go and see her to tell you the truth she has not then how do you come to be going there cried kolya so much astonished that he stopped short in the middle of the pavement and and are you going to her at home in that costume i don't know really whether i shall be allowed in at all if she will receive me so much the better if not the matter is ended as to my clothes what can i do are you going there for some particular reason or only as a way of getting into her society and that of her friends no i have really an object in going that is i am going on business it is difficult to explain but well whether you go on business or not is your affair i do not want to know the only important thing in my eyes is that you should not be going there simply for the pleasure of spending your evening in such company cocottes generals usurers if that were the case i should despise and laugh at you there are terribly few honest people here and hardly any whom one can respect 
although people put on airs varia especially have you noticed prince how many adventurers there are nowadays especially here in our dear russia how it has happened i never can understand there used to be a certain amount of solidity in all things but now what happens everything is exposed to the public gaze veils are thrown back every wound is probed by careless fingers we are forever present at an orgy of scandalous revelations parents blush when they remember their old-fashioned morality at moscow lately a father was heard urging his son to stop at nothing at nothing mind you to get money the press seized upon the story of course and now it is public property look at my father the general see what he is and yet i assure you he is an honest man only he drinks too much and his morals are not all we could desire yes that's true i pity him to tell the truth but i dare not say so because everybody would laugh at me but i do pity him and who are the really clever men after all money-grubbers every one of them from the first to the last hippolyte finds excuses for money-lending and says it is a necessity he talks about the economic movement and the ebb and flow of capital the devil knows what he means it makes me angry to hear him talk so but he is soured by his troubles just imagine the general keeps his mother but she lends him money she lends it for a week or ten days at very high interest isn't it disgusting and then you would hardly believe it but my mother nina alexandrovna helps hippolyte in all sorts of ways sends him money and clothes she even goes as far as helping the children through hippolyte because their mother cares nothing about them and varia does the same well just now you said there were no honest nor good people about that there were only money grubbers and yet they are quite close at hand these honest and good people your mother and varia i think there is a good deal of moral strength in helping people in such circumstances varia does it from pride and likes showing off and giving herself airs as to my mother i really do admire her yes and honour her hippolyte hardened as he is feels it he laughed at first and thought it vulgar of her but now he is sometimes quite touched and overcome by her kindness hmm you call that being strong and good i will remember that gania knows nothing about it he would say it was encouraging vice ah gania knows nothing about it it seems there are many things that gania does not know exclaimed the prince as he considered colia's last words do you know i like you very much indeed prince i shall never forget about this afternoon i like you too colia listen to me you are going to live here are you not said colia i mean to get something to do directly and earn money then shall we three live together you and i and hippolyte we will hire a flat and let the general come and visit us what do you say it would be very pleasant returned the prince but we must see i am really rather worried just now what are we there already is that the house what a long flight of steps and there's a porter well colia i don't know what will come of it all the prince seemed quite distracted for the moment you must tell me all about it to-morrow don't be afraid i wish you success we agree so entirely that i can do so although i do not understand why you are here good-bye 
cried Kolya excitedly. Now I will rush back and tell Hippolyte all about our plans and proposals. But as to your getting in, don't be in the least afraid. You will see her. She is so original about everything. It's the first floor. The porter will show you. End of part one, chapter twelve. Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey. Part one, chapter thirteen of the Idiot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen. The Idiot by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Eva M. Martin. Part one, chapter thirteen. The prince was very nervous as he reached the outer door, but he did his best to encourage himself with the reflection that the worst thing that could happen to him would be that he would not be received, or perhaps received, then laughed at for coming. But there was another question which terrified him considerably, and that was, what was he going to do when he did get in? and to this question he could fashion no satisfactory reply. If only he could find an opportunity of coming close up to Nastasia Filipovna, and saying to her, Don't ruin yourself by marrying this man. He does not love you, he loves only your money. He told me so himself, and so did Aglaya Ivanovna, and I have come on purpose to warn you. But even that did not seem quite a legitimate or practicable thing to do. Then again there was another delicate question to which he could not find an answer. Dared not, in fact, think of it, but at the very idea of which he trembled and blushed. However, in spite of all his fears and heart-quakings, he went in and asked for Nastasia Filipovna. Nastasia occupied a medium-sized but distinctly tasteful flat, beautifully furnished and arranged. At one period of these five years of Petersburg life, Totsky had certainly not spared his expenditure upon her. He had calculated upon her eventual love, and tried to tempt her with a lavish outlay upon comforts and luxuries knowing too well how easily the heart accustoms itself to comforts, and how difficult it is to tear oneself away from luxuries which have become habitual, and little by little indispensable. Nastasia did not reject all this, she even loved her comforts and luxuries, but strangely enough never became in the least degree dependent upon them and always gave the impression that she could do just as well without them. In fact, she went so far as to inform Totsky on several occasions that such was the case, which the latter gentleman considered a very unpleasant communication indeed. But of late Totsky had observed many strange and original features and characteristics in Nastasia which he had neither known nor reckoned upon in former times, and some of these fascinated him even now, in spite of the fact that all his old calculations with regard to her were long ago cast to the winds. A maid opened the door for the prince. Nastasia's servants were all females, and to his surprise received his request to announce him to her mistress without any astonishment. Neither his dirty boots, nor his wide-brimmed hat, nor his sleeveless cloak, nor his evident confusion of manner, produced the least impression upon her. She helped him off with his cloak, and begged him to wait a moment in the ante-room while she announced him. The company assembled at Nastasia Filipovna's consisted of none but her most intimate friends, and formed a very small party in comparison with her usual gatherings on this anniversary. In the first place there were present Totsky and General Yapanchin. They were both highly amiable, 
but both appeared to be labouring under a half-hidden feeling of anxiety as to the result of Nastasia's deliberations with regard to Gania, which result was to be made public this evening. Then, of course, there was Gania, who was by no means so amiable as his elders, but stood apart, gloomy and miserable and silent. He had determined not to bring Varya with him, but Nastasia had not even asked after her, though no sooner had he arrived than she reminded him of the episode between himself and the prince. The general, who had heard nothing of it before, began to listen with some interest, while Gania, dryly, but with perfect candour, went through the whole history, including the fact of his apology to the prince. He finished by declaring that the prince was a most extraordinary man, and goodness knows why he had been considered an idiot hitherto, for he was very far from being one. Nastasia listened to all this with great interest, but the conversation soon turned to Ragozhin and his visit, and this theme proved of the greatest attraction to both Totsky and the general. Ptitsin was able to afford some particulars as to Rogozhin's conduct since the afternoon. He declared that he had been busy finding money for the latter ever since, and up to nine o'clock, Rogozhin having declared that he must absolutely have a hundred thousand roubles by the evening. He added that Rogozhin was drunk, of course, but that he thought the money would be forthcoming for the excited and intoxicated rapture of the fellow impelled him to give any interest or premium that was asked of him, and there were several others engaged in beating up the money also. All this news was received by the company with somewhat gloomy interest. Nastasia was silent, and would not say what she thought about it. Gania was equally uncommunicative. The general seemed the most anxious of all, and decidedly uneasy. The present of pearls, which he had prepared with so much joy in the morning, had been accepted but coldly, and Nastasia had smiled rather disagreeably as she took it from him. Ferdishenko was the only person present in good spirits. Totsky himself, who had the reputation of being a capital talker, and was usually the life and soul of these entertainments, was as silent as any on this occasion, and sat in a state of, for him, most uncommon perturbation. The rest of the guests, an old tutor or schoolmaster, goodness knows why invited, a young man very timid and shy and silent, a rather loud woman of about forty, apparently an actress, and a very pretty, well-dressed German lady, who hardly said a word all the evening, not only had no gift for enlivening the proceedings, but hardly knew what to say for themselves when addressed. Under these circumstances, the arrival of the prince came almost as a godsend. The announcement of his name gave rise to some surprise, and to some smiles, especially when it became evident from Nastasia's astonished look that she had not thought of inviting him. But her astonishment once over, Nastasia showed such satisfaction that all prepared to greet the prince with cordial smiles of welcome. "'Of course,' remarked General Yepanchin, "'he does this out of pure innocence.' It's a little dangerous, perhaps, to encourage this sort of freedom. But it is rather a good thing that he has arrived just at this moment. He may enliven us a little with his originalities. Especially as he asked himself, said Ferdishenko. What's that got to do with it? asked the general, who loathed Ferdishenko. Why, he must pay toll for his entrance explained the latter. Hm, Prince Mushkin is not Ferdishenko, said the general impatiently. This worthy gentleman could never quite reconcile himself to the idea of meeting Ferdishenko in society, 
and on an equal footing oh general spare ferdishenko replied the other smiling i have special privileges what do you mean by special privileges once before i had the honour of stating them to the company i will repeat the explanation to-day for your excellency's benefit you see excellency all the world is witty and clever except myself i am neither as a kind of compensation i am allowed to tell the truth for it is a well-known fact that only stupid people tell the truth added to this i am a spiteful man just because i am not clever if i am offended or injured i bear it quite patiently until the man injuring me meets with some misfortune then i remember and take my revenge i return the injury sevenfold as ivan petrovitch ptitsin says of course he never does so himself excellency no doubt you recall Krylov's fable, The Lion and the Ass. Well now, that's you and I. That fable was written precisely for us. <clears throat> you seem to be talking nonsense again, Ferdishenko, growled the general. What is the matter, Excellency? I know how to keep my place. When I said just now that we, you and I, were the Lion and the Ass of Krylov's fable, of course it is understood that i take the role of the ass your excellency is the lion of which the fable remarks a mighty lion terror of the woods was shorn of his great prowess by old age and i your excellency am the ass i am of your opinion on that last point said ivan fyodorovitch with ill-concealed irritation all this was no doubt extremely coarse, and moreover it was premeditated, but after all Ferdishenko had persuaded everyone to accept him as a buffoon. "'If I am admitted and tolerated here,' he had said one day, "'it is simply because I talk in this way. How can anyone possibly receive such a man as I am? I quite understand now could i a ferdishenko be allowed to sit shoulder to shoulder with a clever man like afanasy ivanovitch there is one explanation only one i am given the position because it is so entirely inconceivable but these vulgarities seemed to please nastasia filipovna although too often they were both rude and offensive those who wished to go to her house were forced to put up with ferdishenko possibly the latter was not mistaken in imagining that he was received simply in order to annoy totsky who disliked him extremely gania also was often made the butt of the jester's sarcasms who used this method of keeping in nastasia filipovna's good graces the prince will begin by singing us a fashionable ditty remarked ferdishenko and looked at the mistress of the house to see what she would say i don't think so ferdishenko please be quiet answered nastasia filipovna dryly ah oh, if he is to be under special patronage i withdraw my claws but nastasia filipovna had now risen and advanced to meet the prince i was so sorry to have forgotten to ask you to come when i saw you she said and i am delighted to be able to thank you personally now and to express my pleasure at your resolution so saying she gazed into his eyes longing to see whether she could make any guess as to the explanation of his motive in coming to her house the prince would very likely have made some reply to her kind words but he was so dazzled by her appearance that he could not speak nastasia noticed this with satisfaction she was in full dress this evening 
and her appearance was certainly calculated to impress all beholders. She took his hand and led him towards her other guests, but just before they reached the drawing-room door the prince stopped her, and hurriedly and in great agitation whispered to her, "'You are altogether perfection. Even your pallor and thinness are perfect. One could not wish you otherwise. I did so wish to come and see you. I... forgive me, please.' don't apologize said nastasia laughing you spoil the whole originality of the thing i think what they say about you must be true that you are so original so you think me perfection do you yes hmm well you may be a good reader of riddles but you are wrong there at all events i'll remind you of this to-night Nastasia introduced the prince to her guests, to most of whom he was already known. Totsky immediately made some amiable remark. All seemed to brighten up at once, and the conversation became general. Nastasia made the prince sit down next to herself. "'Dear me, there's nothing so very curious about the prince dropping in after all,' remarked Ferdishenko. "'It's quite a clear case,' said the hitherto silent Gania. "'I have watched the prince almost all day, ever since the moment when he first saw Nastasia Filipovna's portrait at General Yepanchin's. I remember thinking at the time what I am now pretty sure of, and what I may say in passing the prince confessed to myself.' Gania said all this perfectly seriously, and without the slightest appearance of joking. Indeed, he seemed strangely gloomy. "'I did not confess anything to you,' said the prince, blushing. "'I only answered your question.' "'Bravo! That's frank, at any rate!' shouted Ferdishenko, and there was general laughter. "'Oh, Prince, Prince, I should never have thought it of you,' said General Yepanchin. "'And I imagined you a philosopher. Oh, you silent fellows!' "'Judging from the fact that the Prince blushed at this innocent joke, like a young girl, I should think that he must, as an honourable man, harbour the noblest intentions.' said the old toothless schoolmaster most unexpectedly he had not so much as opened his mouth before this remark provoked general mirth and the old fellow himself laughed loudest of the lot but ended with a stupendous fit of coughing nastasia filipovna who loved originality and drollery of all kinds was apparently very fond of this old man and rang the bell for more tea to stop his coughing. It was now half-past ten o'clock. "'Gentlemen, wouldn't you like a little champagne now?' she asked. "'I have it all ready. It will cheer us up. Do now. No ceremony.' This invitation to drink, couched as it was in such informal terms, came very strangely from Nastasia Filipovna, her usual entertainments were not quite like this there was more style about them however the wine was not refused each guest took a glass excepting gania who drank nothing it was extremely difficult to account for nastasia's strange condition of mind which became more evident each moment and which none could avoid noticing she took her glass and vowed she would empty it three times that evening she was hysterical and laughed aloud every other minute with no apparent reason the next moment relapsing into gloom and thoughtfulness some of her guests suspected that she must be ill but concluded at last that she was expecting something for she continued to look at her watch impatiently and unceasingly. She was most absent and strange. 
"'You seem to be a little feverish to-night,' said the actress. "'Yes, I feel quite ill. I have been obliged to put on this shawl. I feel so cold,' replied Nastasia. She had certainly grown very pale, and every now and then she tried to suppress a trembling in her limbs. "'Had we not better allow our hostess to retire?' asked Totsky of the general. "'Not at all, gentlemen, not at all. Your presence is absolutely necessary to me to-night,' said Nastasia significantly. As most of those present were aware that this evening a certain very important decision was to be taken, these words of Nastasia Filipovna's appeared to be fraught with much hidden interest. The general and Totsky exchanged looks. Gania fidgeted convulsively in his chair. "'Let's play at some game,' suggested the actress. "'I know a new and most delightful game,' added Ferdishenko. "'What is it?' asked the actress. "'Well, when we tried it we were a party of people like this, for instance, and somebody proposed that each of us, without leaving his place at the table, should relate something about himself. It had to be something that he really and honestly considered the very worst action he had ever committed in his life. But he was to be honest. That was the chief point. He wasn't to be allowed to lie. "'What an extraordinary idea!' said the general. "'That's the beauty of it, general.' "'It's a funny notion.' said Totsky, and yet quite natural, it's only a new way of boasting. Perhaps that is just what was so fascinating about it. Why, it would be a game to cry over, not to laugh at, said the actress. Did it succeed? asked Nastasia Filipovna. Come, let's try it, let's try it. We really are not quite so jolly as we might be. Let's try it. We may like it. It's original, at all events." "'Yes,' said Ferdishenko. "'It's a good idea. Come along. The men begin. Of course no one need tell a story if he prefers to be disobliging. We must draw lots. Throw your slips of paper, gentlemen, into this hat, and the prince shall draw for turns. It's a very simple game. All you have to do is to tell the story of the worst action of your life. It's as simple as anything. I'll prompt anyone who forgets the rules." No one liked the idea much. Some smiled, some frowned, some objected, but faintly, not wishing to oppose Nastasia's wishes for this new idea seemed to be rather well received by her. She was still in an excited, hysterical state, laughing convulsively at nothing and everything. Her eyes were blazing, and her cheeks showed two bright red spots against the white. The melancholy appearance of some of her guests seemed to add to her sarcastic humour and perhaps the very cynicism and cruelty of the game proposed by Ferdishenko pleased her. At all events she was attracted by the idea, and gradually her guests came round to her side. The thing was original, at least, and might turn out to be amusing. "'And supposing it's something that one, one can't speak about before ladies?' asked the timid and silent young man. Why, then, of course, you won't say anything about it. As if there are not plenty of sins to your score without the need of those," said Ferdishenko. But I really don't know which of my actions is the worst," said the lively actress. Ladies are exempted if they like. And how are you to know that one isn't lying? And if one lies, the whole point of the game is lost," said Gania. Oh, but think how delightful to hear how one's friends lie. Besides, you needn't be afraid, Gania. Everybody knows what your worst action is without the need of any lying on your part. 
only think gentlemen and ferdishenko here grew quite enthusiastic only think with what eyes we shall observe one another to-morrow after our tales have been told but surely this is a joke nastasia philipovna asked totsky you don't really mean us to play this game whoever is afraid of wolves had better not go into the wood said nastasia smiling but pardon me mr ferdishenko is it possible to make a game out of this kind of thing persisted totsky growing more and more uneasy i assure you it can't be a success and why not why the last time i simply told straight off about how i stole three roubles perhaps so but it is hardly possible that you told it so that it seemed like truth or so that you were believed and as gavrila ardalionovitch has said the least suggestion of a falsehood takes all point out of the game it seems to me that sincerity on the other hand is only possible if combined with a kind of bad taste that would be utterly out of place here how subtle you are afanasy ivanovitch you astonish me cried ferdishenko you will remark gentlemen that in saying that i could not recount the story of my theft so as to be believed afanasy ivanovitch has very ingeniously implied that i am not capable of thieving it would have been bad taste to say so openly and all the time he is probably firmly convinced in his own mind that i am very well capable of it but now gentlemen to business put in your slips ladies and gentlemen is yours in mr totsky so then we are all ready now prince draw please the prince silently put his hand into the hat and drew the names ferdishenko was first then ptitsin then the general totsky next his own fifth then gania and so on the ladies did not draw oh dear oh dear cried ferdishenko i did so hope the prince would come out first and then the general well gentlemen i suppose i must set a good example what vexes me much is that i am such an insignificant creature that it matters nothing to anybody whether i have done bad actions or not besides which am i to choose it's an embarras de richesse shall i tell how i became a thief on one occasion only to convince afanasy ivanovitch that it is possible to steal without being a thief do go on ferdishenko and don't make unnecessary preface or you'll never finish said nastasia philipovna all observed how irritable and cross she had become since her last burst of laughter but none the less obstinately did she stick to her absurd whim about this new game totsky sat looking miserable enough the general lingered over his champagne and seemed to be thinking of some story for the time when his turn should come End of part one chapter thirteen recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey part one chapter fourteen of the idiot this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by martin geeson the idiot by fyodor dostoevsky translated by eva m martin part one chapter fourteen i have no wit nastasia philipovna began ferdishenko and therefore i talk too much perhaps were i as witty now as mr totsky or the general i should probably have sat silent all the evening as they have now prince what do you think are there not far more thieves than honest men in this world 
don't you think we may say there does not exist a single person so honest that he has never stolen anything whatever in his life what a silly idea said the actress of course it is not the case i have never stolen anything for one hmm very well daria alexeyevna you have not stolen anything agreed but how about the prince now look how he is blushing i think you are partially right but you exaggerate said the prince who had certainly blushed up of a sudden for some reason or other ferdishenko either tell us your story or be quiet and mind your own business you exhaust all patience cuttingly and irritably remarked nastasia philipovna immediately immediately as for my story gentlemen it is too stupid and absurd to tell you i assure you i am not a thief and yet i have stolen i cannot explain why it was at semyon ivanovitch ishenka's country house one sunday he had a dinner party after dinner the men stayed at the table over their wine it struck me to ask the daughter of the house to play something on the piano so i passed through the corner room to join the ladies in that room on maria ivanovna's writing-table i observed a three-rouble note she must have taken it out for some purpose and left it lying there there was no one about i took up the note and put it in my pocket why i can't say i don't know what possessed me to do it but it was done and i went quickly back to the dining-room and reseated myself at the dinner-table i sat and waited there in a great state of excitement i talked hard and told lots of stories and laughed like mad then i joined the ladies in half an hour or so the loss was discovered and the servants were being put under examination daria the housemaid was suspected i exhibited the greatest interest and sympathy and i remember that poor daria quite lost her head and that i began assuring her before every one that i would guarantee her forgiveness on the part of her mistress if she would confess her guilt they all stared at the girl and i remember a most wonderful attraction in the reflection that here was i sermonizing away with the money in my own pocket all the while i went and spent the three roubles that very evening at a restaurant i went in and asked for a bottle of lafitte and drank it up i wanted to be rid of the money i did not feel much remorse either then or afterwards but i would not repeat the performance believe it or not as you please there that's all only of course that's not nearly your worst action said the actress with evident dislike in her face that was a psychological phenomenon not an action remarked totsky and what about the maid asked nastasia philipovna with undisguised contempt oh she was turned out next day of course it's a very strict household there and you allowed it i should think so rather i was not going to return and confess next day laughed ferdishenko who seemed a little surprised at the disagreeable impression which his story had made on all parties how mean you were said nastasia <laughs> you wish to hear of a man tell of his worst actions and you expect the story to come out goody-goody one's worst actions always are mean we shall see what the general has to say for himself now all is not gold that glitters you know and because a man keeps his carriage he need not be specially virtuous i assure you all sorts of people keep carriages and by what means in a word ferdishenko was very angry and rapidly forgetting himself his whole face was drawn with passion 
strange as it may appear he had expected much better success for his story these little errors of taste on ferdishenko's part occurred very frequently nastasia trembled with rage and looked fixedly at him whereupon he relapsed into alarmed silence he realized that he had gone a little too far had we not better end this game asked totski it's my turn but i plead exemption said ptitsin you don't care to oblige us asked nastasia i cannot i assure you i confess i do not understand how any one can play this game then general it's your turn continued nastasia philipovna and if you refuse the whole game will fall through which will disappoint me very much for i was looking forward to relating a certain page of my own life i am only waiting for you and afanasy ivanovitch to have your turns for i require the support of your example she added smiling oh if you put it that way cried the general excitedly i am ready to tell the whole story of my life but i must confess that i prepared a little story in anticipation of my turn nastasia smiled amiably at him but evidently her depression and irritability were increasing with every moment totski was dreadfully alarmed to hear her promise a revelation out of her own life i like everyone else began the general have committed certain not altogether graceful actions so to speak during the course of my life but the strangest thing of all in my case is that i should consider the little anecdote which i am now about to give you as a confession of the worst of my bad actions it is thirty-five years since it all happened and yet i cannot to this very day recall the circumstances without as it were a sudden pang at the heart it was a silly affair i was an ensign at the time you know ensigns their blood is boiling water their circumstances generally penurious well i had a servant nikifor who used to do everything for me in my quarters economized and managed for me and even laid hands on anything he could find belonging to other people in order to augment our household goods but a faithful honest fellow all the same i was strict but just by nature at that time we were stationed in a small town i was quartered at an old widow's house a lieutenant's widow of eighty years of age she lived in a wretched little wooden house and had not even a servant so poor was she her relations had all died off her husband was dead and buried forty years since and a niece who had lived with her and bullied her up to three years ago was dead too so that she was quite alone well i was precious dull with her especially as she was so childish that there was nothing to be got out of her eventually she stole a fowl of mine the business is a mystery to this day but it could have been no one but herself i requested to be quartered somewhere else and was shifted to the other end of the town to the house of a merchant with a large family and a long beard as i remember him nikifor and i were delighted to go but the old lady was not pleased at our departure well a day or two afterwards when i returned from drill nikifor says to me we oughtn't to have left our tureen with the old lady i have nothing to serve the soup in i asked how it came about that the tureen had been left nikifor explained that the old lady refused to give it up because she said we had broken her bowl and she must have our tureen in place of it she had declared that i had so arranged the matter with herself this baseness on her part of course aroused my young blood to fever heat i jumped up and away i flew i arrived at the old woman's house beside myself she was sitting in a corner all alone 
leaning her face on her hand i fell on her like a clap of thunder you old wretch i yelled and all that sort of thing in real russian style well when i began cursing at her a strange thing happened i looked at her and she stared back with her eyes starting out of her head but she did not say a word she seemed to sway about as she sat and looked and looked at me in the strangest way well i soon stopped swearing and looked closer at her asked her questions but not a word could i get out of her the flies were buzzing about the room and only this sound broke the silence the sun was setting outside i didn't know what to make of it so i went away before i reached home i was met and summoned to the major's so that it was some while before i actually got there when i came in nikifor met me have you heard sir that our old lady is dead dead when oh an hour and a half ago that meant nothing more nor less than that she was dying at the moment when i pounced on her and began abusing her this produced a great effect upon me i used to dream of the poor old woman at nights i really am not superstitious but two days after i went to her funeral and as time went on i thought more and more about her i said to myself this woman this human being lived to a great age she had children a husband and family friends and relations her household was busy and cheerful she was surrounded by smiling faces and then suddenly they are gone and she is left alone like a solitary fly like a fly cursed with the burden of her age at sunset on a lovely summer's evening my little old woman passes away a thought you will notice which offers much food for reflection and behold instead of tears and prayers to start her on her last journey she has insults and jeers from a young ensign who stands before her with his hands in his pockets making a terrible row about a soup tureen of course i was to blame and even now that i have time to look back at it calmly i pity the poor old thing no less i repeat that i wonder at myself for after all i was not really responsible why did she take it into her head to die at that moment but the more i thought of it the more i felt the weight of it upon my mind and i never quite got rid of the impression until i put a couple of old women into an almshouse and kept them there at my own expense there that's all i repeat i dare say i have committed many a grievous sin in my day but i cannot help always looking back upon this as the worst action i have ever perpetrated hmm, and instead of a bad action your excellency has detailed one of your noblest deeds said ferdishenko ferdishenko is done dear me general said nastasia philipovna absently i really never imagined you had such a good heart the general laughed with great satisfaction and applied himself once more to the champagne it was now totsky's turn and his story was awaited with great curiosity while all eyes turned on nastasia philipovna as though anticipating that his revelation must be connected somehow with her nastasia during the whole of his story pulled at the lace trimming of her sleeve and never once glanced at the speaker totsky was a handsome man rather stout with a very polite and dignified manner he was always well dressed and his linen was exquisite he had plump white hands and wore a magnificent diamond ring on one finger what simplifies the duty before me considerably in my opinion he began 
is that i am bound to recall and relate the very worst action of my life in such circumstances there can of course be no doubt one's conscience very soon informs one what is the proper narrative to tell i admit that among the many silly and thoughtless actions of my life the memory of one comes prominently forward and reminds me that it lay long like a stone on my heart some twenty years since i paid a visit to platon ordintsev at his country house he had just been elected marshal of the nobility and had come there with his young wife for the winter holidays and fiza alexeyevna's birthday came off just then too and there were two balls arranged at that time dumas fils's beautiful work la dame aux camélias a novel which i consider imperishable had just come into fashion in the provinces all the ladies were in raptures over it those who had read it at least camellias were all the fashion every one inquired for them everybody wanted them and a grand lot of camellias are to be got in a country town as you all know and two balls to provide for poor peter volkhovskoy was desperately in love with anfisa alexeyevna i don't know whether there was anything i mean i don't know whether he could possibly have indulged in any hope the poor fellow was beside himself to get her a bouquet of camellias countess sotsky and sofia bespalova as every one knew were coming with white camellia bouquets and fisa wished for red ones for effect well her husband platon was driven desperate to find some and the day before the ball anfisa's rival snapped up the only red camellias to be had in the place from under platon's nose and platon wretched man was done for now if peter had only been able to step in at this moment with a red bouquet his little hopes might have made gigantic strides a woman's gratitude under such circumstances would have been boundless but it was practically an impossibility the night before the ball i met peter looking radiant what is it i ask i found them eureka no where where at ekshaisk a little town fifteen miles off there's a rich old merchant who keeps a lot of canaries has no children and he and his wife are devoted to flowers he's got some camellias and what if he won't let you have them i'll go on my knees and implore till i get them i won't go away when shall you start tomorrow morning at five o'clock go on i said and good luck to you i was glad for the poor fellow and went home but an idea got hold of me somehow i don't know how it was nearly two in the morning i rang the bell and ordered the coachman to be waked up and sent to me he came i gave him a tip of fifteen roubles and told him to get the carriage ready at once in half an hour it was at the door i got in and off we went by five i drew up at the ekshaisky inn i waited there till dawn and soon after six i was off and at the old merchant trepalov's camellias i said father save me save me let me have some camellias he was a tall grey old man a terrible-looking old gentleman not a bit of it he says i won't down i went on my knees don't say so don't think what you're doing i cried it's a matter of life and death if that's the case take them says he so up i get and cut such a bouquet of red camellias he had a whole greenhouse full of them lovely ones the old fellow sighs i pull out a hundred roubles no no says he don't insult me that way oh if that's the case give it to the village hospital i say ah he says that's quite a different matter that's good of you and generous 
I'll pay it in there for you with pleasure. I liked that old fellow, Russian to the core, de la vraie souche. I went home in raptures, but took another road in order to avoid Peter. Immediately on arriving, I sent up the bouquet for Anfisa to see when she awoke. You may imagine her ecstasy, her gratitude. The wretched Platon, who had almost died since yesterday of the reproaches showered upon him, wept on my shoulder. Of course poor Peter had no chance after this. I thought he would cut my throat at first, and went about armed, ready to meet him. But he took it differently. He fainted, and had brain fever and convulsions. A month after, when he had hardly recovered, he went off to the Crimea, and there he was shot. I assure you this business left me no peace for many a long year. Why did I do it? I was not in love with her myself. I'm afraid it was simply mischief, pure cussedness on my part. If I hadn't seized that bouquet from under his nose, he might have been alive now, and a happy man. He might have been successful in life, and never have gone to fight the Turks. Totsky ended his tale with the same dignity that had characterized its commencement. Nastasia Filipovna's eyes were flashing in a most unmistakable way now, and her lips were all a-quiver by the time Totsky finished his story. All present watched both of them with curiosity. "'You were right, Totsky,' said Nastasia. "'It is a dull game and a stupid one. I'll just tell my story as I promised, and then we'll play cards.' "'Yes, but let's have the story first, cried the general. "'Prince,' said Nastasia Filipovna, unexpectedly turning to Muishkin, "'here are my old friends, Totsky and General Yepanchin, who wish to marry me off. Tell me what you think. Shall I marry or not? As you decide, so shall it be.' Totsky grew white as a sheet. The general was struck dumb. All present started and listened intently. Gania sat rooted to his chair. "'Marry whom?' asked the prince faintly. "'Gavrila Ardalionovich Ivolgin,' said Nastasia firmly and evenly. There were a few seconds of dead silence. The prince tried to speak, but could not form his words. A great weight seemed to lie upon his breast and suffocate him. "'No, don't marry him,' he whispered at last, drawing his breath with an effort. "'So be it, then. Gavrila Ardalionovitch. she spoke solemnly and forcibly, "'you hear the prince's decision.' Take it as my decision, and let that be the end of the matter for good and all. Nastasia Filipovna, cried Totsky in a quaking voice. Nastasia Filipovna, said the general in persuasive but agitated tones. Everyone in the room fidgeted in their place and waited to see what was coming next. Well, gentlemen, she continued, gazing around in apparent astonishment. "'What do you all look so alarmed about? Why are you so upset? "'But recollect, Nastasia Filipovna,' stammered Totsky, "'you gave a promise, quite a free one, and, and you might have spared us this. I am confused and bewildered, I know, but in a word, at such a moment, and before company, and all so, so irregular, finishing off a game with a serious matter like this, a matter of honour and of heart, and— I don't follow you, Afanasy Ivanovitch. You are losing your head. In the first place, what do you mean by before company? Isn't the company good enough for you? And what's all that about a game? I wish to tell my little story, and I told it. Don't you like it? You heard what I said to the prince. 
as you decide so it shall be if he had said yes i should have given my consent but he said no so i refused here was my whole life hanging on his one word surely i was serious enough the prince what on earth has the prince got to do with it who the deuce is the prince cried the general who could conceal his wrath no longer the prince has this to do with it that i see in him for the first time in all my life a man endowed with real truthfulness of spirit and i trust him he trusted me at first sight and i trust him it only remains for me then to thank nastasia philipovna for the great delicacy with which she has treated me said gania as pale as death and with quivering lips that is my plain duty of course but the prince what has he to do in the matter i see what you are driving at said nastasia philipovna you imply that the prince is after the seventy-five thousand roubles i quite understand you mr totsky i forgot to say take your seventy-five thousand roubles i don't want them i let you go free for nothing take your freedom you must need it nine years and three months captivity is enough for anybody to-morrow i shall start afresh to-day i am a free agent for the first time in my life general you must take your pearls back too give them to your wife here they are to-morrow i shall leave this flat altogether and then there'll be no more of these pleasant little social gatherings ladies and gentlemen so saying she scornfully rose from her seat as though to depart nastasia philipovna nastasia philipovna the words burst involuntarily from every mouth all present started up in bewildered excitement all surrounded her all had listened uneasily to her wild disconnected sentences all felt that something had happened something had gone very far wrong indeed but no one could make head or tail of the matter at this moment there was a furious ring at the bell and a great knock at the door exactly similar to the one which had startled the company at garnier's house in the afternoon ah ah here's the climax at last at half past twelve cried nastasia philipovna sit down gentlemen i beg you something is about to happen so saying she reseated herself a strange smile played on her lips she sat quite still but watched the door in a fever of impatience rogozhin and his hundred thousand roubles no doubt of it muttered ptitsin to himself end of part 1 chapter 14 recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey part 1 chapter 15 of the idiot this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by martin geeson the idiot by fyodor dostoevsky translated by eva m martin part 1 chapter 15 katya the maidservant made her appearance terribly frightened goodness knows what it means ma'am she said there is a whole collection of men come all tipsy and want to see you they say that it's rogozhin and she knows all about it it's all right katya let them all in at once surely not all ma'am they seem so disorderly it's dreadful to see them yes all katya all every one of them let them in or they'll come in whether you like or no listen what a noise they are making perhaps you are offended gentlemen that i should receive such guests in your presence i am very sorry and ask your forgiveness but it cannot be helped and i should be very grateful if you could all stay and witness this climax 
however just as you please of course the guests exchanged glances they were annoyed and bewildered by the episode but it was clear enough that all this had been pre-arranged and expected by nastasia philipovna and that there was no use in trying to stop her now for she was little short of insane besides they were naturally inquisitive to see what was to happen there was nobody who would be likely to feel much alarm there were but two ladies present one of whom was the lively actress who was not easily frightened and the other the silent german beauty who it turned out did not understand a word of russian and seemed to be as stupid as she was lovely her acquaintances invited her to their at-homes because she was so decorative she was exhibited to their guests like a valuable picture or vase or statue or fire-screen as for the men ptitsin was one of rogozhin's friends ferdishenko was as much at home as a fish in the sea gania not yet recovered from his amazement appeared to be chained to a pillory the old professor did not in the least understand what was happening but when he noticed how extremely agitated the mistress of the house and her friends seemed he nearly wept and trembled with fright but he would rather have died than leave nastasia philipovna at such a crisis for he loved her as if she were his own granddaughter afanasy ivanovitch greatly disliked having anything to do with the affair but he was too much interested to leave in spite of the mad turn things had taken and a few words that had dropped from the lips of nastasia puzzled him so much that he felt he could not go without an explanation he resolved therefore to see it out and to adopt the attitude of silent spectator as most suited to his dignity general yepanchin alone determined to depart he was annoyed at the manner in which his gift had been returned and although he had condescended under the influence of passion to place himself on a level with ptitsin and ferdishenko his self-respect and sense of duty now returned together with a consciousness of what was due to his social rank and official importance in short he plainly showed his conviction that a man in his position could have nothing to do with rogozhin and his companions but nastasia interrupted him at his first words ah general she cried i was forgetting if i had only foreseen this unpleasantness i won't insist on keeping you against your will although i should have liked you to be beside me now in any case i am most grateful to you for your visit and flattering attention but if you are afraid excuse me nastasia philipovna interrupted the general with chivalric generosity to whom are you speaking i have remained until now simply because of my devotion to you and as for danger i am only afraid that the carpets may be ruined and the furniture smashed you should shut the door on the lot in my opinion but i confess that i am extremely curious to see how it ends rogozhin announced ferdishenko what do you think about it said the general in a low voice to totski is she mad i mean mad in the medical sense of the word hm? i've always said she was predisposed to it whispered afanasy ivanovitch slyly perhaps it is a fever since their visit to gania's home rogozhin's followers had been increased by two new recruits a dissolute old man the hero of some ancient scandal and a retired sub-lieutenant a laughable story was told of the former he possessed it was said a set of false teeth and one day when he wanted money for a drinking orgy he pawned them and was never able to reclaim them the officer appeared to be a rival of the gentleman who was so proud of his fists he was known to none of rogozhin's followers but as they passed by the nevsky where he stood begging he had joined their ranks 
his claim for the charity he desired seemed based on the fact that in the days of his prosperity he had given away as much as fifteen roubles at a time the rivals seemed more than a little jealous of one another the athlete appeared injured at the admission of the beggar into the company by nature taciturn he now merely growled occasionally like a bear and glared contemptuously upon the beggar who being somewhat of a man of the world and a diplomatist tried to insinuate himself into the bear's good graces he was a much smaller man than the athlete and doubtless was conscious that he must tread warily gently and without argument he alluded to the advantages of the english style in boxing and showed himself a firm believer in western institutions the athlete's lips curled disdainfully and without honouring his adversary with a formal denial he exhibited as if by accident that peculiarly russian object an enormous fist clenched muscular and covered with red hairs the sight of this pre-eminently national attribute was enough to convince anybody without words that it was a serious matter for those who should happen to come into contact with it none of the band were very drunk for the leader had kept his intended visit to nastasia in view all day and had done his best to prevent his followers from drinking too much he was sober himself but the excitement of this chaotic day the strangest day of his life had affected him so that he was in a dazed wild condition which almost resembled drunkenness he had kept but one idea before him all day and for that he had worked in an agony of anxiety and a fever of suspense his lieutenants had worked so hard from five o'clock until eleven that they actually had collected a hundred thousand roubles for him but at such terrific expense that the rate of interest was only mentioned among them in whispers and with bated breath as before rogozhin walked in advance of his troop who followed him with mingled self-assertion and timidity they were specially frightened of nastasia philipovna herself for some reason many of them expected to be thrown downstairs at once without further ceremony the elegant and irresistible zaleshev among them but the party led by the athlete without openly showing their hostile intentions silently nursed contempt and even hatred for nastasia philipovna and marched into her house as they would have marched into an enemy's fortress arrived there the luxury of the rooms seemed to inspire them with a kind of respect not unmixed with alarm so many things were entirely new to their experience the choice furniture the pictures the great statue of venus they followed their chief into the salon however with a kind of impudent curiosity there the sight of general epanchin among the guests caused many of them to beat a hasty retreat into the adjoining room the boxer and beggar being among the first to go a few only of whom lebedeff made one stood their ground he had contrived to walk side by side with rogozhin for he quite understood the importance of a man who had a fortune of a million odd roubles who at this moment carried a hundred thousand in his hand it may be added that the whole company not excepting lebedeff had the vaguest idea of the extent of their powers and of how far they could safely go at some moments lebedeff was sure that right was on their side at others he tried uneasily to remember various cheering and reassuring articles of the civil code rogozhin when he stepped into the room and his eyes fell upon nastasia stopped short grew white as a sheet and stood staring it was clear that his heart was beating painfully so he stood gazing intently but timidly for a few seconds suddenly as though bereft of his senses he moved forward staggering helplessly towards the table 
on his way he collided against ptitsin's chair and put his dirty foot on the lace skirt of the silent lady's dress but he neither apologized for this nor even noticed it on reaching the table he placed upon it a strange-looking object which he had carried with him into the drawing-room this was a paper packet some six or seven inches thick and eight or nine in length wrapped in an old newspaper and tied round three or four times with string having placed this before her he stood with drooped arms and head as though awaiting his sentence his costume was the same as it had been in the morning except for a new silk handkerchief round his neck bright green and red fastened with a huge diamond pin and an enormous diamond ring on his dirty forefinger lebedeff stood two or three paces behind his chief and the rest of the band waited about near the door the two maid-servants were both peeping in frightened and amazed at this unusual and disorderly scene what is that asked nastasia philipovna gazing intently at rogozhin and indicating the paper packet a hundred thousand replied the latter almost in a whisper oh so he kept his word there's a ma man for you well sit down please take that chair i shall have something to say to you presently who are all these with you the same party let them come in and sit down there's room on that sofa there are some chairs and there's another sofa well why don't they sit down sure enough some of the brave fellows entirely lost their heads at this point and retreated into the next room others however took the hint and sat down as far as they could from the table however feeling braver in proportion to their distance from nastasia rogozhin took the chair offered him but he did not sit long he soon stood up again and did not reseat himself little by little he began to look around him and discern the other guests seeing gania he smiled venomously and muttered to himself look at that he gazed at totski and the general with no apparent confusion and with very little curiosity but when he observed that the prince was seated beside nastasia philipovna he could not take his eyes off him for a long while and was clearly amazed he could not account for the prince's presence there it was not in the least surprising that rogozhin should be at this time in a more or less delirious condition for not to speak of the excitements of the day he had spent the night before in the train and had not slept more than a wink for forty-eight hours this gentleman is a hundred thousand roubles said nastasia philipovna addressing the company in general here in this dirty parcel this afternoon rogozhin yelled like a madman that he would bring me a hundred thousand in the evening and i have been waiting for him all the while he was bargaining for me you know first he offered me eighteen thousand then he rose to forty and then to a hundred thousand and he has kept his word see my goodness how white he is all this happened this afternoon at gania's i had gone to pay his mother a visit my future family you know and his sister said to my very face surely somebody will turn this shameless creature out after which she spat in her brother gania's face a girl of character that nastasia philipovna began the general reproachfully he was beginning to put his own interpretation on the affair well what general not quite good form eh oh nonsense here have i been sitting in my box at the french theatre for the last five years like a statue of inaccessible virtue and kept out of the way of all admirers like a silly little idiot now there's this man who comes and pays down his hundred thousand on the table before you all and in spite of my five years of innocence and proud virtue 
and I dare be sworn he has his sledge outside, waiting to carry me off. He values me at a hundred thousand. I see you are still angry with me, Gania. Why, surely you never really wished to take me into your family? Me, Rogozhin's mistress! What did the prince say just now? I never said you were Rogozhin's mistress. You are not, said the prince in trembling accents. Nastasia Filipovna, dear soul, cried the actress impatiently, do be calm, dear. If it annoys you so, all this, do go away and rest. Of course you would never go with this wretched fellow, in spite of his hundred thousand roubles. Take his money and kick him out of the house. That's the way to treat him and the likes of him. Upon my word, if it were my business, I'd soon clear them all out. The actress was a kind-hearted woman, and highly impressionable. She was very angry now. <laughs> Don't be cross, Daria Alexeyevna, laughed Nastasia. I was not angry when I spoke. I wasn't reproaching Gania. I don't know how it was that I could ever have indulged the whim of entering an honest family like his. I saw his mother and kissed her hand too. I came and stirred up all that fuss, Gania, this afternoon on purpose to see how much you could swallow. You surprised me, my friend. You did indeed. Surely you could not marry a woman who accepts pearls, like those you knew the general was going to give me, on the very eve of her marriage. And Rogozhin, why, in your own house, and before your own brother and sister, he bargained with me. Yet you could come here, and expect to be betrothed to me before you left the house. You almost brought your sister, too. Surely what Rogozhin said about you is not really true that you would crawl all the way to the other end of the town on hands and knees for three roubles. Yes, he would, said Rogozhin quietly, but with an air of absolute conviction. Hm, and he receives a good salary, I'm told. Well, what should you get but disgrace and misery if you took a wife you hated into your family? For I know very well that you do hate me. No, no, I believe now that a man like you would murder anyone for money. Sharpen a razor and come up behind his best friend and cut his throat like a sheep. I've read of such people. Everyone seems money mad nowadays. No, no, I may be shameless, but you are far worse. I don't say a word about that other. Nastasia Filipovna, is this really you? You, and one so refined and delicate of speech. Oh, what a tongue! What dreadful things you are saying! cried the general, wringing his hands in real grief. I am intoxicated, general. I am having a day out, you know. It's my birthday. I have long looked forward to this happy occasion. Daria Alexeyevna, you see that nosegay man, that Monsieur au Camélia, sitting there laughing at us. I am not laughing, Nastasia Filipovna. I am only listening with all my attention, said Totsky with dignity. Well, why have I worried him for five years and never let him go free? Is he worth it? He is only just what he ought to be, nothing particular. He thinks I am to blame, too. He gave me my education, kept me like a countess. Money, my word, what a lot of money he spent over me. And he tried to find me an honest husband first. And then this Garnia here. And what do you think? All these five years I did not live with him, and yet I took his money, and considered I was quite justified. You say, take the hundred thousand and kick that man out. It is true, it is an abominable business, as you say. I might have married long ago, not Garnia. Oh, no, but that would have been abominable too. Would you believe it? 
I had some thoughts of marrying Totsky four years ago. I meant mischief, I confess, but I could have had him, I give you my word. He asked me himself. But I thought, no, it's not worth while to take such advantage of him. No, I'd better go on to the streets, or accept Rogozhin, or become a washerwoman or something, for I have nothing of my own, you know. I shall go away and leave everything behind, to the last rag. He shall have it all pack. And who would take me without anything? Ask Garnia there if he would. Why, even Ferdishenko wouldn't have me. No, Ferdishenko would not. He's a candid fellow, Nastasia Filipovna, said that worthy. But the prince would. You sit here making complaints. But just look at the prince. I've been observing him for a long while. Nastasia Filipovna looked keenly round at the prince. Is that true? she asked. Quite true, whispered the prince. You'll take me as I am? With nothing? I will, Nastasia Filipovna. Here's a pretty business, cried the general. However, it might have been expected of him. The prince continued to regard Nastasia with a sorrowful but intense and piercing gaze. "'Here's another alternative for me,' said Nastasia, turning once more to the actress. "'And he does it out of pure kindness of heart. I know him. I found a benefactor. Perhaps, though, what they say about him may be true, that he's an we-know-what.' And what shall you live on, if you are really so madly in love with Rogozhin's mistress, that you are ready to marry her, hm? I take you as a good, honest woman, Nastasia Filipovna, not as Rogozhin's mistress. Who, I? Good and honest? Yes, you. Oh, you get those ideas out of novels, you know. Times are changed now, dear prince. The world sees things as they really are. That's all nonsense. Besides, how can you marry? You need a nurse, not a wife." The prince rose and began to speak in a trembling, timid tone, but with the air of a man absolutely sure of the truth of his words. "'I know nothing, Nastasia Filipovna. I have seen nothing. You are right so far. But I consider that you would be honouring me, and not I you. I am a nobody. You have suffered. You have passed through hell, and emerged pure. And that is very much. Why do you shame yourself by desiring to go with Rogozhin? You are delirious. You have returned to Mr. Totsky his seventy-five thousand roubles and declared that you will leave his house and all that is in it, which is a line of conduct that not one person here would imitate. Nastasia Filipovna, I love you. I would die for you. I shall never let any man say one word against you, Nastasia Filipovna. And if we are poor, I can work for both." As the prince spoke these last words, a titter was heard from Ferdishenko. Lebedev laughed too. The general grunted with irritation. Ptitsin and Totsky barely restrained their smiles. The rest all sat listening, open-mouthed with wonder. But perhaps we shall not be poor. We may be very rich, Nastasia Filipovna, continued the prince in the same timid, quivering tones. I don't know for certain, and I'm sorry to say I haven't had an opportunity of finding out all day. But I received a letter from Moscow, while I was in Switzerland, from a Mr. Salaskin, and he acquaints me with the fact that I am entitled to a very large inheritance. This letter... The prince pulled a letter out of his pocket. Is he raving? said the general. Are we really in a madhouse? There was a silence for a moment. Then Ptitsin spoke. I think you said, Prince, that your letter was from Salaskin. Salaskin is a very eminent man indeed in his own world. He is a wonderfully clever solicitor. 
and if he really tells you this, I think you may be pretty sure that he is right. It so happens, luckily, that I know his handwriting, for I have lately had business with him. If you would allow me to see it, I should perhaps be able to tell you. The prince held out the letter silently, but with a shaking hand. What? What? said the general, much agitated. What's all this? Is he really heir to anything? All present concentrated their attention upon Petitsin, reading the prince's letter. The general curiosity had received a new Philip. Ferdishenko could not sit still. Rogozhin fixed his eyes first on the prince, and then on Ptitsin, and then back again. He was extremely agitated. Lebedev could not stand it. He crept up and read over Ptitsin's shoulder, with the air of a naughty boy who expects a box on the ear every moment for his indiscretion. End of Part 1 Chapter 15 Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey Part 1 Chapter 16 of The Idiot This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen The Idiot by Fyodor Dostoevsky Translated by Eva M. Martin Part 1 Chapter 16 it's good business said ptitsin at last folding the letter and handing it back to the prince you will receive without the slightest trouble by the last will and testament of your aunt a very large sum of money indeed impossible cried the general starting up as if he had been shot ptitsin explained for the benefit of the company that the prince's aunt had died five months since. He had never known her, but she was his mother's own sister, the daughter of a Moscow merchant, one Paparchin, who had died a bankrupt. But the elder brother of this same Paparchin had been an eminent and very rich merchant. A year since it had so happened that his only two sons had both died within the same month. This sad event had so affected the old man that he too had died very shortly after. He was a widower and had no relations left, excepting the prince's aunt, a poor woman living on charity, who was herself at the point of death from dropsy, but who had time before she died to set Salaskin to work to find her nephew and to make her will, bequeathing her newly acquired fortune to him. It appeared that neither the prince nor the doctor with whom he lived in Switzerland had thought of waiting for further communications, but the prince had started straight away with Salaskin's letter in his pocket. "'One thing I may tell you for certain,' concluded Ptitsin, addressing the prince, that there is no question about the authenticity of this matter. Anything that Salaskin writes you as regards your unquestionable right to this inheritance, you may look upon as so much money in your pocket. I congratulate you, Prince. You may receive a million and a half of roubles, perhaps more. I don't know. All I do know is that Paparchin was a very rich merchant indeed. Hurrah! cried Lebedev in a drunken voice. Hurrah for the last of the Mwishkins! My goodness me, and I gave him twenty-five roubles this morning as though he were a beggar, blurted out the general, half senseless with amazement. Well, I congratulate you, I congratulate you. And the general rose from his seat and solemnly embraced the prince. All came forward with congratulations, even those of Rogozhin's party who had retreated into the next room now crept softly back to look on. For the moment even Nastasia Filipovna was forgotten. 
but gradually the consciousness crept back into the minds of each one present that the prince had just made her an offer of marriage the situation had therefore become three times as fantastic as before totsky sat and shrugged his shoulders bewildered he was the only guest left sitting at this time the others had thronged round the table in disorder and were all talking at once it was generally agreed afterwards in recalling that evening that from this moment nastasia filipovna seemed entirely to lose her senses she continued to sit still in her place looking around at her guests with a strange bewildered expression as though she were trying to collect her thoughts and could not then she suddenly turned to the prince and glared at him with frowning brows but this only lasted one moment perhaps it suddenly struck her that all this was a jest but his face seemed to reassure her she reflected and smiled again vaguely so i really am a princess she whispered to herself ironically and glancing accidentally at daria alexeyevna's face she burst out laughing ha 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 she cried this is an unexpected climax after all i didn't expect this what are you all standing up for gentlemen sit down congratulate me and the prince ferdishenko just step out and order some more champagne will you katya pasha she added suddenly seeing the servants at the door come here i am going to be married did you hear to the prince he has a million and a half of roubles he is prince muishkin and has asked me to marry him here prince come and sit by me and here comes the wine now then ladies and gentlemen where are your congratulations hurrah cried a number of voices a rush was made for the wine by rogozhin's followers though even among them there seemed some sort of realization that the situation had changed rogozhin stood and looked on with an incredulous smile screwing up one side of his mouth prince my dear fellow do remember what you are about said the general approaching muishkin and pulling him by the coat-sleeve nastasia filipovna overheard the remark and burst out laughing no no general she cried you had better look out i am the princess now you know the prince won't let you insult me afanasy ivanovitch why don't you congratulate me i shall be able to sit at table with your new wife now aha see what you gain by marrying a prince a million and a half and a prince and an idiot into the bargain they say what better could i wish for life is only just about to commence for me in earnest rogozhin you are a little too late away with your paper parcel i'm going to marry the prince i'm richer than you are now but rogozhin understood how things were tending at last an inexpressibly painful expression came over his face he wrung his hands a groan made its way up from the depths of his soul surrender her for god's sake he said to the prince all around burst out laughing what surrender her to you cried daria alexeyevna to a fellow who comes and bargains for a wife like a mushik the prince wishes to marry her and you so do i so do i this moment if i could i'd give every farthing i have to do it you drunken mushik said daria alexeyevna once more you ought to be kicked out of the place the laughter became louder than ever do you hear prince said nastasia filipovna do you hear how this mujik of a fellow goes on bargaining for your bride 
he is drunk said the prince quietly and he loves you very much won't you be ashamed afterwards to reflect that your wife very nearly ran away with rogozhin oh you were raving you were in a fever you are still half delirious and won't you be ashamed when they tell you afterwards that your wife lived at totsky's expense so many years no i shall not be ashamed of that you did not so live by your own will and you'll never reproach me with it never take care don't commit yourself for a whole lifetime nastasia filipovna said the prince quietly and with deep emotion i said before that i shall esteem your consent to be my wife as a great honour to myself and shall consider that it is you who will honour me not i you by our marriage you laughed at these words and others around us laughed as well i heard them very likely i expressed myself funnily and i may have looked funny but for all that i believe i understand where honour lies and what i said was but the literal truth you were about to ruin yourself just now irrevocably you would never have forgiven yourself for so doing afterwards and yet you are absolutely blameless it is impossible that your life should be altogether ruined at your age what matter that rogozhin came bargaining here and that gavrila ardalionovitch would have deceived you if he could why would you continually remind us of these facts i assure you once more that very few could find it in them to act as you have acted this day as for your wish to go with rogozhin that was simply the idea of a delirious and suffering brain you are still quite feverish you ought to be in bed not here you know quite well that if you had gone with rogozhin you would have become a washerwoman next day rather than stay with him you are proud nastasia filipovna and perhaps you have really suffered so much that you imagine yourself to be a desperately guilty woman you require a great deal of petting and looking after nastasia filipovna and i will do this i saw your portrait this morning and it seemed quite a familiar face to me it seemed to me that the portrait face was calling to me for help i i shall respect you all my life nastasia filipovna concluded the prince as though suddenly recollecting himself and blushing to think of the sort of company before whom he had said all this ptitsin bowed his head and looked at the ground overcome by a mixture of feelings totsky muttered to himself he may be an idiot but he knows that flattery is the best road to success here the prince observed gania's eyes flashing at him as though they would gladly annihilate him then and there that's a kind-hearted man if you like said daria alexeyevna whose wrath was quickly evaporating a refined man but lost murmured the general totsky took his hat and rose to go he and the general exchanged glances making a private arrangement thereby to leave the house together thank you prince no one has ever spoken to me like that before began nastasia filipovna men have always bargained for me before this and not a single respectable man has ever proposed to marry me do you hear afanasy ivanovitch what do you think of what the prince has just been saying it was almost immodest wasn't it you rogozhin wait a minute don't go yet i see you don't intend to move however perhaps i may go with you yet where did you mean to take me to to yekaterinhof replied lebedeff rogozhin simply stood staring with trembling lips not daring to believe his ears he was stunned as though from a blow on the head 
"'What are you thinking of, my dear Nastasia?' said Daria Alexeyevna in alarm. "'What are you saying? You are not going mad, are you?' Nastasia Filipovna burst out laughing and jumped up from the sofa. "'Ha, ha, 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 ha!' you thought i should accept this good child's invitation to ruin him did you she cried that's totsky's way not mine he's fond of children come along rogozhin get your money ready we won't talk about marrying just at this moment but let's see the money at all events come i may not marry you either i don't know i suppose you thought you'd keep the money if i did ha 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 nonsense i have no sense of shame left i tell you i have been totsky's concubine prince you must marry aglaya ivanovna not nastasia filipovna or this fellow ferdishenko will always be pointing the finger of scorn at you you aren't afraid i know but i should always be afraid that i had ruined you and that you would reproach me for it as for what you say about my doing you honour by marrying you well totsky can tell you all about that you had your eye on aglaya gania you know you had and you might have married her if you had not come bargaining you are all like this you should choose once for all between disreputable women and respectable ones or you are sure to get mixed look at the general how he's staring at me this is too horrible said the general starting to his feet all were standing up now nastasia was absolutely beside herself i am very proud in spite of what i am she continued you called me perfection just now prince a nice sort of perfection to throw up a prince and a million and a half of roubles in order to be able to boast of the fact afterwards what sort of a wife should i make for you after all i have said afanasy ivanovitch do you observe i have really and truly thrown away a million of roubles and you thought that i should consider your wretched seventy-five thousand with gania thrown in for a husband a paradise of bliss take your seventy-five thousand back sir you did not reach the hundred thousand rogozhin cut a better dash than you did i'll console gania myself i have an idea about that but now i must be off i've been in prison for ten years i'm free at last well rogozhin what are you waiting for let's get ready and go come along shouted rogozhin beside himself with joy hey all of you fellows wine round with it fill the glasses get away he shouted frantically observing that daria alexeyevna was approaching to protest against nastasia's conduct get away she's mine everything's mine she's a queen get away he was panting with ecstasy he walked round and round nastasia filipovna and told everybody to keep their distance all the rogozhin company were now collected in the drawing-room some were drinking some laughed and talked all were in the highest and wildest spirits ferdishenko was doing his best to unite himself to them the general and totsky again made an attempt to go gania too stood hat in hand ready to go but seemed to be unable to tear his eyes away from the scene before him get out keep your distance shouted rogozhin what are you shouting about there cried nastasia i'm not yours yet i may kick you out for all you know i haven't taken your money yet there it all is on the table here give me over that packet is there a hundred thousand roubles in that one packet Pooh, what abominable stuff it looks oh nonsense daria alexeyevna you surely did not expect me to ruin him 
indicating the prince. Fancy him nursing me! Why, he needs a nurse himself! The general there will be his nurse now, you'll see. Here, prince, look here. Your bride is accepting money. What a disreputable woman she must be! And you wished to marry her. What are you crying about? Is it a bitter dose? Never mind, you shall laugh yet. Trust to time. In spite of these words, there were two large tears rolling down Nastasia's own cheeks. It's far better to think twice of it now than afterwards. Oh, you mustn't cry like that. There's Katya crying too. What is it, Katya, dear? I shall leave you and Pasha a lot of things. I've laid them out for you already. But good-bye now. I made an honest girl like you serve a low woman like myself. It's better so, Prince, it is indeed. You'd begin to despise me afterwards. We should never be happy. Oh, you needn't swear, Prince. I shan't believe you, you know. How foolish it would be, too. No, no. We'd better say good-bye and part friends. I am a bit of a dreamer myself, and I used to dream of you once. Very often, during those five years down at his estate, I used to dream and think, and I always imagined just such a good, honest, foolish fellow as you, one who should come and say to me, You are an innocent woman, Nastasia Filipovna, and I adore you. I dreamt of you often. I used to think so much down there that I nearly went mad. And then this fellow here would come down. He would stay a couple of months out of the twelve, and disgrace and insult and deprave me, and then go, so that I longed to drown myself in the pond a thousand times over. But I did not dare do it. I hadn't the heart. And now... Well, are you ready, Rogozhin? Ready. Keep your distance, all of you. We're all ready, said several of his friends. The troikas are at the door, bells and all. Nastasia Filipovna seized the packet of banknotes. Gania, I have an idea. I wish to recompense you. Why should you lose all? Rogozhin, would he crawl for three roubles as far as the Vasily Ostrov? Oh, wouldn't he just? Well, look here, Gania. I wish to look into your heart once more for the last time. You've worried me for the last three months. Now it's my turn. Do you see this packet? It contains a hundred thousand roubles. Now, I'm going to throw it into the fire, here before all these witnesses. As soon as the fire catches hold of it, you put your hands into the fire and pick it out. Without gloves, you know. You must have bare hands, and you must turn your sleeves up. Pull it out, I say, and it's all yours. You may burn your fingers a little, of course, but then it's a hundred thousand roubles, remember. It won't take you long to lay hold of it and snatch it out. I shall so much admire you if you put your hands into the fire for my money. All here present may be witnesses that the whole packet of money is yours if you get it out. If you don't get it out, it shall burn. I will let no one else come. Away! Get away, all of you! It's my money! Rogozhin has bought me with it. Is it my money, Rogozhin? Yes, my queen. It's your own money, my joy. Get away, then, all of you. I shall do as I like with my own. Don't meddle. Perdyshenko, make up the fire, quick. Nastasia Filipovna, I can't. My hands won't obey me, said Ferdishenko, astounded and helpless with bewilderment. Nonsense! cried Nastasia Filipovna, seizing the poker and raking a couple of logs together. No sooner did a tongue of flame burst out than she threw the packet of notes upon it. 
Everyone gasped. Some even crossed themselves. "'She's mad! She's mad!' was the cry. "'Oughtn't, oughtn't we to secure her?' asked the general of Petitsin in a whisper. "'Or shall we send for the authorities? Why, she's mad, isn't she? Isn't she, hm? "'No, I hardly think she is actually mad,' whispered Petitsin, who was as white as his handkerchief and trembling like a leaf. He could not take his eyes off the smouldering packet. "'She's mad, surely, isn't she?' the general appealed to Totsky. "'I told you she wasn't an ordinary woman,' replied the latter, who was as pale as any one. "'Oh, but positively, you know, a hundred thousand roubles!' "'Goodness gracious! Good heavens!' came from all four quarters of the room. All now crowded round the fire, and thronged to see what was going on. Everyone lamented and gave vent to exclamations of horror and woe. Some jumped up on chairs in order to get a better view. Daria Alexeyevna ran into the next room and whispered excitedly to Katya and Pasha. The beautiful German disappeared altogether. "'My lady! My sovereign!' lamented Lebedev falling on his knees before Nastasia Filipovna, and stretching out his hands towards the fire. "'It's a hundred thousand roubles! It is indeed! I packed it up myself! I saw the money! My queen! Let me get into the fire after it! Say the word! I'll put my whole grey head into the fire for it! I have a poor lame wife and thirteen children!' My father died of starvation last week. Nastasia Filipovna! Nastasia Filipovna! The wretched little man wept and groaned and crawled towards the fire. Away, out of the way! cried Nastasia. Make room, all of you. Gania, what are you standing there for? Don't stand on ceremony. Put in your hand. There's your whole happiness smouldering away. Look, quick!" But Gania had borne too much that day, and especially this evening, and he was not prepared for this last, quite unexpected trial. The crowd parted on each side of him, and he was left face to face with Nastasia Filipovna, three paces from her. She stood by the fire and waited, with her intent gaze fixed upon him. Gania stood before her in his evening clothes, holding his white gloves and hat in his hand, speechless and motionless, with arms folded and eyes fixed on the fire. A silly, meaningless smile played on his white, death-like lips. He could not take his eyes off the smouldering packet, but it appeared that something new had come to birth in his soul, as though he were vowing to himself that he would bear this trial. He did not move from his place. In a few seconds it became evident to all that he did not intend to rescue the money. "'Hey, look at it! It'll burn in another minute or two! cried Nastasia Filipovna. "'You'll hang yourself afterwards, you know, if it does. I'm not joking!' The fire, choked between a couple of smouldering pieces of wood, had died down for the first few moments after the packet was thrown upon it, but a little tongue of fire now began to lick the paper from below and soon, gathering courage, mounted the sides of the parcel and crept around it. In another moment the whole of it burst into flames, and the exclamations of woe and horror were redoubled. "'Nastasia Filipovna!' lamented Lebedev again, straining towards the fireplace. But Rogozhin dragged him away and pushed him to the rear once more. The whole of Rogozhin's being was concentrated in one rapturous gaze of ecstasy. He could not take his eyes off Nastasia. 
he stood drinking her in as it were he was in the seventh heaven of delight oh what a queen she is he ejaculated every other minute throwing out the remark for any one who liked to catch it that's the sort of woman for me which of you would think of doing a thing like that you blackguards eh he yelled he was hopelessly and wildly beside himself with ecstasy the prince watched the whole scene silent and dejected i'll pull it out with my teeth the one thousand said ferdishenko so would i said another from behind with pleasure devil take the thing he added in a tempest of despair it will all be burnt up in a minute it's burning it's burning it's burning it's burning cried all thronging nearer and nearer to the fire in their excitement gania don't be a fool i tell you for the last time get on quick shrieked ferdishenko rushing wildly up to gania and trying to drag him to the fire by the sleeve of his coat get it you dummy it's burning away fast oh damn the thing gania hurled ferdishenko from him then he turned sharp round and made for the door but he had not gone a couple of steps when he tottered and fell to the ground he's fainted the cry went round and the money's burning still lebedeff lamented burning for nothing shouted others katya pasha bring him some water cried nastasia philipovna then she took the tongs and fished out the packet nearly the whole of the outer covering was burned away but it was soon evident that the contents were hardly touched the packet had been wrapped in a threefold covering of newspaper and the notes were safe all breathed more freely some dirty little thousand or so may be touched said lebedeff immensely relieved but there's very little harm done after all it's all his the whole packet is for him do you hear all of you cried nastasia philipovna placing the packet by the side of gania he restrained himself and didn't go after it so his self-respect is greater than his thirst for money all right he'll come to directly he must have the packet or he'll cut his throat afterwards there he's coming to himself general totsky all of you did you hear me the money is all gania's i give it to him fully conscious of my action as recompense for well for anything he thinks best tell him so let it lie here beside him off we go rogozhin good-bye prince i have seen a man for the first time in my life good-bye afanasy ivanovitch and thanks the rogozhin gang followed their leader and nastasia philipovna to the entrance hall laughing and shouting and whistling in the hall the servants were waiting and handed her her fur cloak marfa the cook ran in from the kitchen nastasia kissed them all round are you really throwing us all over little mother where where are you going to and on your birthday too cried the four girls crying over her and kissing her hands i am going out into the world katya perhaps i shall be a laundress i don't know no more of afanasy ivanovitch anyhow give him my respects don't think badly of me girls the prince hurried down to the front gate where the party was settling into the troikas all the bells tinkling a merry accompaniment the while the general caught him up on the stairs prince prince he cried seizing hold of his arm recollect yourself drop her prince you see what sort of a woman she is i am speaking to you like a father the prince glanced at him but said nothing he shook himself free and rushed on downstairs 
the general was just in time to see the prince take the first sledge he could get and giving the order to yekaterinhof start off in pursuit of the troikas then the general's fine grey horse dragged that worthy home with some new thoughts and some new hopes and calculations developing in his brain and with the pearls in his pocket for he had not forgotten to bring them along with him being a man of business amid his new thoughts and ideas there came once or twice the image of nastasia philipovna the general sighed i'm really really sorry he muttered she's a ruined woman mad mad however the prince is not for nastasia philipovna now perhaps it's as well two more of nastasia's guests who walked a short distance together indulged in high moral sentiments of a similar nature do you know totsky this is all very like what they say goes on among the japanese said ptitsin the offended party there they say marches off to his insulter and says to him you insulted me so i have come to rip myself open before your eyes and with these words he does actually rip his stomach open before his enemy and considers doubtless that he is having all possible and necessary satisfaction and revenge there are strange characters in the world sir hmm, and you think there was something of this sort here do you dear me a very remarkable comparison you know but you must have observed my dear ptitsin that i did all i possibly could i could do no more than, than i did and you must admit that there are some rare qualities in this woman i felt i could not speak in that bedlam or i should have been tempted to cry out when she reproached me that she herself was my best justification such a woman could make any one forget all reason everything even that moujik rogozhin you saw brought her a hundred thousand roubles of course all that happened to-night was ephemeral fantastic unseemly yet it lacked neither colour nor originality my god what might not have been made of such a character combined with such beauty yet in spite of all efforts in spite of all education even all those gifts are wasted she is an uncut diamond i have often said so and afanasy ivanovitch heaved a deep sigh end of part 1 of the idiot recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey